Section 1 of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane. Section 1 The Monster, Part 1. 1. Little Jim was, for the time, engine number 36, and he was making the run between Syracuse and Rochester. He was fourteen minutes behind time, and the throttle was wide open. In consequence, when he swung around the curve at the flower bed, a wheel of his cart destroyed a peony. Number 36 slowed down at once and looked guiltily at his father, who was mowing the lawn. The doctor had his back to this accident, and he continued to pace slowly to and fro, pushing the mower. Jim dropped the tongue of the cart, he looked at his father and at the broken flower. Finally, he went to the peony and tried to stand it on its pins, resuscitated, but the spine of it was hurt, and it would only hang limply from his hand. Jim could do no reparation. He looked again toward his father. He went on to the lawn very slowly and kicking wretchedly at the turf. Presently, his father came along with the whirring machine, while the sweet new grass blades spun from the knives. In a low voice, Jim said, Pa? The doctor was shaving this lawn as if it were a priest's chin. All during the season he had worked at it, in the coolness and peace of the evenings after supper. Even in the shadow of the cherry trees the grass was strong and healthy. Jim raised his voice a trifle. Pa! The doctor paused, and with the howl of the machine no longer occupying the scents, one can hear the robins in the cherry trees arranging their affairs. Jim's hands were behind his back, and sometimes his fingers clasped and unclasped. Again he said, Pa! The child's fresh and rosy lip was lowered. The doctor stared down at his son, thrusting his head forward and frowning attentively. "'What is it, Jimmy?' "'Pa!' repeated the child at length. Then he raised his finger and pointed at the flower bed. "'There!' "'What?' said the doctor, frowning more. "'What is it, Jim?' After a period of silence during which the child may have undergone a severe mental tumult, he raised his finger and repeated his former word. "'There!' The father had respected this silence with perfect courtesy. Afterwards, his glance carefully followed the direction indicated by the child's finger, but he could see nothing which explained to him. "'I don't understand what you mean, Jimmy,' he said. It seemed that the importance of the whole thing had taken away the boy's vocabulary. He could only reiterate, "'There!' The doctor mused upon the situation, but he could make nothing of it. At last he said, "'Come, show me.' Together they crossed the lawn towards the flower bed. At some yards from the broken peony, Jimmy began to lag. There! The word came almost breathlessly. Where? said the doctor. Jimmy kicked at the grass. There! he replied. The doctor was obliged to go forward alone. After some trouble, he found the subject of the incident, the broken flower. Turning then, he saw the child lurking at the rear and scanning his countenance. The father reflected. After a time, he said, Jimmy, come here. With an infinite modesty of demeanor, the child came forward. Jimmy, how did this happen? The child answered, Now, I was playing train, and now I runned over it. You were doing what? I was playing train. The father reflected again. Well, Jimmy, he said slowly, I guess you had better not play train any more today. Do you think you had better? No, sir, said Jimmy. During the delivery of the judgment, the child had not faced his father, and afterwards he went away, with his head lowered, shuffling his feet. 2. It was apparent from Jimmy's manner that he felt some kind of desire to efface himself. He went down to the stable. Henry Johnson, the negro who cared for the doctor's horses, was sponging the buggy. He grinned fraternally when he saw Jimmy coming. These two were pals. In regard to almost everything in life, they seemed to have minds precisely alike. Of course, there were points of emphatic divergence. For instance, it was plain from Henry's talk that he was a very handsome negro, and he was known to be a light, a weight, and an eminence in the suburb of the town where lived the larger number of the negroes, and obviously this glory was over Jimmy's horizon. But he vaguely appreciated it, and paid deference to Henry for it mainly because Henry appreciated it and deferred to himself. However, on all points of conduct as related to the doctor, who was the moon, they were in complete but unexpressed understanding. Whenever Jimmy became the victim of an eclipse, he went to the stable to solace himself with Henry's crimes. 
Henry, with the elasticity of his race, could usually provide a sin to place himself on a footing with the disgraced one. Perhaps he would remember that he had forgotten to put the hitching strap in the back of the buggy on some recent occasion, and had been reprimanded by the doctor. Then these two would commune subtly and without words concerning their moon, holding themselves sympathetically as people who had committed similar treasons. On the other hand, Henry would sometimes choose to absolutely repudiate this idea, and when Jimmy appeared in his shame would bully him most virtuously, preaching with assurance the precepts of the doctor's creed and pointing out to Jimmy all his abominations. Jimmy did not discover that this was odious in his comrade. He accepted it and lived in its shadow with humility, merely trying to conciliate the saintly Henry with acts of deference. Won by this attitude, Henry would sometimes allow the child to enjoy the felicity of squeezing the sponge over a buggy wheel, even when Jimmy was still gory from unspeakable deeds. Whenever Henry dwelt for a time in sackcloth, Jimmy did not patronize him at all. This was a justice of his age, his condition. He did not know. Besides, Henry could drive a horse, and Jimmy had a full sense of this sublimity. Henry personally conducted the moon during the splendid journeys through the country roads, where farms spread on all sides with sheep, cows, and other marvels abounding. "'Hello, Jim,' said Henry, poising his sponge. Water was dripping from the buggy. Sometimes the horses in the stalls stamped thunderingly on the pine floor. There was an atmosphere of hay and of harness. For a minute, Jimmy refused to take an interest in anything. He was very downcast. He could not even feel the wonders of wagon-washing. Henry, while at his work, narrowly observed him. "'Your pop done wallop you, didn't he?' he said at last. "'No,' said Jimmy defensively. "'He didn't.' After this casual remark, Henry continued his labor with a scowl of occupation. Presently, he said, "'I done told you many a time not to go a-foolin' and a-projectin' with them flowers. Your pop don't like it no how. As a matter of fact, Henry had never mentioned flowers to the boy. Jimmy preserved a gloomy silence, so Henry began to use seductive wiles in the affair of washing a wagon. It was not until he began to spin a wheel on the tree and the sprinkling water flew everywhere that the boy was visibly moved. He had been seated on the sill of the carriage house door, but at the beginning of this ceremony he arose and circled towards the buggy, with an interest that slowly consumed the remembrance of a late disgrace. Johnny could then display all the dignity of a man whose duty it was to protect Jimmy from a splashing. "'Look out, boy! Look out! You don't go in and spile their pants! I reckon your mama don't load this foolishness. She know it. I ain't going to have you round here spiling your pants and have Miss Trescott light on me presently. Did I ain't?' He spoke with an air of great irritation, but he was not annoyed at all. This tone was merely a part of his importance. In reality, he was always delighted to have the child there. To witness the business of the stable. For one thing, Jimmy was invariably overcome with reverence when he was told how beautifully a harness was polished or a horse groomed. Henry explained each detail of this kind with unction, procuring great joy from the child's admiration. 3. After Johnson had taken his supper in the kitchen, he went to his loft in the carriage house and dressed himself with much care. No bell of a court circle could bestow more mind on a toilet than did Johnson. On second thought, he was more like a priest arraying himself for some parade of the church. As he emerged from his room and sauntered down the carriage drive, no one would have suspected him of ever having washed a buggy. It was not altogether a matter of the lavender trousers, nor yet the straw hat with its bright silk band. The change was somewhere far in the interior of Henry. But there was no cakewalk hyperbole in it. He was simply a quiet, well-bred gentleman of position wealth, and other necessary achievements out for an evening stroll, and he had never washed a wagon in his life. In the morning, when in his working clothes, he had met a friend. "'Hello, Pete.' "'Hello, Henry.' Now, in his effulgence, he encountered this same friend. His bow was not at all haughty. If it expressed anything, it expressed consummate generosity. "'Good evening, Mr. Washington.' Pete, who was very dirty being at work in a potato patch, "'responded in a mixture of abasement and appreciation. "'Good evening, Mr. Johnson.' "'The shimmering blue of the electric arc lamps "'was strong in the main street of the town. "'At numerous points it was conquered "'by the orange glare of the outnumbering gaslights "'in the windows of shops. "'Through this radiant lane moved a crowd, "'which culminated in a throng before the post office "'awaiting the distribution of the evening mails. "'Occasionally there came into it a shrill electric streetcar.' 
the motor singing like a cage full of grasshoppers and possessing a great gong that clanged forth both warnings and simple noise. At the little theater, which was a varnish and red plush miniature of one of the famous New York theaters, a company of strollers was to play East Lynn. The young men of the town were mainly gathered at the corners, in distinctive groups, which expressed various shades and lines of chumship, and had little to do with any social gradations. There they discussed everything with critical insight, passing the whole town in review as it swarmed in the street. When the gongs of the electric cars ceased for a moment to harry the ears, there could be heard the sound of the feet of the leisurely crowd on the bluestone pavement, and it was like the peaceful evening lashing at the shore of a lake. At the foot of the hill, where two lines of maples sentineled the way, an electric lamp glowed high among the embowered branches, and made most wonderful shadow etchings on the road below it. When Johnson appeared amid the throng, a member of one of the profane groups at a corner instantly telegraphed news of this extraordinary arrival to his companions. They hailed him. Hello, Henry. Going to walk for a cake tonight. Ain't he smooth? Why, you've got that cake right in your pocket, Henry. Throw out your chest a little more. Henry was not ruffled in any way by these quiet admonitions and compliments. In reply, he laughed a supremely good-natured, chuckling laugh, which, nevertheless, expressed an underground complacency of superior metal. Young Griscombe, the lawyer, was just emerging from Reef Snyder's barber shop, rubbing his chin contentedly. On the steps, he dropped his hand and looked with wide eyes into the crowd. Suddenly, he bolted back into the shop. Wow! he cried to the Parliament. You ought to see the coon that's coming! Reef Snyder and his assistant instantly poised their razors high and turned towards the window. Two belathered heads reared from the chairs. The electric shine in the street caused an effect like water to them who looked through the glass from the yellow glamour of Reef Snyder's shop. In fact, the people without resembled the inhabitants of a great aquarium that here had a square pane in it. Presently into this frame swam the graceful form of Henry Johnson. Gee, said Reef Snyder. He and his assistant with one accord threw their obligations to the winds, and leaving their lathered victims helpless advanced to the window. Hey, he a taze said Reef Snyder, marveling. But the man in the first chair, with a grievance in his mind, had found a weapon. Why, that's only Henry Johnson, you blamed idiots. Come on now, Reef, and shave me. What do you think I am, a mummy? Reef Snyder turned in a great excitement. I bet you any money that was not Henry Johnson. Henry Johnson, rats. The scorn put into this last word made it an explosion. That man was a Pullman car porter or something. How could that be Henry Johnson? He demanded turbulently. You vas crazy. The man in the first chair faced the barber in a storm of indignation. Didn't I give him those lavender trousers? He roared. And young Griscombe, who had remained attentively at the window, said, Yes, I guess that was Henry. It looked like him. Oh, well, said Reef Snyder, returning to his business. If you think so. Oh, well. He implied that he was submitting for the sake of amiability. Finally, the man in the second chair, mumbling from a mouth made timid by adjacent lather, said, that was Henry Johnson, all right. Why, he always dresses like that when he wants to make a front. He's the biggest dude in town. Anybody knows that. Shinger, said Reef Snyder. Henry was not at all oblivious of the wake of wondering ejaculation that streamed out behind him. On other occasions, he had reaped this same joy, and he always had an eye for the demonstration. With a face beaming with happiness, he turned away from the scene of his victories. Into a narrow side street, where the electric light still hung high, but only to exhibit a row of tumble-down houses leaning together like paralytics. The saffron Miss Bella Farragut, in a calico frock, had been crouched on the front stoop, gossiping at long range, but she espied her approaching caller at a distance. She dashed around the corner of the house, galloping like a horse. Henry saw it all, but he preserved the polite demeanor of a guest when a waiter spills claret down his cuff. In this awkward situation, he was simply perfect. The duty of receiving Mr. Johnson fell upon Mrs. Farragut, because Bella, in another room, was scrambling wildly into her best gown. The fat old woman met him with great ivory smile, sweeping back with the door and bowing low. "'Walk in, Mr. Johnson, walk in. How is you this evening, Mr. Johnson, how is you?' Henry's face showed like a reflector as he bowed and bowed, bending almost from his head to his ankles. "'Good evening, Miss Farragut. Good evening. How is you this evening? Is all you folks well, Miss Farragut?' After a great deal of kowtow, they were planted in two chairs opposite each other in the living room. Here they exchanged the most tremendous civilities until Miss Bella swept into the room, 
when there was more kowtow on all sides and a smiling show of teeth that was like an illumination. The cooking stove was, of course, in this drawing room, and on the fire was some kind of a long-winded stew. Mrs. Farragut was obliged to arise and attend to it from time to time. Also, young Sim came in and went to bed on his pallet in the corner. But to all these domesticities the three maintained an absolute dumbness. They bowed and smiled and ignored and imitated until a late hour. And if they had been the occupants of the most gorgeous salon in the world, they could not have been more like three monkeys. After Henry had gone, Bella, who encouraged herself in the appropriation of phrases, said, Oh, Ma, isn't he divine? Four. A Saturday evening was a sign always for a larger crowd to parade the thoroughfare. In the summer, the band played until ten o'clock in the little park. Most of the young men of the town affected to be superior to this band, even to despise it, but in the still and fragrant evening, they invariably turned out in force, because the girls were sure to attend this concert, strolling slowly over the grass, linked closely in pairs, or preferably in threes, in the curious public dependence upon one another, which was their inheritance. There was no particular social aspect to this gathering, save that group regarded group with interest, but mainly in silence. Perhaps one girl would nudge another girl and suddenly say, Look, there goes Gertie Hodgson and her sister, and they would appear to regard this as an event of importance. On a particular evening, a rather large company of young men were gathered on the sidewalk that edged the park. They remained thus beyond the borders of the festivities because of their dignity, which would not exactly allow them to appear in anything which was so much fun for the younger lads. These latter were careering madly through the crowd, precipitating minor accidents from time to time, but usually fleeing like mist swept by the wind before retribution could lay hands upon them. The band played a waltz, which involved a gift of prominence to the bass horn, and one of the young men on the sidewalk said that the music reminded him of the new engines on the hill pumping water into the reservoir. A similarity of this kind was not inconceivable, but the young man did not say it because he disliked the band's playing. He said it because it was fashionable to say that manner of thing concerning the band. However, over in the stand, Billy Harris, who played the snare drum, was always surrounded by a throng of boys who adored his every whack. After the mails from New York and Rochester had been finally distributed, the crowd from the post office added to the mass already in the park. The wind waved the leaves of the maples, and high in the air, the blue burning globes of the arc lamps caused the wonderful traceries of leaf shadows on the ground. When the light fell upon the upturned face of a girl, it caused it to glow with a wonderful pallor. A policeman came suddenly from the darkness and chased a gang of obstreperous little boys. They hooted him from a distance. The leader of the band had some of the mannerisms of the great musicians, and during a period of silence the crowd smiled when they saw him raise his hand to his brow, stroke it sentimentally, and glance upward with a look of poetic anguish. In the shivering light which gave to the park an effect like a great vaulted hall, the throng swarmed, with a gentle murmur of dresses switching the turf, and with a steady hum of voices. Suddenly, without preliminary bars, there arose from afar the great hoarse roar of a factory whistle. It raised and swelled to a sinister note, and then it sang on the night wind one long call that held the crowd in the park immovable, speechless. The bandmaster had been about to vehemently let fall his hand to start the band on a thundering career through a popular march, but, smitten by this giant voice from the night, his hand dropped slowly to his knee, and his mouth agape, he looked at his men in silence. The cry died away to a wail, and then to stillness. It released the muscles of the company of young men on the sidewalk, who had been like statues posed eagerly, lithely, their ears turned, and then they wheeled upon each other simultaneously, and in a single explosion they shouted, One! Again the sound swelled in the night, and roared its long ominous cry, and as it died away, the crowd of young men wheeled upon each other, and in chorus yelled, Two! There was a moment of breathless waiting. Then they bawled, Second District! In a flash, the company of indolent and cynical young men had vanished like a snowball disrupted by dynamite. 5. Jake Rogers was the first man to reach the home of Tuscarora Hose Company No. 6. He had wrenched his key from his pocket as he tore down the street, and he jumped at the spring lock like a demon. As the doors flew back before his hands, he leaped and kicked the wedges from a pair of wheels, loosened a tongue from his clasp, and in the glare of the electric light which the town placed before each of its hose houses, the next comers beheld the spectacle of Jake Rogers bent like hickory in the manfulness of his pulling, and the heavy cart was moving slowly towards the doors. 
Four men joined him at the time, and as they swung with the cart out into the street, dark figures sped towards them from the ponderous shadows back of the electric lamps. Some set up the inevitable question, What district? Second, was replied to them in a compact howl. Tuscarora Hose Company No. 6 swept on a perilous wheel into Niagara Avenue, and as the men attached to the cart by the rope which had been paid out from the windlass under the tongue pulled madly in their fervor and abandon, the gong under the axle clanged incitingly, and sometimes the same cry was heard, What district? Second. On a grade, Johnny Thorpe fell, and exercising a singular, muscular ability, rolled out in time from the track of the oncoming wheel, and arose disheveled and aggrieved, casting a look of mournful disenchantment upon the black crowd that poured after the machine. The cart seemed to be the apex of a dark wave that was whirling as if it had been a broken dam. Back of the lad were stretches of lawn, and in that direction front doors were banged by men who hoarsely shouted out in the clamorous avenue, What district? At one of these houses, a woman came to the door, bearing a lamp, shielding her face from its rays with her hands. Across the cropped grass the avenue represented to her a kind of black torrent, upon which, nevertheless, fled numerous miraculous figures upon bicycles. She did not know that the towering light at the corner was continuing its nightly wind. Suddenly a little boy somersaulted around the corner of the house as if he had been projected down a flight of stairs by a catapultian boot. He halted himself in front of the house by dint of a rather extraordinary evolution with his legs. Oh, Ma, he gasped. Can I go, Canama? She straightened with the coldness of the exterior mother judgment, although the hand that held the lamp trembled slightly. No, Willie, you had better come to bed. Instantly he began to buck and fume like a mustang. Oh, Ma! he cried, contorting himself. Oh, Ma, can't I go? Please, Ma, can't I go? Can't I go, Ma? It's half past nine now, Willie. He ended by wailing out a compromise. Well, just down to the corner, Ma. Just down to the corner. From the avenue came the sound of rushing men who wildly shouted. Somebody had grappled the bell rope in the Methodist church, and now over the town rang this solemn and terrible voice, speaking from the clouds. Moved from its peaceful business, this bell gained a new spirit in the portentous night, and it swung the heart to and fro, up and down with each peal of it. Just down to the corner, Ma. Willie, it's half past nine now. Six. The outlines of the house of Dr. Trescott had faded quietly into the evening, hiding a shape such as we call Queen Anne against the pall of the blackened sky. The neighborhood was at this time so quiet and seemed so devoid of obstructions that Hannigan's dog thought it a good opportunity to prowl in forbidden precincts, and so came and pawed Trescott's lawn, growling and considering himself a formidable beast. Later, Peter Washington strolled past the house and whistled, but there was no dim light shining from Henry's loft, and presently Peter went his way. The rays from the street, creeping in silvery waves over the grass, caused the row of shrubs along the drive to throw a clear, bold shade. A wisp of smoke came from one of the windows at the end of the house and drifted quietly into the branches of a cherry tree. Its companions followed it in slowly increasing numbers, and finally there was a current controlled by invisible banks, which poured into the fruit-laden boughs of the cherry tree. It was no more to be noted than if a troop of dim and silent gray monkeys had been climbing a grapevine into the clouds. After a moment the window brightened as if the four panes of it had been stained with blood, and a quick ear might have been led to imagine the fire imps calling and calling, clan joining clan, gathering to the colors. From the street, however, the house maintained its dark quiet, insisting to a passerby that it was the safe dwelling of people who chose to retire early to tranquil dreams. No one could have heard this low droning of the gathering clans. Suddenly the panes of the red window tinkled and crashed to the ground, and at other windows there suddenly reared other flames, like bloody specters at the apertures of a haunted house. This outbreak had been well planned, as if by professional revolutionists. A man's voice suddenly shouted, Fire! 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 Hannigan had flung his pipe frenziedly from him because his lungs demanded room. He tumbled down from his perch, swung over the fence, and ran shouting towards the front door of the Trescotts. Then he hammered on the door, using his fists as if they were mallets. Mrs. Trescott instantly came to one of the windows on the second floor. Afterwards, she knew she had been about to say, The doctor is not at home, but if you will leave your name, I will let him know as soon as he comes. Hannigan's bawling was for a minute incoherent, but she understood that it was not about croup. What? she said, raising the window swiftly. 
Your house is on fire! You're all ablaze! Move quick if... His cries were resounding in the street as if it were a cave of echoes. Many feet pattered swiftly on the stones. There was one man who ran with an almost fabulous speed. He wore lavender trousers. A straw hat with a bright silk band was held half crumpled in his hand. As Henry reached the front door, Hannigan had just broken the lock with a kick. A thick cloud of smoke poured over them, and Henry, ducking his head, rushed into it. From Hannigan's clamor, he knew only one thing, but it turned him blue with horror. In the hall, a lick of flame had found the cord that supported signing the declaration. The engraving slumped suddenly down at one end, and then dropped to the floor where it burst with the sound of a bomb. The fire was already roaring like a winter wind among the pines. At the head of the stairs, Mrs. Trescott was waving her arms as if they were two reeds. "'Jimmy! Save Jimmy!' she screamed in Henry's face. He plunged past her and disappeared, taking the long familiar routes among these upper chambers, where he had once held office as a sort of second assistant housemaid. Hannigan had followed him up the stairs and grappled the arm of the maniacal woman there. His face was black with rage. "'You must come down!' he bellowed. She would only scream at him in reply, "'Jimmy! Jimmy! Save Jimmy!' But he dragged her forth while she babbled at him. As they swung out into the open air, a man ran across the lawn, and seizing a shutter, pulled it from its hinges and flung it far out upon the grass. Then he frantically attacked the other shutters, one by one. It was a kind of temporary insanity. "'Here, you!' howled Hannigan. "'Hold Mrs. Trescott! And stop!' The news had been telegraphed by a twist of the wrists of a neighbor who had gone to the firebox at the corner, and the time when Hannigan and his charge struggled out of the house was the time when the whistle roared its hoarse night call, smiting the crowd in the park, causing the leader of the band, who was about to order the first triumphal clang of a military march, to let his hand drop slowly to his knees. 7. Henry pawed awkwardly through the smoke in the upper halls. He had attempted to guide himself by the walls, but they were too hot. The paper was crumpling, and he expected at any moment to have a flame burst from under his hands. Jimmy! He did not call very loud, as if in fear that the humming flames below would overhear him. Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy! Stumbling and panting, he speedily reached the entrance to Jimmy's room and flung open the door. The little chamber had no smoke in it at all. It was faintly illuminated by a beautiful rosy light reflected circuitously from the flames that were consuming the house. The boy had apparently just been aroused by the noise. He sat in his bed, his lips apart, his eyes wide, while upon his little white-robed figure played caressingly the light from the fire. As the door flew open, he had before him this apparition of his pal, a terror-stricken negro, all tousled and with wool scorching, who leaped upon him and bore him up in a blanket, as if the whole affair were a case of kidnapping by a dreadful robber chief. Without waiting to go through the usual short but complete process of wrinkling up his face, Jimmy let out a gorgeous ball, which resembled the expression of a calf's deepest terror. As Johnson, bearing him, reeled into the smoke of the hall, he flung his arms about his neck and buried his face in the blanket. He called twice in muffled tones, Mama! When Johnson came to the top of the stairs with his burden, he took a quick step backward. Through the smoke that rolled to him, he could see that the lower hall was all ablaze. He cried out then in a howl that resembled Jimmy's former achievement. His legs gained a frightful faculty of bending sideways. Swinging about precariously on these reedy legs, he made his way back slowly, back along the upper hall. From the way of him then, he had given up almost all idea of escaping from the burning house and with it, the desire. He was submitting, submitting because of his father's, bending his mind in a most perfect slavery to this conflagration. He now clutched Jimmy as unconsciously as when, running toward the house, he had clutched the hat with the bright silk band. Suddenly he remembered a little private staircase which led from a bedroom to an apartment which the doctor had fitted up as a laboratory and workhouse, where he used some of his leisure and also hours when he might have been sleeping in devoting himself to experiments which came in the way of his study and interest. When Johnson recalled this stairway, the submission to the blaze departed instantly. He had been perfectly familiar with it, but his confusion had destroyed the memory of it. In his sudden momentary apathy there had been little that resembled fear, but now, as a way of safety came to him, the old frantic terror caught him. He was no longer creature to the flames, and he was afraid of the battle with them, it was a singular and swift set of alternations in which he feared twice without submission and submitted once without fear. "'Jimmy!' 
He wailed as he staggered on his way. He wished this little inanimate body at his breast to participate in his tremblings. But the child had lain limp and still during these headlong charges and countercharges, and no sign came from him. Johnson passed through two rooms and came to the head of the stairs. As he opened the door, great billows of smoke poured out, but gripping Jimmy closer, he plunged down through them. All manner of odors assailed him during this flight. They seemed to be alive with envy, hatred, and malice. At the entrance to the laboratory, he confronted a strange spectacle. The room was like a garden in the region where it might be burning flowers. Flames of violet, crimson, green, blue, orange, and purple were blooming everywhere. There was one blaze that was precisely the hue of a delicate coral. In another place was a mass that lay merely in phosphorescent inaction like a pile of emeralds. But all these marvels were to be seen dimly through clouds of heaving, turning, deadly smoke. Johnson halted for a moment on the threshold. He cried out again in the negro wail that had in it the sadness of the swamps. Then he rushed across the room. An orange-colored flame leaped like a panther at the lavender trousers. This animal bit deeply into Johnson. There was an explosion at one side, and suddenly before him there reared a delicate, trembling sapphire shaped like a fairy lady. With a quiet smile, she blocked his path and doomed him and Jimmy. Johnson shrieked, and then ducked in the manner of his race and fights. He aimed to pass under the left guard of the sapphire lady, but she was swifter than eagles, and her talons caught in him as he plunged past her. Bowing his head as if his neck had been struck, Johnson lurched forward, twisting this way and that. He fell on his back. The still form in the blanket flung from his arms rolled to the edge of the floor and beneath the window. Johnson had fallen with his head at the base of an old-fashioned desk. There was a row of jars upon the top of this desk. For the most part, they were silent amid this rioting, but there was one which seemed to hold a scintillant and writhing serpent. Suddenly the glass splintered and a ruby-red snake-like thing poured its thick length out upon the top of the old desk. It coiled and hesitated, and then began to swam a languorous way down the mahogany slant. At the angle it waved its sizzling molten head to and fro over the closed eyes of the man beneath it. Then, in a moment, with a mystic impulse, it moved again, and the red snake flowed directly down into Johnson's upturned face. Afterwards, the trail of this creature seemed to reek, and amid flames and low explosions, drops like red-hot jewels pattered softly down it at leisurely intervals. 8. Suddenly, all roads led to Dr. Trescott's. The whole town flowed toward one point. Chippeway Hose Company No. 1 toiled desperately up Bridge Street Hill even as the Tuscaroras came in an impetuous sweep down Niagara Avenue. Meanwhile, the machine of the hook and ladder experts from across the creek was spinning on its way. The chief of the fire department had been playing poker in the rear room of Whiteley's cigar store, but at the first breath of the alarm he sprang through the door like a man escaping with the kitty. In Wylamville on these occasions, there was always a number of people who instantly turned their attention to the bells in the churches and schoolhouses. The bells not only emphasized the alarm, but it was the habit to send these sounds rolling across the sky in a stirring brazen uproar until the flames were practically vanquished. There was also a kind of rivalry as to which bell should be made to produce the greatest din. Even the valley church, four miles away among the farms, had heard the voices of its brethren and immediately added a quaint little yelp. Dr. Trescott had been driving homeward, slowly smoking a cigar and feeling glad that this last case was now in complete obedience to him. Like a wild animal that he had subdued, when he heard the long whistle and chirped to his horse under the unlicensed but perfectly distinct impression that a fire had broken out in Oakhurst, a new and rather high-flying suburb of the town which was at least two miles from his own home. But in the second blast, and in the ensuing silence, he read the designation of his own district. He was then only a few blocks from his house. He took out the whip and laid it lightly on the mare. Surprised and frightened at this extraordinary action, she leaped forward, and as the rain straightened like steel bands, the doctor leaned backward a trifle. When the mare whirled him up to the closed gate, he was wondering whose house could be a fire. The man who had rung the signal box yelled something at him, but he already knew. He left the mare to her will. In front of his door was a maniacal woman in a wrapper. Ned! She screamed at the sight of him. Jimmy! Save Jimmy! Trescott had grown hard and chill. Where? He said. Where? Mrs. Trescott's voice began to bubble. Up! 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 
She pointed at the second-story windows. Hannigan was already shouting, Don't go in that way! You can't go in that way! Trescott ran around the corner of the house and disappeared from them. He knew from the view he had taken of the main hall that it would be impossible to ascend from there. His hopes were fastened now to the stairway which led from the laboratory. The door which opened from this room out upon the lawn was fastened with a bolt and lock, but he kicked close to the lock and then close to the bolt. The door with a loud crash flew back. The doctor recoiled from the roll of smoke, and then, bending low, he stepped into the garden of burning flowers. On the floor, his stinging eyes could make out a form in a smoldering blanket near the window. Then, as he carried his son towards the door, he saw the whole lawn seem now alive with men and boys, the leaders in the great charge that the whole town was making. They seized him in his burden, and overpowered him in wet blankets and water. But Hannigan was howling, "'Johnson is in there! Henry Johnson is in there yet! He went in after the kid! Johnson is in there yet!' These cries penetrated to the sleepy senses of Trescott, and he struggled with his captors, swearing, unknown to him and to them, all the deep blasphemies of his medical student days. He rose to his feet and went again towards the door of the laboratory. They endeavored to restrain him, although they were much affrighted at him. But a young man who was a brakeman on the railway and lived in one of the rear streets near the Trescotts had gone into the laboratory and brought forth a thing which he laid on the grass. 9. There were hoarse commands from in front of the house. Turn on your water, five! Let her go, one! The gathering crowd swayed this way and that way. The flames, towering high, cast a wild red light on their faces. There came the clangor of a gong from along some adjacent street. The crowd exclaimed at it. Here comes number three! That's three a-coming! A panting and irregular mob dashed into view, dragging a hose cart. A cry of exultation arose from the little boys. Here's three! The lads welcome Never Die Hose Company number three as if it were composed of a chariot dragged by a band of gods. The perspiring citizens flung themselves into the fray. The boys dance in impish joy at the displays of prowess. They acclaimed the approach of number two. They welcomed number four with cheers. They were so deeply moved by this whole affair that they bitterly guide the late appearance of the Hook and Ladder Company, whose heavy apparatus had almost stalled them on the Bridge Street Hill. The lads hated and feared a fire, of course. They did not particularly want to have anybody's house burn. But still, it was fine to see the gathering of the companies, and amid a great noise to watch their heroes perform all manner of prodigies. They were divided into parties over the worth of different companies, and supported their creeds with no small violence. For instance, in that part of the little city where Number 4 had its home, it would be most daring for a boy to contend the superiority of any other company. Likewise, in another quarter where a strange boy was asked which fire company was the best in Willemville, he was expected to answer number one. Feuds, which the boys forgot and remembered according to chance or the importance of some recent event, existed all through the town. They did not care much for John Shipley, the chief of the department. It was true that he went to a fire with the speed of a falling angel, but when there he invariably lapsed into a certain still mood, which was almost a preoccupation, moving leisurely around the burning structure and surveying it, puffing, meanwhile, at a cigar. This quiet man who, even when life was in danger, seldom raised his voice, was not much to their fancy. Now, old Sykes Huntington, when he was chief, used to bellow continually like a bull and gesticulate in a sort of delirium. He was much finer as a spectacle than this Shipley, who viewed a fire with the same steadiness that he viewed a raise in a large jackpot. The greater number of the boys could never understand why the members of these companies persisted in re-electing Shipley, although they often pretended to understand it, because, my father says, was a very formidable phrase in argument, and the fathers seemed almost unanimous in advocating Shipley. At this time there was considerable discussion as to which company had gotten the first stream of water on the fire. Most of the boys claimed that number five owed that distinction, but there was a determined minority who contended for number one. Boys who were the blood adherents of other companies were obliged to choose between the two on this occasion and the talk waxed warm. But a great rumor went among the crowds. It was told with hushed voices. Afterwards, a reverent silence fell even upon the boys. Jimmy Trescott and Henry Johnson had been burned to death, and Dr. Trescott himself had been most savagely hurt. The crowd did not even feel the police pushing at them. They raised their eyes, shining now with awe, towards the high flames. The man who had information was at his best. In low tones, he described the whole affair. That was the kid's room, in the corner there. He had measles or something, and his coon, Johnson, was a-setting up with him. 
and Johnson got sleepy or something and upset the lamp, and the doctor, he was down in his office, and he came running up, and they all got burned together till they dragged him out. Another man, always preserved for the deliverance of the final judgment, was saying, Oh, they'll die, sure. Burned to flinders. No chance. Whole lot of them. Anybody can see. The crowd concentrated its gaze still more closely upon these flags of fire, which waved joyfully against the black sky. The bells of the town were clashing unceasingly. A little procession moved across the lawn and towards the street. There were three cots, borne by twelve of the firemen. The police moved sternly, but it needed no effort of theirs to open a lane for this slow cortege. The men who bore the cots were well known to the crowd, but in the solemn parade during the ringing of the bells and the shouting, and with the red glare upon the sky, they seemed utterly foreign, and Willemville paid them a deep respect. Each man in this stretcher party had gained a reflected majesty. They were footmen to death, and the crowd made subtle obeisance to this august dignity derived from three prospective graves. One woman turned away with a shriek at the sight of the covered body on the first stretcher, and people faced her suddenly in silent and mournful indignation. Otherwise, there was barely a sound as these twelve important men with measured tread carried their burdens through the throng. The little boys no longer discussed the merits of the different fire companies. For the greater part, they had been routed. Only the more courageous viewed closely the three figures veiled in yellow blankets. 10. Old Judge Denning Hagenthorpe, who lived near opposite the Trescotts, had thrown his door wide open to receive the afflicted family. When it was publicly learned that the doctor and his son and the negro were still alive, it required a specially detailed policeman to prevent people from scaling the front porch and interviewing these sorely wounded. One old lady appeared with a miraculous poultice, and she quoted most damning scripture to the officer when he said that she could not pass him. Throughout the night some lads old enough to be given privileges or to compel them from their mothers remained vigilantly upon the curb in anticipation of a death or some such event. The reporter of the Morning Tribune rode thither on his bicycle every hour until three o'clock. Six of the ten doctors in Willemville attended at Judge Hagenthorpe's house. Almost at once they were able to know that Trescott's burns were not vitally important. The child would possibly be scarred badly, but his life was undoubtedly safe. As for the Negro Henry Johnson, he could not live. His body was frightfully scarred. But more than that, he now had no face. His face had simply been burned away. Trescott was always asking news of the two other patients. In the morning he seemed fresh and strong, so they told him that Johnson was doomed. They then saw him stir on the bed and sprang quickly to see if the bandages needed readjusting. In the sudden glance he threw from one to another, he impressed them as being both leonine and impracticable. The morning paper announced the death of Henry Johnson. It contained a long interview with Edward J. Hannigan, in which the latter described in full the performance of Johnson at the fire. There was also an editorial built from all the best words in the vocabulary of the staff. The town halted in its accustomed road of thought and turned a reverent attention to the memory of this hostler. In the breasts of many people was the regret that they had not known enough to give him a hand and a lift when he was alive, and they judged themselves stupid and ungenerous for this failure. The name of Henry Johnson became suddenly the title of a saint to the little boys. The one who thought of it first could, by quoting it in an argument, at once overthrow his antagonist, whether it applied to the subject or whence it did not. Nigger, nigger, never die, black face and shiny eye. Boys who had called this odious couplet in the rear of Johnson's march buried the fact at the bottom of their hearts. Later in the day, Miss Bella Farragut, of number 7 Watermelon Alley, announced that she had been engaged to marry Mr. Henry Johnson. 11. The old judge had a cane with an ivory head. He could never think at his best until he was leaning slightly on this stick and smoothing the white top with slow movements of his hands. It was also to him a kind of narcotic. If by any chance he mislaid it, he grew at once very irritable and was likely to speak sharply to his sister, whose mental incapacity he had patiently endured for thirty years in the old mansion on Ontario Street. She was not at all aware of her brother's opinion of her endowments, and so it might be said that the judge had successfully dissembled for more than a quarter of a century, only risking the truth at the times when his cane was lost. On a particular day, the judge sat in his armchair on the porch. The sunshine sprinkled through the lilac bushes and poured great coins on the boards. The sparrows disputed in the trees that lined the pavements. 
The judge mused deeply, while his hands gently caressed the ivory head of his cane. Finally, he arose and entered the house, his brow still furrowed in a thoughtful frown. His stick thumped solemnly in regular beats. On the second floor, he entered a room where Dr. Trescott was working about the bedside of Henry Johnson. The bandages on the Negro's head allowed only one thing to appear, an eye, which unwinkingly stared at the judge. The later spoke to Trescott on the condition of the patient. Afterward, he evidently had something further to say, but he seemed to be kept from it by the scrutiny of the unwinking eye, at which he furtively glanced from time to time. When Jimmy Trescott was sufficiently recovered, his mother had taken him to pay a visit to his grandparents in Connecticut. The doctor had remained to take care of his patients, but as a matter of truth he spent most of his time at Judge Hagenthorpe's house, where lay Henry Johnson. Here he slept and ate almost every meal in the long nights and days of his vigil. At dinner and away from the magic of the unwinking eye, the judge said suddenly, Trescott, do you think it is... As Trescott paused expectantly, the judge fingered his knife. He said thoughtfully, No one wants to advance such ideas, but somehow I think that the poor fellow ought to die. There was in Trescott's face at once a look of recognition, as if in this tangent of the judge he saw an old problem. He merely sighed and answered, Who knows? The words were spoken in a deep tone that gave them an elusive kind of significance. The judge retreated to the cold manner of the bench. Perhaps we may not talk with the propriety of this kind of action, but I am induced to say that you are performing a questionable charity in preserving this Negro's life. As near as I can understand, he will hereafter be a monster, a perfect monster, and probably with an affected brain. No man can observe you as I have observed you, and not know that it was a matter of conscience with you. But I am afraid, my friend, that it is one of the blunders of virtue. The judge had delivered his views with his habitual oratory. The last three words he spoke with a particular emphasis, as if the phrase was his discovery. The doctor made a weary gesture. He saved my boy's life. Yes, said the judge swiftly. Yes, I know. And what am I to do, said Trescott his eyes suddenly lighting like an outburst from smoldering Pete. What am I to do? He gave himself for... for Jimmy. What am I to do for him? The judge abased himself completely before these words. He lowered his eyes for a moment. He picked at his cucumbers. Presently he braced himself straightly in his chair. He will be your creation, you understand. He is purely your creation. Nature has very evidently given him up. He is dead. You are restoring him to life. You are making him, and he will be a monster, and with no mind. He will be what you like, Judge, cried Trescott, in sudden polite fury. He will be anything but, by God, he saved my boy. The judge interrupted in a voice trembling with emotion. Trescott! Trescott! Don't I know! Trescott had subsided to a sullen mood. Yes, you know he answered acidly. But you don't know all about your own boy being saved from death. This was a perfectly childish allusion to the judge's bachelorhood. Trescott knew that the remark was infantile, but he seemed to take desperate delight in it. But it passed the judge completely. It was not his spot. I am puzzled, said he in profound thought. I don't know what to say. Trescott had become repentant. Don't think I don't appreciate what you say, Judge, but... Of course, responded the Judge quickly. Of course. It began Trescott. Of course, said the Judge. In silence, they resumed their dinner. Well, said the Judge ultimately, it is hard for a man to know what to do. It is, said the Doctor fervidly. There was another silence. It was broken by the Judge. Look here, Trescott, I don't want you to think... No, certainly not, answered the doctor earnestly. Well, I don't want you to think that I would say anything to... It was only that I thought that I might be able to suggest to you that... Perhaps the affair was a little dubious. With an appearance of suddenly disclosing his real mental perturbation, the doctor said, Well, what would you do? Would you kill him? 
he asked abruptly and sternly. Trescott, you fool, said the old man gently. Oh, well, I know, Judge, but then... He turned red and spoke with new violence. Say, he saved my boy, do you see? He saved my boy. You bet he did, cried the judge with enthusiasm. You bet he did. And they remained for a time gazing at each other, their faces illuminated with memories of a certain deed. After another silence, the judge said, It is hard for a man to know what to do. Twelve. Late one evening, Trescott, returning from a professional call, paused his buggy at the Hagenthorpe gate. He tied the mare to the old tin-covered post and entered the house. Ultimately, he appeared with a companion, a man who walked slowly and carefully, as if he were learning. He was wrapped to the heels in an old-fashioned ulster. They entered the buggy and drove away. After a silence only broken by the swift and musical humming of the wheels on the smooth road, Trescott spoke. Henry, he said, I've got you home here with old Alec Williams. You will have everything you want to eat and a good place to sleep, and I hope you will get along there all right. I will pay all your expenses and come to see you as often as I can. If you don't get along, I want you to let me know as soon as possible, and then we will do what we can to make it better. The dark figure at the doctor's side answered with a cheerful laugh. These buggy wheels don't look like I washed them yesterday, doctor, he said. Trescott hesitated for a moment and then went on insistently. I am taking you to Alec Williams, Henry, and I... The figure chuckled again. <laughs> no, dee, no, sir. Alec Williams don't know a horse. Dee, dee, don't. He don't know a horse from a pig. The laugh that followed was like the rattle of pebbles. Trescott turned and looked sternly and coldly at the dim form in the gloom from the buggy top. Henry, he said, I didn't say anything about horses. I was saying... House? House? said the quavering voice from these near shadows. Hoss? Deed I don't know all about a hoss. Deed I don't. There was a satirical chuckle. At the end of three miles, the mare slackened and the doctor leaned forward, peering while holding tight reins. The wheels of the buggy bumped often over outcropping boulders. A window shone forth, a simple square of topaz on a great black hillside. Four dogs charged the buggy with ferocity, and when it did not promptly retreat, they circled courageously around the flanks, baying. A door opened near the window in the hillside, and a man came and stood on a beach of yellow light. Yeah, yeah, you Rover, you Susie, come ya, come ya this minute. Trescott called across the dark sea of grass. Hello, Alec. Hello. Come down here and show me where to drive. The man plunged from the beach into the surf, and Trescott could then only trace his course by the fervid and polite ejaculations of a host who was somewhere approaching. Presently, Williams took the mare by the head and, uttering cries of welcome and scolding the swarming dogs, led the equipage towards the lights. When they halted at the door and Trescott was climbing out, Williams cried, "'Will she stand, doctor?' "'She'll stand all right, but you better hold her for a minute. "'Now, Henry,' The doctor turned and held both arms to the dark figure. It crawled to him painfully like a man going down a ladder. Williams took the mare away to be tied to a little tree. And when he returned, he found them awaiting him in the gloom beyond the rays from the door. He burst out then like a siphon pressed by a nervous thumb. Henry! Henry, my old friend! Well, if I ain't glad, if I ain't glad... Trescott had taken the silent shape by the arm and led it forward into the full revelation of the light. Well, now, Alec, you can take Henry and put him to bed, and in the morning I will... Near the end of this sentence, old Williams had come front to front with Johnson. He gasped for a second, and then yelled the yell of a man stabbed in the heart. For a fraction of a moment, Trescott seemed to be looking for epithets. Then he roared. You old black chump, you old black... Shut up! Shut up! Do you hear? Williams obeyed instantly in the matter of his screams, but he continued in a lowered voice. My lord of massy, who'd ever think my lord of massy? Trescott spoke again in the manner of a commander of a battalion. Alec! The old negro again surrendered, but to himself he repeated in a whisper. My lord. He was aghast and trembling. 
As these three points of widening shadows approached the golden doorway, a hale old negress appeared there, bowing. "'Good evening, doctor. Good evening. Come here, come here.' She had evidently just retired from a tempestuous struggle to place the room in order, but she was now bowing rapidly. She made the effort of a person swimming. "'Don't trouble yourself, Mary,' said Trescott, entering. "'I brought Henry for you to take care of, and all you've got to do is carry out what I tell you.' Learning that he was not followed, he faced the door and said, "'Come in, Henry!' Johnson entered. "'Wee!' Oui! shrieked Mrs. Williams. She almost achieved a back somersault. Six young members of the tribe of Williams made a simultaneous plunge for a position behind the stove and formed a wailing heap. End of Section 1 the Monster Part 1 Section 2 of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker The Monster Part 2 13 You know very well that you and your family live usually on less than three dollars a week, and now that Dr. Trescott pays you five dollars a week for Johnson's board, you live like millionaires. You haven't done a stroke of work since Johnson began to board with you. Everybody knows that, and so what are you kicking about? The judge sat in his chair on the porch, fondling his cane and gazing down at old Williams, who stood under the lilac bushes. Yes, I know, Judge, said the negro, wagging his head in a puzzled manner. Tain't like as if I didn't appreciate what the doctor done, but, but, well, you see, Judge, he added, gaining a new impetus. It's, it's hard work. This old man never do work so hard. Lord, no. Don't talk such nonsense, Alec, spoke the judge sharply. You've never really worked in your life, anyhow, enough to support a family of sparrows, and now when you are in a more prosperous condition than ever before, you come around talking like an old fool. The negro began to scratch his head. "'You see, Judge,' he said at last, "'my old woman, she can't receive no lady callers, no how.' "'Hang lady callers,' said the judge, irascibly. "'If you have flour in the barrel and meat in the pot, "'your wife can get along without receiving lady callers, can't she?' "'But they won't come anyhow, Judge,' replied Williams, "'with an air of still deeper stupefaction. "'None of my wife's friends, nor none of my friends, "'will come near my residence.' Well, let them stay home if they're such silly people. The old negro seemed to be seeking a way to elude this argument, but evidently finding none, he was about to shuffle meekly off. He halted, however. Judge, said he, my old woman's near drive distracted. Your old woman is an idiot, responded the judge. Williams came very close and peered solemnly through a branch of lilac. Judge, he whispered, the chillins. What about them? Dropping his voice to funereal depths, William said, They, they can't eat. Can't eat, scoffed the judge loudly. Can't eat? You must think I'm as big an old fool as you are. Can't eat, little rascals. What's to prevent them from eating? In answer, William said with mournful emphasis, Henry. Moved with a kind of satisfaction at his tragic use of the name, he remained staring at the judge for a sign of its effect. The judge made a gesture of irritation. Come now, you old scoundrel, don't beat around the bush any more. What are you up to? What do you want? Speak out like a man, and don't give me any more of this tiresome rigmarole. I ain't ever beaten round about nothing, judge, replied Williams indignantly. No, sir. I say, what I gotta say right out? Deed I do. Well, say it then. Judge, began the negro, taking off his hat and switching his knee with it. Lord knows I'd do just about... As much for five dollars a week as any cold man, but, but, but this year business is awful, Judge. I reckon ain't been no sleep in, in my house since Doctor done fetch him. Well, what do you propose to do about it? Williams lifted his eyes from the ground and gazed off through the trees. Reckon I got good appetite and sleep just like a dog, but he he's done broke me all up. Tain't no good, no how. I wake up in the night. I hear him, maybe, or whimpering and or whimpering, and and I sneak and I sneak until I try the door to see if he locked in, and it keep me or puzzling and or quaking all night long. Don't know how to do in the winter. Can't let him out where the chillin' is. He'll done freeze where he is now. Williams spoke these sentences as if he were talking to himself. 
After a silence of deep reflection, he continued, Folks go around saying he ain't Henry Johnson at all. They say he's her devil. What? cried the judge. Yes, sir, repeated Williams in tones of injury, as if his veracity had been challenged. Yes, sir, I'm a-telling it to you straight, judge. Plenty cold people, folks up my way, say it is a devil. Well, you don't think so yourself, do you? No, it ain't no devil. It's Henry Johnson. Well, then, what's the matter with you? You don't care what a lot of foolish people say. Go on tending your business and pay no attention to such idle nonsense. Tis nonsense, judge, but he looks like her devil. What do you care what he looks like? demanded the judge. My rent is two dollars and a half for months, said Williams slowly. It might just as well be ten thousand dollars a month, responded the judge. You never pay it anyhow. Then nothing, continued Williams in his reflective tone. If he was all right in his head, I could stand it. But, Judge, he's crazier than a loon. Then when he looks like a devil, and doesn't scares all my friends away, and my chillings can't eat, and my old woman just raising cane and all the time, and my rent two dollars and a half a month, and him not right in his head, it seems like five dollars a week. The judge's stick came down sharply and suddenly upon the floor of the porch. There, he said. I thought that was what you were driving at. Williams began swinging his head from side to side in the strange racial mannerism. Now, hold on a minute, Judge, he said defensively. Tain't like as if I didn't appreciate what the doctor done. Tain't that. Dr. Trescott is a kind man, and tain't like as if I didn't appreciate what he done, but, but... But what? You're getting painful, Alec. Now tell me this. Did you ever have five dollars a week regularly before in your life? Williams at once drew himself up with great dignity, but in the pause after that question he drooped gradually to another attitude. In the end he answered heroically, No, Judge, I ain't. And tain't like as if I were saying five dollars wasn't a lot of money for a man like me. But, Judge, what a man ought to get up for his kind of work is a salary. Yes, sir, Judge, he repeated with great impressive gesture. For this kind of work a man ought to get her salary. He laid a terrible emphasis upon the final word. The judge laughed. I know Dr. Trescott's mind concerning this affair, Alec, and if you are dissatisfied with your boarder, he is quite ready to move him to some other place. So if you care to leave word with me that you are tired of the arrangement and wish it changed, he will come and take Johnson away. William scratched his head again in deep perplexity. Five dollars is a big price for board, but tain't no big price for the board or a crazy man, he said finally. What do you think you ought to get? asked the judge. Well, answered Alec, in the manner of one deep in a balancing of the scales. He looked like a devil, and done scares everybody, and my children can't eat, and I can't sleep, and he ain't right in the head, and he told me all those things. After scratching his wool and beating his knee with his hat and gazing off through the trees and down at the ground, William said, as he kicked nervously at the gravel, Well, Judge, I think it is worth, he stuttered, worth what? Six dollars, answered Williams in a desperate outburst. The judge lay back in his great armchair and went through all the motions of a man laughing heartily, but he made no sound save a slight cough. Williams had been watching him with apprehension. Well, said the judge, do you call six dollars a salary? No, sir. "'Promptly responded Williams. "'Tain't a salary. No deed. Tain't a salary.' "'He looked with some anger upon the man who questioned his intelligence in this way. "'Well, supposing your children can't eat.' "'Ah, uh, and supposing he looks like a devil, and supposing all those things continue, "'would you be satisfied with six dollars a week?' "'Recollections seemed to throng in Williams's mind at these interrogations, "'and he answered dubiously, of course, a man who ain't right in his head and looks like a devil, but six dollars. After these two attempts at a sentence, William suddenly appeared as an orator, with great shiny palm waving in the air. I tell you, Judge, six dollars is six dollars. But if I get six dollars for Bowden Henry Johnson, I earns it. I earns it. I don't doubt that you earn six dollars every week's work you do, said the judge. Well, if I bowed Henry Johnson for six dollars a week, I owns it, I owns it, cried Williams wildly. Fourteen. Reef Snyder's assistant had gone to his supper, 
and the owner of the shop was trying to placate four men who wished to be shaved at once. Reef Snyder was very garrulous, a fact which made him rather remarkable among barbers, who, as a class, are austerely speechless, having been taught silence by the hammering reiteration of a tradition. It is the customers who talk in the ordinary event. As Reef Snyder waved his razor down the cheek of a man in the chair, he turned often to cool the impatience of the others with pleasant talk, which they did not particularly heed. "'Oh, he should have let him die,' said Bainbridge, a railway engineer, finally replying to one of the barber's orations. "'Shut up, Reef, and go on with your business.' Instead, Reef Snyder paused, shaving entirely, and turned to front the speaker. "'Let him die?' he demanded. "'How was that? How can you let a man die?' "'By letting him die, you chump,' said the engineer. The others laughed a little, and Reef Snyder turned at once to his work, sullenly as a man overwhelmed by the derision of numbers. "'How was that?' he grumbled later. "'How can you let a man die when he was done so much for you?' "'When he vas done so much for you,' repeated Bainbridge, "'you better shave some people. How vas that? Maybe this ain't a barber shop. A man hitherto silent now said, "'If I had been the doctor, I would have done the same thing.' "'Of course,' said Reef Snyder. "'Any man would do it. Any man that was not like you, you old flint-hearted fish.' He sought the final words with painful care, and he delivered the collection triumphantly at Bainbridge, the engineer laughed. The man in the chair now lifted himself higher, while Reef Snyder began an elaborate ceremony of anointing and combing his hair. Now free to join comfortably in the talk, the man said, They say he's the most terrible thing in the world. Young Johnny Bernard, that drives the grocery wagon, saw him up at Alec Williams' shanty, and he says he couldn't eat anything for two days. Gee, said Reef Snyder. Well, what makes him so terrible? asked another. "'Because he hasn't got any face,' replied the barber and the engineer in duet. "'Hasn't got any face,' repeated the man. "'How can he do without any face?' "'He has no face in the front of his head in the place where his face ought to grow.' Bainbridge sang these lines pathetically as he arose and hung his hat on a hook. The man in the chair was about to abdicate in his favor. "'Get a gate on you now,' he said to Reef Snyder. "'I go out at 731.' As the barber foamed the lather on the cheeks of the engineer, he seemed to be thinking heavily. Then suddenly he burst out. "'How would you like to be with no face?' he cried to the assemblage. "'Oh, if I had a face like yours,' Bainbridge's voice came from a sea of lather. "'You're kicking because if losing faces became popular, you'd have to go out of business.' "'I don't think it will become so much popular,' said Reef Snyder. "'Not if it's got to be taken off in the way his was taken off,' said another man." I'd rather keep mine, if you don't mind. I guess so, cried the barber. Just think. The shaving of Bainbridge had arrived at a time of comparative liberty for him. I wonder what the doctor says to himself, he observed. He may be sorry he made him live. It was the only thing he could do, replied a man. The other seemed to agree with him. Supposing you were in his place, said one, and Johnson had saved your kid, what would you do? Certainly. Of course, you would do anything on earth for him. You take all the trouble in the world for him and spend your last dollar on him. Well, then, I wonder how it feels to be without any face, said Reef Snyder musingly. The man who had previously spoken, feeling that he had expressed himself well, repeated the whole thing. You would do anything on earth for him. You take all the trouble in the world for him and spend your last dollar on him. Well, then, no, but look, said Reef Snyder. Supposing you don't got a face. 15. As soon as Williams was hidden from the view of the old judge, he began to gesture and talk to himself. An elation had evidently penetrated to his vitals and caused him to dilate as if he had been filled with gas. He snapped his fingers in the air and whistled fragments of triumphal music. At times in his progress towards his shanty, he indulged in a shuffling movement that was really a dance. It was to be learned from the intermediate monologue that he had emerged from his trials, laureled and proud. He was the unconquerable Alexander Williams. Nothing could exceed the bold self-reliance of his manner, his kingly stride, his heroic song, the derisive flourish of his hands, all betokened a man who had successfully defied the world. On his way, he saw Zeke Patterson coming to town. 
They hailed each other at a distance of fifty yards. How do, Broth Patterson? How do, Broth Williams? They were both deacons. Is your folks well, Broth Patterson? Midlin, Midlin, how is your folks, Broth Williams? Neither of them had slowed his pace in the smallest degree. They had simply begun this talk when a considerable space separated them, continued it as they passed, and added polite questions as they drifted steadily apart. William's mind seemed to be a balloon. He had been so inflated that he had not noticed that Patterson had definitely shied into the dry ditch as they came to the point of ordinary contact. Afterwards, as he went a lonely way, he burst out again in song and pantomimic celebration of his estate. His feet moved in prancing steps. When he came in sight of his cabin, the fields were bathed in a blue dusk, and the light in the window was pale. Gavorting and gesticulating, he gazed joyfully for some moments upon this light. Then, suddenly, another idea seemed to attack his mind, and he stopped, with an air of being suddenly dampened. In the end, he approached his home as if it were the fortress of an enemy. Some dogs disputed his advance for a loud moment, and then, discovering their lord, slunk away embarrassed. His reproaches were addressed to them in muffled tones. Arriving at the door, he pushed it open with the timidity of a new thief. He thrust his head cautiously sideways, and his eyes met the eyes of his wife, who sat by the table, the lamplight defining a half of her face. Shh, he said uselessly. His glance traveled swiftly to the inner door which shielded the one bedchamber. The piccaninnies, strewn upon the floor of the living room, were softly snoring. After a hearty meal, they had promptly dispersed themselves about the place and gone to sleep. Shh, said Williams again to his motionless and silent wife. He had allowed only his head to appear. His wife, with one hand upon the edge of the table and the other at her knee, was regarding him with wide eyes and parted lips as if he were a specter. She looked to be one who was living in terror, and even the familiar face at the door had thrilled her because it had come suddenly. Williams broke the tense silence. "'Is he all right?' he whispered, waving his eyes toward the inner door. Following his glance timorously, his wife nodded, and in a low tone answered, "'I reckon he done gone to sleep.' Williams then slunk noiselessly across his threshold. He lifted a chair, and with infinite care placed it so that it faced the dreaded inner door. His wife moved slightly so as to also squarely face it. A silence came upon them in which they seemed to be waiting for a calamity, peeling and deadly. Williams finally coughed behind his hand. His wife started and looked upon him in alarm. "'Pears like he don't go and keep quiet tonight,' he breathed. They continually pointed their speech and their looks at the inner door, paying it the homage due to a corpse or a phantom. Another long stillness followed this sentence. Their eyes shone white and wide. A wagon rattled down the distant road. From their chairs they looked at the window, and the effect of the light in the cabin was a presentation of an intensely black and solemn night. The old woman adopted the attitude used always in church at funerals. At times she seemed to be upon the point of breaking out in prayer. "'He mighty quiet tonight,' whispered Williams. "'Was he good today?' For answer, his wife raised her eyes to the ceiling in supplication of Job. Williams moved restlessly. Finally, he tiptoed to the door. He knelt slowly and without a sound, and placed his ear near the keyhole. Hearing a noise behind him, he turned quickly. His wife was staring at him aghast. She stood in front of the stove, and her arms were spread out in the natural movement to protect all her sleeping ducklings. But Williams arose without having touched the door. "'I reckon he asleep,' he said, fingering his wool. He debated with himself for some time. During this interval, his wife remained, a great fat statue of a mother, shielding her children. It was plain that his mind was swept suddenly by a wave of temerity. With a sounding step, he moved towards the door. His fingers were almost upon the knob when he swiftly ducked and dodged away, clapping his hands to the back of his head. It was as if the portal had threatened him. There was a little tumult near the stove, where Mrs. Williams' desperate retreat had involved her feet with the prostrate children. After the panic, Williams bore traces of a feeling of shame. He returned to the charge. He firmly grasped the knob with his left hand, and with the other hand turned the key in the lock. He pushed the door, and as it swung portentously open, he sprang nimbly to one side like the fearful slave liberating the lion. Near the stove, a group had formed, the terror-stricken mother with her arms stretched, and the aroused children clinging frenziedly to her skirts. The light streamed after the swinging door and disclosed a room six feet one way and six feet the other way. 
It was small enough to enable the radiance to lay it plain. Williams peered warily around the corner made by the doorpost. Suddenly he advanced, retired, and advanced again with a howl. His palsied family had expected him to spring backward, and at his howl they heaped themselves wondrously. But Williams simply stood in the little room emitting his howls before an open window. He's gone! He's gone! He's gone! His eye and his hand had speedily proved the fact. He had even thrown open a little cupboard. Presently he came flying out. He grabbed his hat and hurled the outer door back upon its hinges. Then he tumbled headlong into the night. He was yelling, Dr. Trescott! Dr. Trescott! He ran wildly through the fields and galloped in the direction of town. He continued to call to Trescott as if the latter was within easy hearing. It was as if Trescott was poised in the contemplated sky over the running Negro and could heed this reaching voice. Dr. Prescott! In the cabin, Mrs. Williams, supported by relays from the battalion of children, stood quaking watch until the truth of daylight came as a reinforcement and made the arrogant, strutting, swashbuckler children and a mother who proclaimed her illimitable courage. 16. Teresa Page was giving a party. It was the outcome of a long series of arguments addressed to her mother, which had been overheard in part by her father. He had at last said five words. Oh, let her have it. The mother had then gladly capitulated. Teresa had written nineteen invitations and distributed them at recess to her schoolmates. Later her mother had composed five large cakes, and still later a vast amount of lemonade. So the nine little girls and ten little boys sat quite primly in the dining room, while Teresa and her mother plied them with cake and lemonade, and also with ice cream. This primness sat now quite strangely upon them. It was owing to the presence of Mrs. Page. Previously, in the parlor alone with their games, they had overturned a chair. The boys had let more or less of their hoodlum spirit shine forth. But when circumstances could be possibly magnified to warrant it, the girls made the boys victims of an insufferable pride, snubbing them mercilessly. So, in the dining room, they resembled a class at Sunday school. If it were not for the subterranean smiles, gestures, rebuffs, and poutings which stamped the affair as a children's party, two little girls of this subdued gathering were planted in a settle with their backs to the broad window. They were beaming lovingly upon each other with an effect of scorning the boys. Hearing a noise behind her at the window, one little girl turned to face it. Instantly, she screamed and sprang away, covering her face with her hands. What was it? What was it? cried everyone in a roar. Some slight movement of the eyes of the weeping and shuddering child informed the company that she had been frightened by an appearance at the window. At once they all faced the imperturbable window, and for a moment there was a silence. An astute lad made an immediate census of the other lads. The prank of slipping out and looming spectrally at a window was too venerable, but the little boys were all present and astonished. As they recovered their minds, they uttered warlike cries, and through a side door sallied rapidly out against the terror. They vied with each other in daring. None wished particularly to encounter a dragon in the darkness of the garden, but there could be no faltering when the fair ones in the dining room were present. Calling to each other in stern voices, they went dragooning over the lawn, attacking the shadows with ferocity, but still with the caution of reasonable beings. They found, however, nothing new to the peace of the night. Of course, there was a lad who told a great lie. He described a grim figure bending low and slinking off along the fence, he gave a number of details, rendering his lie more splendid by a repetition of certain forms which he recalled from romances. For instance, he insisted that he had heard the creature emit a hollow laugh. Inside the house, the little girl who had raised the alarm was still shuddering and weeping. With the utmost difficulty was she brought to a state approximating calmness by Mrs. Page. Then she wanted to go home at once. Page entered the house at this time. He had exiled himself until he concluded that this children's party was finished and gone. He was obliged to escort the little girl home because she screamed again when they opened the door and she saw the night. She was not coherent even to her mother. Was it a man? She didn't know. It was simply a thing. A dreadful thing. 17. In Watermelon Alley, the Farraguts were spending their evening as usual on the little rickety porch. Sometimes they howled gossip to other people on other rickety porches. The thin wail of a baby arose from a near house. A man had a terrific altercation with his wife, to which the alley paid no attention at all. There appeared suddenly before the Farragut's a monster, making a low and sweeping bow. 
There was an instant's pause, and then occurred something that resembled the effect of an upheaval of the earth's surface. The old woman hurled herself backward with a dreadful cry. Young Sim had been perched gracefully on a railing. At sight of the monster, he simply fell over it to the ground. He made no sound. His eyes stuck out. His nerveless hands tried to grapple the rail to prevent a tumble. And then he vanished. Bella, blubbering, and with her hair suddenly and mysteriously disheveled, was crawling on her hands and knees, fearsomely up the steps. Standing before this wreck of a family gathering, the monster continued to bow. It even raised a deprecatory claw. "'Don't make no botheration about me, Miss Faggot,' it said politely. "'No deed. I just drop in to ax if you're well this evening, Miss Faggot. Don't make no botheration, no deed. I'll go and ask you to go or to dance with me, Miss Faggot.' I ask you if I can have the magnificent gratitude of your company on that occasion, Miss Faggot. The girl cast a miserable glance behind her. She was still crawling away. On the ground beside the porch, young Sim raised a strange bleat, which expressed both his fright and his lack of wind. Presently the monster, with a fashionable amble, ascended the steps after the girl. She groveled in a corner of the room as the creature took a chair. It seated itself very elegantly on the edge. It held an old cap in both hands. Don't make no botheration, Miss Faggot. Don't make no botherations, no deed. I just drop in to ask you if you won't do me the proud of accepting my humble invitation to your dance, Miss Faggot. She shielded her eyes with her arms and tried to crawl past it, but the genial monster blocked the way. I just drop in to ask you about your dance, Miss Faggot. I ask you if I can have the magnificent... Gratitude of you company on that occasion, Miss Faggot. In a last outbreak of despair, the girl, shuddering and wailing, threw herself face downward on the floor while the monster sat on the edge of the chair, gabbling courteous invitations and holding the old hat daintily to his stomach. At the back of the house, Mrs. Farragut, who was of enormous weight and who for eight years had done little more than sit in an armchair and describe her various ailments, had with speed and agility scaled a high board fence. Eighteen. The black mass in the middle of Trescott's property was hardly allowed to cool before the builders were at work on another house. It had sprung upward at a fabulous rate. It was like a magical composition born of the ashes. The doctor's office was the first part to be completed, and he had already moved in his new books and instruments and medicines. Trescott sat before his desk when the chief of police arrived. "'Well, we found him,' said the latter. "'Did you?' cried the doctor. "'Where?' Shambling around the streets at daylight this morning, I'll be blamed if I can figure out where he passed the night. Where is he now? Oh, we jugged him. I don't know what else to do with him. That's what I want you to tell me. Of course, we can't keep him. No charge could be made, you know. I'll come down and get him. The official grinned retrospectively. Must say, he's a fine career while he was out. First thing he did was to break up a children's party at Pages. Then he went to Watermelon Alley. Ooh, he stampeded the whole outfit. Men, women, and children running pell-mell and yelling. They say one old woman broke her leg or something, shinning over a fence. And he went right out on the main street, and an Irish girl threw a fit, and there was a sort of a riot. He began to run, and a big crowd chased him, firing rocks. But he gave them the slip somehow down there by the foundry and in the railroad yard. We looked for him all night, but couldn't find him. Was he hurt any? Did anyone hit him with a stone? Guess there isn't much of him to hurt any more, is there? Guess he's been hurt up to the limit. No, they never touched him. Of course, nobody really wanted to hit him, but you know how a crowd gets. It's like... It's like... Uh... Yes, I know. For a moment, the chief of the police looked reflectively at the floor. Then he spoke hesitatingly. You know, Jack Winter's little girl was the one that he scared at the party. She's pretty sick, they say. Is she? Why didn't they call me? I always attend the Winter family. No... "'Didn't they?' asked the chief slowly. "'Well, you know, winter is... "'Well, winter has gone clean crazy over this business. "'He wanted... he wanted to have you arrested.' "'Have me arrested? The idiot. "'What in the name of wonder could he have me arrested for?' Oh, "'Of course, he is a fool. I told him to keep his trap shut. "'But then you know how he'll go all over town yapping about the thing. "'I thought I'd better tip you.' Oh, he is of no consequence. But then, of course, I am obliged to you, Sam. That's all right. 
Well, you'll be down tonight and take him out, eh? You'll get a good welcome from the jailer. He don't like his job for a cent. He says you can have your man whenever you want him. He's got no use for him. But what is this business of Winters about having me arrested? Oh, it's a lot of chin about your having no right to allow this... this... Uh, this man to be at large. But I told him to tend to his own business. Only I thought I'd better let you know. And I might as well say right now, Doctor, that there is a good deal to talk about this thing. If I were you, I'd come to the jail pretty late at night, because... There's likely to be a crowd around the door, and I'd bring a mm, mask or some kind of a veil, anyhow. 19. Martha Goodwin was single and well along into the thin years. She lived with her married sister in Willemville. She performed nearly all the housework in exchange for the privilege of existence. Everyone tacitly recognized her labor as a form of penance for the early end of her betrothed, who had died of smallpox, which he had not caught from her. But despite the strenuous and unceasing workaday of her life, she was a woman of great mind. She had adamantine opinions upon the situation in Armenia, the condition of women in China, the flirtation between Mrs. Minister of Niagara Avenue and young Griscom, the conflict in the Bible class of the Baptist Sunday School, the duty of the United States towards the Cuban insurgents, and many other colossal matters. Her fullest experience of violence was gained on an occasion when she had seen a hound clubbed, but in the plan which she had made for the reform of the world, she advocated drastic measures. For instance, she contended that all the Turks should be pushed into the sea and drowned, and that Mrs. Minster and young Griscom should be hanged side by side on twin gallows. In fact, this woman of peace, who had seen only peace, argued constantly for a creed of illimitable ferocity. She was invulnerable on these questions because eventually she overrode all opponents with a sniff. This sniff was an active force. It was to her antagonists like a bang over the head, and none was known to recover from this expression of exalted contempt. It left them winless and conquered. They never again came forward as candidates for suppression, and Martha walked her kitchen with a stern brow, an invincible being like Napoleon. Nevertheless, her acquaintances from the pain of their defeats had been long in secret revolt. It was in no wise a conspiracy because they did not care to state their open rebellion but nevertheless it was understood that any woman who could not coincide with one of Martha's contentions was entitled to the support of others in the small circle. It amounted to an arrangement by which all were required to disbelieve any theory for which Martha fought. This, however, did not prevent them from speaking of her mind with profound respect. Two people bore the brunt of her ability. Her sister Kate was visibly afraid of her, while Carrie Dungeon sailed across from her kitchen to sit respectfully at Martha's feet and learn the business of the world. To be sure, afterwards, under another son, she always laughed at Martha and pretended to deride her ideas, but in the presence of the sovereign she always remained silent or admiring. Kate, the sister, was of no consequence at all. Her principal delusion was that she did all the work in the upstairs rooms of the house while Martha did it downstairs. The truth was seen only by the husband, who treated Martha with a kindness that was half banter, half deference. Martha herself had no suspicion that she was the only pillar of the domestic edifice. The situation was without definitions. Martha made definitions, but she devoted them entirely to the Armenians and Griscom and the Chinese and other subjects. Her dreams, which in early days had been of love of meadows and the shade of trees, of the face of a man, were now involved otherwise, and they were companioned in the kitchen curiously. Cuba, the hot water kettle, Armenia, the washing of the dishes, and the whole thing being jumbled. In regard to social misdemeanors, she who was simply the mausoleum of a dead passion was probably the most savage critic in town. This unknown woman, hidden in a kitchen as in a well, was sure to have a considerable effect of the one kind or the other in the life of the town. Every time it moved a yard, she had personally contributed an inch. She could hammer so stoutly upon the door of a proposition that it would break from its hinges and fall upon her, but at any rate it moved. She was an engine, and the fact that she did not know that she was an engine contributed largely to the effect. One reason that she was formidable was that she did not even imagine that she was formidable. She remained a weak, innocent, and pig-headed creature, who alone would defy the universe if she thought the universe merited this proceeding. One day Carrie Dungeon came across from her kitchen with speed. She had a great deal of grist. Oh, she cried, Henry Johnson got away from where they was keeping him. 
It came to town last night and scared everybody almost to death. Martha was shining a dishpan, polishing madly. No reasonable person could see cause for this operation because the pan already glistened like silver. Well, she ejaculated. She imparted to the world a deep meaning. This, my prophecy, has come to pass. It was a habit. The overplus of information was choking Carrie. Before she could go on, she was obliged to struggle for a moment. And, oh, little Sadie Winter is awful sick, and they say Jake Winter was around this morning trying to get Dr. Trescott arrested, and poor old Mrs. Farragut sprained her ankle in trying to climb a fence, and there's a crowd around the jail all the time. They put Henry in jail because they didn't know what else to do with him, I guess. They say he is perfectly terrible. Martha finally released the dishpan and confronted the headlong speaker. Well, she said again, poising a great brown rag. Kate had heard the excited newcomer and drifted down from the novel in her room. She was a shivery little woman. Her shoulder blades seemed to be two panes of ice, for she was constantly shrugging and shrugging. Serves him right if she was to lose all his patience, she said suddenly in bloodthirsty tones. She snipped her words out as if her lips were scissors. Well, he's likely to, shouted Carrie Dungeon. Don't a lot of people say that they won't have him any more? If you're sick and nervous, Dr. Trescott would scare the life out of you, wouldn't he? He would me. I'd keep thinking. Martha, stalking to and fro, sometimes surveyed the two other women with a contemplative frown. 20. After the return from Connecticut, little Jimmy was at first much afraid of the monster who lived in the room over the carriage house. He could not identify it in any way. Gradually, however, his fear dwindled under the influence of a weird fascination. He sidled in to closer and closer relations with it. One time the monster was seated on a box behind the stable basking in the rays of the afternoon sun. A heavy crepe veil was swathed about its head. Little Jimmy and many companions came around the corner of the stable. They were all in what was popularly known as the baby class and consequently escaped from school a half hour before the other children. They halted abruptly at sight of the figure on the box. Jimmy waved his hand with the air of a proprietor. There he is, he said. Ooh, murmured all the little boys. Ooh. They shrank back and grouped according to courage or experience, as at the sound of the monster slowly turned its head. Jimmy had remained in the van alone. Don't be afraid. I won't let him hurt you, he said delighted. Huh, they replied contemptuously. We ain't afraid. Jimmy seemed to reap all the joys of the owner and exhibitor of one of the world's marvels while his audience remained at a distance, awed and entranced, fearful and envious. One of them addressed Jimmy gloomily. Bet you doesn't walk right up to him. He was an older boy than Jimmy and habitually oppressed him to a small degree. This new social elevation of the smaller lad probably seemed revolutionary to him. Huh, said Jimmy with deep scorn. Das and I, das and I, hey, das and I. The group was immensely excited. It turned its eyes upon the boy that Jimmy addressed. No, you doesn't, he said stolidly, facing a moral defeat. He could see that Jimmy was resolved. No, you doesn't, he repeated doggedly. Oh, cried Jimmy. You just watch. You just watch. Amid a silence, he turned and marched towards the monster. But possibly the palpable wariness of his companions had an effect upon him that weighed more than his previous experience. For suddenly... When near to the monster, he halted dubiously. But his playmates immediately uttered a derisive shout, and it seemed to force him forward. He went to the monster and laid his hand delicately on its shoulder. "'Hello, Henry,' he said in a voice that trembled a trifle. The monster was crooning a weird line of negro melody that was scarcely more than a thread of sound, and it paid no heed to the boy. Jimmy strutted back to his companions. They acclaimed him and hooted his opponent. Amid this clamor, the larger boy with difficulty preserved a dignified attitude. "'Ah, uh, das it, das it, ah,' said Jimmy to him. "'Now you're so smart, let's see you do it.' This challenge brought forth renewed taunts from the others. The larger boy puffed out his cheeks. "'Well, I ain't afraid,' he explained sullenly. He had made a mistake in diplomacy, and now his small enemies were tumbling his prestige all about his ears." They crowed like roosters and bleated like lambs, and made many other noises which were supposed to bury him in ridicule and dishonor. "'Well, I ain't afraid,' he continued to explain through the den. Jimmy, the hero of the mob, was pitiless. "'You ain't afraid, hey?' he sneered. "'If you ain't afraid, go do it then.' "'Well, I would if I wanted to,' the other retorted. His eyes wore an expression of profound misery, 
but he preserved steadily other portions of a pont-valiant air. He suddenly faced one of his persecutors. If you're so smart, why don't you go do it? This persecutor sank promptly through the group to the rear. The incident gave the badgered one a breathing spell, and for a moment even turned the derision in another direction. He took advantage of his interval. I'll do it if anybody else will, he announced, swaggering to and fro. Candidates for the adventure did not come forward. To defend themselves from this countercharge, the other boys again set up their crowing and bleeding. For a while they would hear nothing from him. Each time he opened his lips, their chorus of noises made oratory impossible. But at last he was able to repeat that he would volunteer to dare as much in the affair as any other boy. "'Well, you go first, they shouted. But Jimmy intervened to once more lead the populace against the large boy. "'You're mighty brave, ain't you?' he said to him. "'You dared me to do it, and I did, didn't I? Now who's afraid?' The others cheered this view loudly, and they all instantly resumed the baiting of the large boy. He shamefacedly scratched his left shin with his right foot. "'Well, I ain't afraid.' He cast an eye at the monster. "'Well, I ain't afraid.' With a glare of hatred at his squalling tormentors, he finally announced a grim intention. "'Well, I'll do it then, since you're so fresh. Now!' The mob subsided as, with a formidable countenance, he turned towards the impassive figure on the box. The advance was also a regular progression from high daring to craven hesitation. At last, when some yards from the monster, the lad came to a full halt as if he had encountered a stone wall. The observant little boys in the distance promptly hooted. Stung again by these cries, the lad sneaked two yards forward. He was crouched like a young cat ready for a backward spring. The crowd at the rear, beginning to respect this display, uttered some encouraging cries. Suddenly the lad gathered himself together, made a white and desperate rush forward, touched the monster's shoulder with a far outstretched finger, and sped away while his laughter rang out wild, shrill, and exultant. The crowd of boys reverenced him at once, and began to throng into his camp and look at him and be his admirers. Jimmy was discomfited a moment, but he and the larger boy, without agreement or word of any kind, seemed to recognize a truce, and they swiftly combined and began to parade before the others. "'Why, it's just as easy as nothing,' puffed the larger boy. "'Ain't it, Jim?' "'Course,' blew Jimmy. "'Why, it's as easy.' They were people of another class. If they had been decorated for courage on twelve battlefields, they could not have made the other boys more ashamed of the situation. Meanwhile, they condescended to explain the emotions of the excursion, expressing unqualified contempt for anyone who could hang back. "'Why, it ain't nothing. He won't do nothing to you,' they told the others in tones of exasperation. One of the very smallest boys in the party showed signs of a wistful desire to distinguish himself and they turned their attention to him, pushing at his shoulders, while he swung away from them and hesitated dreamily. He was eventually induced to make furtive expedition, but it was only for a few yards. Then he paused, motionless, gazing with open mouth. The vociferous entreaties of Jimmy and the large boy had no power over him. Mrs. Hannigan had come out on her back porch with a pail of water. From this coin she had view of the secluded portion of the Trescott grounds that was behind the stable. She perceived the group of boys and the monster on the box, she shaded her eyes with her hand to benefit her vision. She screeched then as if she was being murdered. Eddie! Eddie! You come home this minute! Her son querulously demanded. Oh, what for? You come home this minute, do you hear? The other boys seemed to think this visitation upon one of their number required them to preserve for a time the hangdog air of a collection of culprits, and they remained in guilty silence until the little Hannigan, wrathfully protesting, was pushed through the door of his home. Mrs. Hannigan cast a piercing glance over the group, stared with a bitter face at the Trescott house, as if this new and handsome edifice was insulting her, and then followed her son. There was wavering in the party. An inroad by one mother always caused them to carefully sweep the horizon to see if there were more coming. "'This is my yard,' said Jimmy proudly. "'We don't have to go home.' The monster on the box had turned its black crepe countenance towards the sky, and was waving its arms in time to a religious chant. "'Look at him now!' cried a little boy. They turned and were transfixed by the solemnity and mystery of the indefinable gestures. The wail of the melody was mournful and slow. They drew back. It seemed to spellbind them with the power of a funeral. They were so absorbed that they did not hear the doctor's buggy drive up to the stable. Trescott got out, tied his horse, and approached the group. Jimmy saw him first, and at his look of dismay the others wheeled. "'What's all this, Jimmy?' asked Trescott in surprise. The lad advanced to the front of his companions, halted, and said nothing. 
Trescott's face gloomed slightly as he scanned the scene. What were you doing, Jimmy? We was playing, answered Jimmy huskily. Playing at what? Just playing. Trescott looked gravely at the other boys and asked them to please go home. They proceeded to the street much in the manner of frustrated and revealed assassins. The crime of trespass on another boy's place was still a crime when they had only accepted the other boy's cordial invitation, and they were used to being sent out of all manner of gardens upon the sudden appearance of a father or a mother. Jimmy had wretchedly watched the departure of his companions. It involved the loss of his position as a lad who controlled the privileges of his father's grounds, but then he knew that in the beginning he had no right to ask so many boys to be his guests. Once on the sidewalk, however, they speedily forgot their shame as trespassers, and the large boy launched forth in a description of his success in the late trial of courage. As they went rapidly up the street, the little boy who had made the furtive expedition cried out confidently from the rear, "'Yes, and I went almost up to him, didn't I, Willie?' The large boy crushed him in a few words. "'Huh,' he scoffed. "'You only went a little way. I went clear up to him.' The pace of the other boys was so manly that the tiny thing had to trot, and he remained at the rear, getting entangled in their legs in his attempts to reach the front rank and become of some importance, dodging this way and that way, and always piping out his little claim to glory. 21. "'By the way, Grace,' said Trescott, looking into the dining room from his office door, "'I wish you would send Jimmy to me before school time.' When Jimmy came, he advanced so quietly that Trescott did not at first note him. "'Oh,' he said, wheeling from a cabinet. "'Here you are, young man.' "'Yes, sir.' Trescott dropped into his chair and tapped the desk with a thoughtful finger. Jimmy, what were you doing in the back garden yesterday, you and the other boys, to Henry? We weren't doing anything, Pa. Trescott looked sternly into the raised eyes of his son. Are you sure you were not annoying him in any way? Now what were you doing exactly? Why, we... Why, we... Now, Willie Dalzel said I doesn't go right up to him, and I did, and then he did, and then the other boys were afraid, and then you cummed. Trescott groaned deeply. His countenance was so clouded in sorrow that the lad, bewildered by the mystery of it, burst suddenly forth in dismal lamentations. "'There, there, don't cry, Jim,' said Trescott, going round the desk. "'Only—' He sat in a great leather reading chair and took the boy on his knee. "'Only I, I want to explain to you.' After Jimmy had gone to school and as Trescott was about to start on his round of morning calls, a message arrived from Dr. Moser— it set forth that the latter's sister was dying in the old homestead twenty miles away up the valley, and asked Trescott to care for his patients for the day at least. There was also in the envelope a little history of each case and of what had already been done. Trescott replied to the messenger that he would gladly assent to the arrangement. He noted that the first name on Moser's list was Winter, but this did not seem to strike him as an important fact. When its turn came, he rang the Winter bell. "'Good morning, Mrs. Winter,' he said cheerfully as the door was opened. Dr. Moser has been obliged to leave town today, and he has asked me to come in his stead. How is the little girl this morning? Mrs. Winter had regarded him in stony surprise. At last she said, Come in. I'll see my husband. She bolted into the house. Trescott entered the hall and turned to the left into the sitting room. Presently, Winter shuffled through the door. His eyes flashed towards Prescott. He did not betray any desire to advance far into the room. What do you want? He said. What do I want? "'What do I want?' repeated Trescott, lifting his head suddenly. He had heard an utterly new challenge in the night of the jungle. "'Yes, that's what I want to know,' snapped Winter. "'What do you want?' Trescott was silent for a moment. He consulted Moser's memoranda. "'I see that your little girl's case is a trifle serious,' he remarked. "'I would advise you to call a physician soon. I will leave you a copy of Dr. Moser's record to give to anyone you may call.' He paused to transcribe the record on a page of his notebook. Tearing out the leaf, he extended it to Winter as he moved towards the door. The latter shrunk against the wall. His head was hanging as he reached for the paper. This caused him to grasp air, and so Trescott simply let the paper flutter to the feet of the other man. "'Good morning,' said Trescott from the hall. This placid retreat seemed to suddenly arouse Winter to ferocity. It was as if he had then recalled all the truths which he had formulated to hurl at Trescott— so he followed him into the hall and down the hall to the door and through the door to the porch, barking in fiery rage from a respectful distance. As Trescott imperturbably turned the mare's head down the road, Winter stood on the porch, still yelping. He was like a little dog. 
22. Have you heard the news? cried Carrie Dungeon as she sped toward Martha's kitchen. Have you heard the news? Her eyes were shining with delight. No, answered Martha's sister Kate, bending forward eagerly. What was it? What was it? Carrie appeared triumphantly in the open door. Oh, there's been an awful scene in between Dr. Trescott and Jake Winter. I never thought that Jake Winter had any pluck at all, but this morning he told the doctor just what he thought of him. Well, what did he think of him? asked Martha. Oh, he called him everything. Mrs. Holworth heard it through her front blinds. It was terrible, she says. It's all over town now. Everybody knows it. Didn't the doctor answer back? No. Mrs. Holworth, she says he never said a word. He just walked down to his buggy and got in and drove off as cool. But Jake gave him jinx, by all accounts. But what did he say? cried Kate, shrill and excited. She was evidently at some kind of a feast. Oh, he told him that Sadie had never been well since that night Henry Johnson frightened her at Teresa Page's party, that he held him responsible, and how dared he cross his threshold, and, 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 and what? said Martha. Did he swear at him? said Kate in fearsome glee. No, not much. He did swear at him a little, but not more than a man does anyhow when he's real mad, Mrs. Hallworth says. Ooh, breathed Kate. And did he call him any names? Martha, at her work, had been for a time in deep thought. She now interrupted the others. It don't seem as if Sadie Winter had been sick since that time Henry Johnson got loose. She's been to school almost the whole time since then, hadn't she? They combined upon her an immediate indignation. School? School? I should say not. Don't think for a moment. School! Martha wheeled from the sink. She held an iron spoon, and it seemed as if she was going to attack them. Sadie Winter has passed here many a morning since then, carrying her school bag. Where was she going? To a wedding? The others, long accustomed to a mental tyranny, speedily surrendered. Did she? stammered Kate. I never saw her. Carrie Dungeon made a weak gesture. If I had been Dr. Trescott, exclaimed Martha loudly, I'd have knocked that miserable Jake Winter's head off. Kate and Carrie, exchanging glances, made an alliance in the air. I don't see why you say that, Martha, replied Carrie with considerable boldness, gaining support and sympathy from Kate's smile. I don't see how anybody can be blamed for getting angry when their little girl gets almost scared to death and gets sick from it and all that. Besides, everybody says, Oh, I don't care what everybody says, said Martha. Well, you can't go against the whole town, answered Carrie in sudden sharp defiance. No, Martha, you can't go against the whole town, piped Kate, following her leader rapidly. The whole town, cried Martha. I'd like to know what you call the whole town. Do you call these silly people who are scared of Henry Johnson the whole town? Why, Martha, said Carrie, in a reasoning tone, you talk as if you wouldn't be scared of him. No more would I, retorted Martha. Oh, Martha, how you talk, said Kate. Why, the idea, everybody's afraid of him. Carrie was grinning. You've never seen him, have you? She asked seductively. No, admitted Martha. Well, then, how do you know that you wouldn't be scared? Martha confronted her. Have you ever seen him? No. Well, then, how do you know you would be scared? The allied forces broke out in chorus. But, Martha, everybody says so. Everybody says so. Everybody says what? Everybody that's seen him say they were frightened almost to death. "'Tisn't only women, but as men, too. It's awful.' Martha wagged her head solemnly. "'I'd try not to be afraid of him.' "'But supposing you could not help it,' said Kate. "'Yes, and look here,' cried Carrie. "'I'll tell you another thing. "'The Hennigans are going to move out of the house next door.' "'On account of him?' demanded Martha. Carrie nodded. "'Mrs. Hennigan says so herself.' "'Well, of all things,' ejaculated Martha. "'Going to move, eh? You don't say so. Where are they going to move to? Down on Orchard Avenue. Well, of all things, nice house? I don't know about that. I haven't heard. But there's lots of nice houses on Orchard. Yes, but they're all taken, said Kate. There isn't a vacant house on Orchard Avenue. Oh, yes, there is, said Martha. The old Hampstead house is vacant. Oh, of course, said Kate. But then I don't believe Mrs. Hannigan would like it there. I wonder where they could be going to move to. Well, I'm sure I don't know sighed Martha. It must be to some place we don't know about. Well, said Carrie Dungeon, after a general reflective silence, it's easy enough to find out anyhow. Who knows around here? asked Kate. Why, Mrs. Smith, and there she is in her garden, said Carrie, jumping to her feet. 
As she dashed out of the door, Kate and Martha crowded at the window. Carrie's voice rang out from the near steps. Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, do you know where the Hannigans are going to move to? 23. The autumn smote the leaves, and the trees of Willemville were panoplied in crimson and yellow. The winds grew stronger, and in the melancholy purple of the nights, the home shine of a window became a finer thing. The little boys watching the sere and sorrowful leaves drifting down from the maples dreamed of the near time when they could heap bushels in the streets and burn them during the abrupt evenings. Three men walked down the Niagara Avenue. As they approached Judge Hagenthorpe's house, he came down his walk to meet them in the manner of one who has been waiting. "'Are you all ready, Judge?' one said. "'All ready,' he answered. The four then walked to Trescott's house. He received them in his office where he had been reading. He seemed surprised at this visit of four very active and influential citizens, but he had nothing to say of it. After they were all seated, Trescott looked expectantly from one face to another. There was a little silence. It was broken by John Twelve, the wholesale grocer, who was worth 400000 and reported to be worth over a million. "'Well, doctor,' he said with a short laugh, "'I suppose we might as well admit at once that we've come to interfere in something which is none of our business.' "'Why, what is it?' asked Trescott again, looking from one face to another. He seemed to appeal particularly to Judge Hagenthorpe, but the old man had his chin lowered musingly to his cane and would not look at him. "'It's about what nobody talks of, much,' said Twelve. "'It's about Henry Johnson.' Trescott squared himself in his chair. "'Yes?' Having delivered himself of the title, Twelve seemed to become more easy. "'Yes,' he answered blandly. "'We wanted to talk to you about it.' "'Yes,' said Trescott. Twelve abruptly advanced on the main attack. "'Now, see here, Trescott. We like you, and we have come to talk right out about this business. It may be none of our affairs and all that, and as for me, I don't mind if you tell me so. But I am not going to keep quiet and see you ruin yourself, and that's how we all feel.' "'I am not ruining myself,' answered Trescott. "'No, maybe you are not exactly ruining yourself,' said Twelve slowly. But you are doing yourself a great deal of harm. You have changed from being the leading doctor in town to about the last one. It is mainly because there are always a large number of people who are very thoughtless fools, of course. But then that doesn't change the condition. A man who had not heretofore spoken said solemnly, It's the women. Well, what I want to say is this, resumed Twelve. Even if there are a lot of fools in the world, we can't see any reason why you should ruin yourself by opposing them. You can't teach them anything, you know. I am not trying to teach them anything, Trescott smiled warily. It's a matter of, well, and there are a good many of us that admire you for it immensely, interrupted Twelve, but that isn't going to change the minds of all those ninnies. It's the women, stated the advocate of this view again. "'Well, what I want to say is this,' said Twelve. "'We want you to get out of this trouble and strike your old gate again. "'You're simply killing your practice through your infernal pig-headedness. "'Now, this thing is out of the ordinary, but there must be ways to... "'to beat the game somehow, you see. "'So we've talked it over, about a dozen of us, "'and, as I say, you want to tell us to mind our own business, why well, go ahead. "'But we've talked it over, and we've come to the conclusion that the only way to do it is to get Johnson a place somewhere off up the valley, and... Trescott wearily gestured. You don't know, my friend. Everybody is so afraid of him. They can't even give him good care. Nobody can attend to him as I do myself. But I have a little no-good farm up beyond Clarence Mountain that I was going to give to Henry, cried Twelve aggrieved. And if you... And if you... If you threw your house burning down or anything... Why, all the boys were prepared to take him right off your hands, and... and Trescott arose and went to the window. He turned his back upon them. They sat waiting in silence. When he returned, he kept his face in the shadow. No, John Twelve, he said. It can't be done. There was another stillness. Suddenly a man stirred on his chair. Well, then, a public institution, he began. No, said Trescott. Public institutions are all very good, but... He is not going to one. In the background of the group, old Judge Hagenthorpe was thoughtfully smoothing the polished ivory head of his cane. 24. Trescott loudly stamped the snow from his feet and shook the flakes from his shoulders. 
When he entered the house, he went at once to the dining room, and then to the sitting room. Jimmy was there, reading painfully in a large book concerning giraffes and tigers and crocodiles. "'Where is your mother, Jimmy?' asked Trescott. "'I don't know, Pa,' answered the boy. "'I think she is upstairs.' Trescott went to the foot of the stairs and called, but there came no answer. Seeing that the door of the little drawing room was open, he entered. The room was bathed in the half-light that came from the four dull panes of mica in the front of the great stove. As his eyes grew used to the shadows, he saw his wife curled in an armchair. He went to her. "'Why, Grace,' he said, "'didn't you hear me calling you?' She made no answer, and as he bent over the chair, he heard her trying to smother a sob in the cushion. "'Grace!' he cried. "'You're crying!' She raised her face. "'I've got a headache, a dreadful headache, Ned.' "'A headache?' he repeated in surprise and incredulity. He pulled a chair close to hers. Later, as he cast his eye over the zone of light shed by the dull red panes, he saw that a low table had been drawn close to the stove and that it was burdened with many small cups and plates of uncut tea cake. He remembered that the day was Wednesday and that his wife received on Wednesdays. "'Who was here today, Gracie?' he asked. From his shoulder there came a mumble. "'Mrs. Twelve. "'Was she?' Mm, he said. "'Why, didn't Anna Higginthorpe come over?' The mumble from his shoulder continued. "'She wasn't well enough.' Glancing down at the cups, Trescott mechanically counted them. There were fifteen of them. There, there, he said. Don't cry, Grace, don't cry. The wind was whining round the house, and the snow beat a slant upon the windows. Sometimes the coal in the stove settled with a crumbling sound, and the four panes of mica flashed a sudden new crimson. As he sat holding her head on his shoulder, Trescott found himself occasionally trying to count the cups. There were fifteen of them. End of section two. The Monster, part two. Section three of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recordings in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Blue Hotel. One. The Palace Hotel at Fort Romper was painted a light blue, a shade that is on the legs of a kind of heron, causing the bird to declare its position against any background. The Palace Hotel, then, was always screaming and howling in a way that made the dazzling winter landscape of Nebraska seem only a gray swampish hush. It stood alone on the prairie, and when the snow was falling, the town two hundred yards away was not visible. But when the traveler alighted at the railway station, he was obliged to pass the Palace Hotel before he could come upon the company of low clapboard houses which composed Fort Romper, and it was not to be thought that any traveler could pass the Palace Hotel without looking at it. Pat Scully, the proprietor, had proved himself a master of strategy when he chose his paints. It is true that on clear days, when the great transcontinental expresses, long lines of swaying pullmans, swept through Fort Romper, Passengers were overcome at the sight, and the cult that knows the brown reds and the subdivisions of the dark greens of the east expressed shame, pity, horror in a laugh. But to the citizens of this prairie town and to the people who would naturally stop there, Pat Scully had performed a feat. With this opulence and splendor, these creeds, classes, egotisms that streamed through romper on the rails day after day, they had no color in common. As if the displayed delights of such a blue hotel were not sufficiently enticing, it was Scully's habit to go every morning and evening to meet the leisurely trains that stopped at the romper, and work his seductions upon any man that he might see wavering, gripsack in hand. One morning, when a snow-crusted engine dragged its long string of freight cars and its one passenger coach to the station, Scully performed the marvel of catching three men. One was a shaky and quick-eyed Swede, with a great shining cheap valise, one was a tall bronzed cowboy who was on his way to a ranch near the Dakota line. One was a little silent man from the east who didn't look it and didn't announce it. Scully practically made them prisoners. He was so nimble and merry and kindly that each probably felt it would be the height of brutality to try to escape. They trudged off over the creaking board sidewalks in the wake of the eager little Irishman. He wore a heavy fur cap squeezed tightly down on his head. It caused his two red ears to stick out stiffly as if they were made of tin. 
At last, Scully, elaborately with boisterous hospitality, conducted them through the portals of the Blue Hotel. The room which they entered was small. It seemed to be merely a proper temple for an enormous stove, which, in the center, was humming with godlike violence. At various points on its surface, the iron had become luminous and glowed yellow from the heat. Beside the stove, Scully's son Johnny was playing high-five with an old farmer who had whiskers both gray and sandy. They were quarreling. Frequently, the old farmer turned his face towards a box of sawdust, colored brown from tobacco juice, that was behind the stove, and spat with an air of great impatience and irritation. With a loud flourish of words, Scully destroyed the game of cards and bustled his son upstairs with part of the baggage of the new guests. He himself conducted them to three basins of the coldest water in the world. The cowboy and the Easterner burnished themselves fiery red with this water until it seemed to be some kind of a metal polish. The Swede, however, merely dipped his fingers gingerly and with trepidation. It was notable that throughout this series of small ceremonies, the three travelers were made to feel that Scully was very benevolent. He was conferring great favors upon them. He handed the towel from one to the other with an air of philanthropic impulse. Afterwards, they went to the first room and, sitting above the stove, listened to Scully's officious clamor at his daughters who were preparing the midday meal. They reflected in the silence of experienced men who tread carefully amid new people. Nevertheless, the old farmer, stationary, invincible in his chair near the warmest part of the stove, turned his face from the sawdust box frequently and addressed a glowing commonplace to the strangers. Usually he was answered in short but adequate sentences by either the cowboy or the Easterner. The Swede said nothing. He seemed to be occupied in making furtive estimates of each man in the room. One might have thought that he had the sense of silly suspicion which comes to guilt. He resembled a badly frightened man. Later at dinner he spoke a little, addressing his conversation entirely to Scully. He volunteered that he had come from New York, where for ten years he had worked as a tailor. These facts seemed to strike Scully as fascinating, and afterwards he volunteered that he had lived at Romper for fourteen years. The Swede asked about the crops and the price of labor. He seemed barely to listen to Scully's extended replies. His eyes continued to rove from man to man. Finally, with a laugh and a wink, he said that some of these western communities were very dangerous. And after his statement, he straightened his legs under the table, tilted his head, and laughed again loudly. It was plain that the demonstration had no meaning to the others. They looked at him wondering, and in silence. 2. As the men trooped heavily back into the front room, the two little windows presented views of a turmoiling sea of snow. The huge arms of the wind were making attempts, mighty, circular, futile, to embrace the flakes as they sped. A gatepost, like a still man with a blanched face, stood aghast amid this profligate fury. In a hearty voice, Scully announced the presence of a blizzard. The guests of the Blue Hotel, lighting their pipes, assented with grunts of lazy masculine contentment. No island of the sea could be exempt in the degree of this little room with its humming stove. Johnny, son of Scully, in a tone which defied his opinion of his ability as a card player, challenged the old farmer of both gray and sandy whiskers to a game of high-five. The farmer agreed with a contemptuous and bitter scoff. They sat close to the stove and squared their knees under a wide board. The cowboy and the Easterner watched the game with interest. The Swede remained near the window, aloof, but with a countenance that showed signs of an inexplicable excitement. The play of Johnny and the Greybeard was suddenly ended by another quarrel. The old man arose while casting a look of heated scorn at his adversary. He slowly buttoned his coat and then stalked with fabulous dignity from the room. In the discreet silence of all other men, the Swede laughed. His laughter rang somehow childish. Men by this time had begun to look at him askance, as if they wished to inquire what ailed him. A new game was formed jocosely. The cowboy volunteered to become the partner of Johnny, and they all then turned to ask the Swede to throw in his lot with the little Easterner. He asked some questions about the game, and... Learning that it wore many names and that he had played it when it was under an alias, he accepted the invitation. He strode towards the men nervously, as if he expected to be assaulted. Finally, seated, he gazed from face to face and laughed shrilly. This laugh was so strange that the Easterner looked up quickly. The cowboy sat intent and with his mouth open, and Johnny paused, holding the cards with still fingers. Afterwards, there was a short silence. Then Johnny said, Well, let's get at it. Come on now. They pulled their chairs forward until their knees were bunched under the board. 
They began to play, and their interest in the game caused the others to forget the manner of the Swede. The cowboy was a board whacker. Each time that he held superior cards, he wanged them one by one with exceeding force down upon the improvised table, and took the tricks with a glowing air of prowess and pride that sent thrills of indignation into the hearts of his opponents. A game with a board whacker in it is sure to become intense. The countenances of the Easterner and the Swede were miserable whenever the cowboy thundered down his aces and kings, while Johnny, his eyes gleaming with joy, chuckled and chuckled. Because of the absorbing play, none considered the strange ways of the Swede. They paid strict heed to the game. Finally, during a lull caused by a new deal, the Swede suddenly addressed Johnny. I suppose there have been a good many men killed in this room. The jaws of the others dropped and they looked at him. What in the hell are you talking about? said Johnny. The Swede laughed again, his blatant laugh full of a kind of false courage and defiance. Oh, you know what I mean, all right, he answered. I'm a liar if I do. Johnny protested. The card was halted, and the men stared at the Swede. Johnny evidently felt that, as the son of the proprietor, he should make a direct inquiry. Now, what might you be driving at, mister? he asked. The Swede winked at him. It was a wink full of cunning. His fingers shook on the edge of the board. Oh, maybe you think I've been to nowheres. Maybe you think I'm a tenderfoot. I don't know nothing about you, answered Johnny, and I don't give a damn where you've been. All I gotta say is that I don't know what you're driving at. There ain't never been nobody killed in this room. The cowboy, who'd been steadily gazing at the Swede, then spoke. What's wrong with you, mister? Apparently it seemed to the Swede that he was formidably menaced. He shivered and turned white near the corners of his mouth. He sent an appealing glance in the direction of the little Easterner. During these moments he did not forget to wear his air of advanced pot valor. They say they don't know what I mean he remarked mockingly to the Easterner. The latter answered after prolonged and cautious reflection. "'I don't understand you,' he said impassively. The Swede made a movement then which announced that he thought he had encountered treachery from the only quarter where he had expected sympathy, if not help. "'Oh, I see you're all against me. I see.' The cowboy was in a state of deep stupefaction. "'Say,' he cried as he tumbled the deck violently down upon the board. "'Say!' What are you getting at, eh? The Swede sprang up with the celerity of a man escaping from a snake on the floor. I don't want to fight, he shouted. I don't want to fight. The cowboy stretched his long legs indolently and deliberately. His hands were in his pockets. He spat into the sawdust box. Well, who the hell thought you did? He inquired. The Swede backed rapidly towards a corner of the room. His hands were out protectingly in front of his chest, but he was making an obvious struggle to control his fright. Gentlemen, he quavered, I suppose I am going to be killed before I can leave this house. I suppose I'm going to be killed before I can leave this house. In his eyes was the dying swan look. Through the windows could be seen the snow turning blue in the shadow of dusk. The wind tore at the house, and some loose thing beat regularly against the clapboards like a spirit tapping. A door opened, and Scully himself entered. He paused in surprise as he noted the tragic attitude of the Swede, then he said, What's the matter here? The Swede answered him swiftly and eagerly. These men are going to kill me. Kill you, ejaculated Scully. Kill you? What are you talking? The Swede made the gesture of a martyr. Scully wheeled sternly upon his son. What is this, Johnny? The lad had grown sullen. Damned if I know, he answered. I can't make no sense to it. He began to shuffle the cards, fluttering them together with an angry snap. He says a good many men have been killed in this room or something like that. And he says he's going to be killed here, too. I don't know what ails him. He's crazy. I shouldn't wonder. Scully then looked for explanation to the cowboy, but the cowboy simply shrugged his shoulders. Kill you, said Scully again to the Swede. Kill you? Man, you're off your nut. Oh, I know, burst out the Swede. I know what will happen. Yes, I'm crazy. Yes, yes, of course I'm crazy. Yes, but I know one thing. There was a sort of sweat of misery and terror upon his face. I know I won't get out of here alive. The cowboy drew a deep breath as if his mind was passing into the last stages of dissolution. Well, I'm doggoned, he whispered to himself. Scully wheeled suddenly and faced his son. You have been troubling this man. Johnny's voice was loud with its burden of grievance. Why, good God, I ain't done nothing to him. The Swede broke in. Gentlemen, do not disturb yourselves. I will leave this house. I will go away because... 
he accused them dramatically with his glance, because I do not want to be killed. Scully was furious with his son. Will you tell me what is the matter? You young devil, what's the matter anyhow? Speak out. Blame it, cried Johnny in despair. Don't I tell you I don't know. He, he says we want to kill him, and that's all I know. I can't tell you what ails him. The Swede continued to repeat, Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will leave this house. I will go away because I do not wish to be killed. Yes, of course, I am crazy, yes, but I know one thing. I will go away. I will leave this house. Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will go away. You will not go away, said Scully. You will not go away until I hear the reason of this business. If anybody has troubled you, I will take care of him. This is my house. You are under my roof, and I will not allow any peaceable man to be troubled here. He cast a terrible eye upon Johnny, the cowboy, and the Easterner. Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will go away. I do not wish to be killed. The Swede moved towards the door, which opened upon the stairs. It was evidently his intention to go at once for his baggage. No, no, shouted Scully peremptorily. But the white-faced man slid by him and disappeared. Now, said Scully severely, what does this mean? Johnny and the cowboy cried together. Why, we didn't do nothing to him. Scully's eyes were cold. No, he said, you didn't. Johnny swore a deep oath. Why, this is the wildest loon I ever see. We didn't do nothing at all. We were just sitting here playing cards, and he... The father suddenly spoke to the Easterner. Mr. Blanc, he asked, what has these boys been doing? The Easterner reflected again. I didn't see anything wrong at all, he said at last slowly. Scully began to howl. But what does it mean? He stared ferociously at his son. I have a mind to lather you for this, me boy. Johnny was frantic. Well, what have I done? He bawled at his father. Three. I think you are tongue-tied, said Scully finally to his son, the cowboy, and the Easterner. And at the end of this scornful sentence, he left the room. Upstairs, the Swede was swiftly fastening the straps of his great valise. Once his back happened to be half-turned towards the door, and hearing a noise there, he wheeled and sprang up, uttering a loud cry. Scully's wrinkled visage showed grimly in the light of the small lamp he carried. This yellow effulgence, streaming upward, colored only his prominent features, and left his eyes, for instance, in mysterious shadow. He resembled a murderer. "'Man, man!' he exclaimed. "'Have you gone daffy?' "'Oh, no, oh, no!' rejoined the other. "'There are people in this world who know pretty nearly as much as you do, understand?' For a moment they stood gazing at each other. Upon the Swede's deathly pale cheeks were two spots, brightly crimson and sharply edged, as if they had been carefully painted. Scully placed the light on the table and sat himself on the edge of the bed. He spoke ruminatively. By crocky, I never heard such a thing in my life. It's a complete model. I can't for the soul of me think how you ever got this idea into your head. Presently he lifted his eyes and asked, And did you sure think they were going to kill you? The Swede scanned the old man as if he wished to see into his mind. I did, he said at last. He obviously suspected that this answer might precipitate an outbreak. As he pulled on a strap, his whole arm shook, the elbow wavering like a bit of paper. Scully banged his hand impressively on the footboard of the bed. Why, man, we're going to have a line of electric streetcars in this town next spring. A line of electric streetcars, repeated the Swede stupidly. And, said Scully, there's a new railroad going to be built down from Broken Arm to here. Not to mention the four churches and the smashing big brick schoolhouse. Then there's the big factory, too. Why, in two years, Romper will be a metropolis. Having finished the preparation of his baggage, the Swede straightened himself. Mr. Scully, he said with sudden hardihood, how much do I owe you? You don't owe me anything, said the old man angrily. Yes, I do, retorted the Swede. He took seventy-five cents from his pocket and tendered it to Scully, but the latter snapped his fingers in disdainful refusal. However, it happened that they both stood gazing in a strange fashion at three silver pieces on the Swede's open palm. "'I'll not take your money,' said Scully at last. "'Not after what's been going on here.' Then a plan seemed to strike him. "'Here!' he cried, picking up his lamp and moving towards the door. "'Here, come with me a minute.' "'No,' said the Swede in overwhelming alarm. "'Yes,' urged the old man. "'Come on. I want you to come and see a picture. "'Just across the hall, in my room.' The Swede must have concluded that his hour was come. His jaw dropped and his teeth showed like a dead man's. 
He ultimately followed Scully across the corridor, but he had the step of one hung in chains. Scully flashed the light high on the wall of his own chamber. There was revealed a ridiculous photograph of a little girl. She was leaning against a balustrade of gorgeous decoration, and the formidable bang to her hair was prominent. The figure was as graceful as an upright sled stake, and withal it was of the hue of lead. There, said Scully tenderly. That's the picture of my little girl that died. Her name was Carrie. She had the prettiest hair you ever saw. I was that fond of her. She... Turning then, he saw that the Swede was not contemplating the picture at all, but instead was keeping keen watch on the gloom in the rear. Look, man, cried Scully heartily. That's the picture of me little gal that died. Her name was Carrie, and then here's the picture of my oldest boy, Michael. He's a lawyer in Lincoln, and doing well. I gave that boy a grand education, and I'm glad for it now. He's a fine boy. Look at him now. Ain't he bold as blazes, him there in Lincoln, an honored and respected gentleman? An honored and respected gentleman, concluded Scully with a flourish. And so saying, he smote the Swede jovially on the back. The Swede faintly smiled. Now, said the old man, there's only one more thing. He dropped suddenly to the floor and thrust his head beneath the bed. The Swede could hear his muffled voice. I'd keep it under me pillar if it wasn't for that boy Johnny. Then there's the old woman. Where is it now? I never put it twice in the same place. Ah, now come out, would you? Presently he backed clumsily from under the bed, dragging with him an old coat rolled into a bundle. I fetched him, he muttered. Kneeling on the floor, he unrolled the coat and extracted from its heart a large yellow-brown whiskey bottle. His first maneuver was to hold the bottle up to the light. Reassured, apparently, that nobody had been tampering with it, he thrust it with a generous movement towards the Swede. The weak-kneed Swede was about to eagerly clutch this element of strength, but he suddenly jerked his hand away and cast a look of horror upon Scully. Drink, said the old man affectionately. He had risen to his feet and now stood facing the Swede. There was a silence. Then again, Scully said, Drink! The Swede laughed wildly. He grabbed the bottle, put it to his mouth, and as his lips curled absurdly around the opening and his throat worked, he kept his glance burning with hatred upon the old man's face. Four. After the departure of Scully, the three men with the cardboard still upon their knees preserved for a long time an astounding silence. Then Johnny said, That's the dog dangest Swede I ever see. He ain't no Swede, said the cowboy scornfully. Well, what is he then? cried Johnny. What is he then? It's my opinion, replied the cowboy deliberately. He's some kind of a Dutchman. It was a venerable custom of the country to entitle as Swedes all light-haired men who spoke with a heavy tongue. In consequence, the idea of the cowboy was not without its daring. Yes, sir, he repeated. It's my opinion this feller is some kind of a Dutchman. Well, he says he's a Swede anyhow, muttered Johnny sulkily. He turned to the Easterner. What do you think, Mr. Blaine? Oh, I don't know, replied the Easterner. Well, what do you think makes him act that way? asked the cowboy. Why, he's frightened. The Easterner knocked his pipe against the rim of the stove. He's clear frightened out of his boots. What at? cried Johnny and the cowboy together. The Easterner reflected over his answer. What at? cried the others again. Oh, I don't know, but it seems to me this man has been reading dime novels, and he thinks he's right out in the middle of it, the shooting and stabbing and all. But, said the cowboy, deeply scandalized, this ain't Wyoming. There are none of them places. This is Nebraska. Yes, added Johnny. And why don't he wait till he gets out west? The traveled Easterner laughed. It isn't different there, even. Not in these days. But he thinks he's right in the middle of hell. Johnny and the cowboy mused long. It's awful funny, remarked Johnny at last. Yes, yeah, said the cowboy. This is a queer game. Oh, we don't get snowed in because then we'd have to stand this here man being around with us all the time. That wouldn't be no good. I wish Pop would throw him out, said Johnny. Presently they heard a loud stamping on the stairs accompanied by ringing jokes in the voice of old Scully, and laughter evidently from the Swede. The men around the stove stared vacantly at each other. Gosh, said the cowboy. The door flew open and old Scully, flushed and anecdotal, came into the room. He was jabbering at the Swede, who followed him, laughing bravely. It was the entry of two roisterers from a banquet hall. Come now, said Scully sharply to the three seated men. Move up and give us a chance at the stove. The cowboy and the Easterner obediently sidled their chairs to make room for the newcomers. 
Johnny, however, simply arranged himself in a more indolent attitude, and then remained motionless. Come, get over there, said Scully. Plenty of room on the other side of the stove, said Johnny. Do you think we want to sit in the draft, roared the father, but the Swede here interposed with a grandeur of confidence. No, no, let the boy sit where he likes, he cried in a bullying voice to the father. All right, all right, said Scully deferentially. The cowboy and the Easterner exchanged glances of wonder. The five chairs were formed in a crescent about one side of the stove. The Swede began to talk. He talked arrogantly, profanely, angrily. Johnny, the cowboy, and the Easterner maintained a morose silence, while old Scully appeared to be receptive and eager, breaking in constantly with sympathetic ejaculations. Finally, the Swede announced that he was thirsty. He moved in his chair and said that he would go for a drink of water. "'I'll get it for you,' cried Scully at once. "'No!' said the Swede contemptuously. "'I'll get it for myself.' He arose and stalked with the air of an owner off into the executive parts of the hotel. As soon as the Swede was out of hearing, Scully sprang to his feet and whispered intensely to the others. "'Upstairs he thought I was trying to poison him.' "'Say,' said Johnny, "'this makes me sick. Why don't you throw him out in the snow?' "'Why, he's all right now,' declared Scully. "'It was only that he was from the east, and he thought this was a tough place. That's all. He's all right now.' The cowboy looked with admiration upon the Easterner. "'You were straight,' he said. You were on to that there, Dutchman. Well, said Johnny to his father, he may be all right now, but I don't see it. Other time he was scared, but now he's too fresh. Scully's speech was always a combination of Irish brogue and idiom, western twang and idiom, and scraps of curiously formal diction taken from the storybooks and newspapers. He now hurled a strange mass of language at the head of his son. What do I keep? What do I keep? What do I keep? He demanded in a voice of thunder. He slapped his knee impressively to indicate that he himself was going to make reply, and that all should heed. "'I keep a hotel,' he shouted. "'A hotel, do you mind? A guest under my roof has sacred privileges. He is to be intimidated by none. Not one word shall he hear that would prejudice him in favor of going away. I'll not have it. There's no place in this here town where they can say they ever took in a guest of mine because he was afraid to stay here.' He wheeled suddenly upon the cowboy and the Easterner. Am I right? Yes, Mr. Scully, said the cowboy. I think you're right. Yes, Mr. Scully, said the Easterner. I think you're right. Five. At six o'clock supper, the Swede fizzed like a firewheel. He sometimes seemed on the point of bursting into riotous song, and in all his madness he was encouraged by old Scully. The Easterner was encased in reserve. The cowboy sat in wide-mouthed amazement, forgetting to eat, while Johnny wrathily demolished great plates of food. The daughters of the house, when they were obliged to replenish the biscuits, approached as warily as Indians, and having succeeded in their purpose, fled with ill-concealed trepidation. The Swede domineered the whole feast, and he gave it the appearance of a cruel bacchanal. He seemed to have grown suddenly taller. He gazed brutally disdainful into every face. His voice rang through the room. Once when he jabbed out harpoon fashion with his fork to pinion a biscuit, the weapon nearly impaled the hand of the Easterner, which had been stretched quietly out for the same biscuit. After supper, as the men filed towards the other room, the Swede smote Scully ruthlessly on the shoulder. "'Well, old boy, that was a good square meal.' Johnny looked hopefully at his father. He knew that shoulder was tender from an old fall, and indeed it appeared for a moment as if Scully was going to flame out over the matter. But in the end he smiled a sickly smile and remained silent. The others understood from his manner that he was admitting his responsibility for the Swede's new viewpoint. Johnny, however, addressed his parent in an aside. Why don't you license somebody to kick you downstairs? Scully scowled darkly by way of reply. When they were gathered about the stove, the Swede insisted on another game of high five. Scully gently deprecated the plan at first, but the Swede turned a wolfish glare upon him. The old man subsided, and the Swede canvassed the others. In his tone, there was always a great threat. The cowboy and the Easterner both remarked indifferently that they would play. Scully said that he would presently have to go to meet the 658 train, and so the Swede turned menacingly upon Johnny. For a moment their glances crossed like blades, and then Johnny smiled and said, Yes, I'll play. They formed a square with the little board on their knees. The Easterner and the Swede were again partners. As the play went on, it was noticeable that the cowboy was not board-whacking as usual. Meanwhile, Scully, near the lamp, had put on his spectacles, and, with an appearance curiously like an old priest, was reading a newspaper. 
In time, he went out to meet the 658 train, and despite his precautions, a gust of polar wind whirled into the room as he opened the door. Besides scattering the cards that chilled the players to the marrow, the Swede cursed frightfully. When Scully returned, his entrance disturbed a cozy and friendly scene. The Swede again cursed, but presently they were once more intent, their heads bent forward and their hands moving swiftly. The Swede had adopted the fashion of board whacking. Scully took up his paper and for a long time remained immersed in matters which were extraordinarily remote from him. The lamp burned badly and once he stopped to adjust the wick. The newspaper, as he turned from page to page, rustled with a slow and comfortable sound. Then suddenly he heard three terrible words. You are cheating! Such scenes often prove that there can be little of dramatic import in environment. Any room can present a tragic front. Any room can be comic. This little den was now hideous as a torture chamber. The new faces of the men themselves had changed it upon the instant. The Swede held a huge fist in front of Johnny's face, while the latter looked steadily over it into the blazing orbs of his accuser. The Easterner had grown pallid. The cowboy's jaw had dropped into that expression of bovine amazement, which was one of his important mannerisms. After the three words, the first sound in the room was made by Scully's paper, as it floated forgotten to his feet. His spectacles had also fallen from his nose, but by a clutch he had saved them in air. His hand, grasping the spectacles, now remained poised awkwardly and near his shoulder. He stared at the card players. Probably the silence was while a second elapsed. Then, if the floor had been suddenly twitched out from under the men, they could not have moved quicker. The five men had projected themselves headlong towards a common point. It happened that Johnny, in rising to hurl himself upon the Swede, had stumbled slightly because of his curiously instinctive care for the cards in the board. The loss of the movement allowed time for the arrival of Scully, and also allowed the cowboy time to give the Swede a great push, which sent him staggering back. The men found tongue together, and hoarse shouts of rage, appeal, or fear burst from every throat. The cowboy pushed and jostled feverishly at the Swede, and the Easterner and Scully clung wildly to Johnny. But through the smoky air above the swaying bodies of the peace compellers, the eyes of the two warriors ever sought each other in glances of challenge that were at once hot and steely. Of course, the board had been overturned, and now the whole company of cards was scattered over the floor, where the boots of the men trampled the fat and painted kings and queens as they gazed with their silly eyes at the war that was now waging above them. Scully's voice was dominating the yells, Stop now! Stop, I say! Stop now! Johnny, as he struggled to burst through the rank formed by Scully and the Easterner, was crying, well, he says I cheated. He says I cheated. I won't allow no man to say I cheated. If he says I cheated, he's a... The cowboy was telling the Swede. Quit now. Quit, do you hear? The screams of the Swede never ceased. He did cheat. I saw him. I saw him. As for the Easterner, he was importuning in a voice that was not heeded. Wait a moment, can't you? Oh, wait a moment. What's the good of fighting over a game of cards? Wait a moment. In this tumult, no complete sentences were clear. Cheat, quit, he says. These fragments pierced the uproar and rang out sharply. It was a remark that, whereas Scully undoubtedly made the most noise, he was the least heard of any of the riotous band. Then suddenly there was a great cessation. It was as if each man had paused for breath, and although the room was still lighted with the anger of men, it could be seen that there was no danger of immediate conflict, and at once Johnny, shouldering his way forward, almost succeeded in confronting the Swede. What did you say I cheated for? What'd you say I cheated for? I don't cheat, and I won't let no man say I do. The Swede said, I saw you, I saw you. Well, cried Johnny, I'll fight any man what says I cheat. No, you won't, said the cowboy. Not here. Ah, be still, can't you? said Scully, coming between them. The quiet was sufficient to allow the Easterner's voice to be heard. He was repeating, Oh, wait a moment, can't you? What's the good of fighting over a game of cards? Wait a moment. Johnny, his red face appearing above his father's shoulder, hailed the Swede again. Did you say I cheated? The Swede showed his teeth. Yes. Then, said Johnny, we must fight. Yes, fight, roared the Swede. He was like a demoniac. Yes, fight. I'll show you what kind of a man I am. I'll show you who you want to fight. Maybe you think I can't fight. Maybe you think I can't. I'll show you. Your skin, your card sharp. Yes, you cheated. You cheated. You cheated. Well, let's go at it then, mister, said Johnny coolly. The cowboy's brow was beaded with sweat from his efforts in intercepting all sorts of raids. He turned in despair to Scully. 
What are you going to do now? A change had come over the Celtic visage of the old man. He now seemed all eagerness. His eyes glowed. We'll let them fight, he answered stalwartly. I can't put up with it any longer. I've stood this dumb Swede till I'm sick. We'll let them fight. 6. The men prepared to go out of doors. The Easterner was so nervous that he had great difficulty in getting his arms into the sleeves of his new leather coat. As the cowboy drew his fur cap down over his ears, his hands trembled. In fact, Johnny and Old Scully were the only ones who displayed no agitation. These preliminaries were conducted without words. Scully threw open the door. "'Well, come on,' he said. Instantly, a terrific wind caused the flame of the lamp to struggle at its wick, while a puff of black smoke sprang from the chimney top. The stove was in mid-current of the blast, and its voice swelled to equal the roar of the storm. Some of the scarred and bedabbled cards were caught up from the floor and dashed helplessly against the farther wall. The men lowered their heads and plunged into the tempest as into a sea. No snow was falling, but great whirls and clouds of flakes swept up from the ground by the frantic winds were streaming southward with the speed of bullets. The covered land was blue with the sheen of an unearthly satin, and there was no other hue save where, at the low black railway station, which seemed incredibly distant, one light gleamed like a tiny jewel. As the men floundered into a thigh-deep drift, it was known that the Swede was bawling out something. Scully went to him, put a hand on his shoulder, and projected an ear. "'What's that you say?' he shouted. "'I see,' bawled the Swede again. "'I won't stand much show sure against this gang. I know you'll all pitch on me.' Scully smote him reproachfully on the arm. Totman, he yelled. The wind tore the words from Scully's lips and scattered them far a lee. "'You're all a gang of—' boomed the Swede but the storm also seized the remainder of this sentence. Immediately turning their backs upon the wind, the men had swung around a corner to the sheltered side of the hotel. It was the function of the little house to preserve here, amid this great devastation of snow, an irregular V-shape of heavily encrusted grass which crackled beneath the feet. One could imagine the great drifts piled against the windward side. When the party reached the comparative peace of this spot, it was found that the Swede was still bellowing, Oh, I know what kind of a thing this is. I know you're all a pitch on me. I can't lick you all. Scully turned upon him panther fashion. You'll not have to whip all of us. You'll have to whip my son Johnny. And the man what troubles you during that time will have me to deal with. The arrangements were swiftly made. The two men faced each other, obedient to the harsh commands of Scully, whose face, in the subtly luminous gloom, could be seen set in the austere and personal lines that are pictured on the countenances of the Roman veterans. The Easterner's teeth were chattering, and he was hopping up and down like a mechanical toy. The cowboy stood rock-like. The contestants had not stripped off any clothing. Each was in his ordinary attire. Their fists were up, and they eyed each other in a calm that had the element of leonine cruelty in it. During this pause, the Easterner's mind, like a film, took lasting impressions of three men. The iron-nerved master of the ceremony, the Swede, pale, motionless, terrible, and Johnny, serene yet ferocious, brutish yet heroic. The entire prelude had in it a tragedy greater than the tragedy of action, and this aspect was accentuated by the long mellow cry of the blizzard as it sped the tumbling and wailing flakes into the black abyss of the south. Now, said Scully. The two combatants leaped forward and crashed together like bullocks. There was heard the cushioned sound of blows and of a curse squeezing out from between the tight teeth of one. As for the spectators... The Easterner's pent-up breath exploded from him with a pop of relief, absolute relief, from the tension of the preliminaries. The cowboy bounded into the air with a yowl. Scully was immovable as from supreme amazement and fear at the fury of the fight which he himself had permitted and arranged. For a time the encounter in the darkness was such a perplexity of flying arms that it presented no more detail than would a swiftly revolving wheel. Occasionally a face, as if illumined by a flash of light, would shine out, ghastly and marked with pink spots. A moment later the men might have been known as shadows, if it were not for the involuntary utterance of oaths that came from them in whispers. Suddenly a holocaust of warlike desire caught the cowboy, and he bolted forward with the speed of a bronco. "'Go it, Johnny! Go it! Kill him! Kill him!' Scully confronted him. "'Keep back,' he said, and by his glance the cowboy could tell that this man was Johnny's father." 
To the Easterner, there was a monotony of unchangeable fighting that was an abomination. This confused mingling was eternal to his sense, which was concentrated in a longing for the end, the priceless end. Once the fighters lurched near him, and as he scrambled hastily backwards, he heard them breathe like men on the rack. Kill him, Johnny! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! The cowboy's face was contorted like one of those agony masks in museums. Keep still, said Scully icily. Then there was a sudden loud grunt, incomplete, cut short, and Johnny's body swung away from the Swede and fell with sickening heaviness to the grass. The cowboy was barely in time to prevent the mad Swede from flinging himself upon his prone adversary. No, you don't, said the cowboy, interposing an arm. Wait a second. Scully was at his son's side. Johnny! Johnny, me boy! His voice had a quality of melancholy tenderness. Johnny, can you go on with it? He looked anxiously down into the bloody, pulpy face of his son. There was a moment of silence, and then Johnny answered in his ordinary voice. Yes, I... it... yes. Assisted by his father, he struggled to his feet. Wait a bit now till you get your wind. A few paces away, the cowboy was lecturing the Swede. No, you don't. Wait a second. The Easterner was plucking at Scully's sleeve. Oh, this is enough, he pleaded. This is enough. Let it go as it stands. This is enough. Bill, said Scully, get out of the road. The cowboy stepped aside. Now, the combatants were actuated by a new caution as they advanced towards collision. They glared at each other, and then the Swede aimed a lightning blow that carried with it his entire weight. Johnny was evidently half stupid from weakness, but he miraculously dodged, and his fist sent the overbalanced Swede sprawling. The cowboy Scully and the Easterner burst into a cheer that was like the chorus of triumphant soldiery, but before its conclusion the Swede had scuffled agilely to his feet and come in berserk abandon at his foe. There was another perplexity of flying arms, and Johnny's body again swung away and fell, even as a bundle might fall from a roof. The Swede instantly staggered to a little wind-waved tree and leaned upon it, breathing like an engine, while his savage and flame-lit eyes roared from face to face as the men bent over Johnny. There was a splendor of isolation in his situation at this time, which the Easterner felt once when, lifting his eyes from the man on the ground, he beheld that mysterious and lonely figure, waiting. "'Are you any good yet, Johnny?' asked Scully in a broken voice. The son gasped and opened his eyes languidly. After a moment, he answered, no, I ain't any good any more. Then from shame and bodily ill, he began to weep, the tears furrowing down through the blood stains on his face. He was too, too, too heavy for me. Scully straightened and addressed the waiting figure. Stranger, he said evenly, it's all up with our side. Then his voice changed into that vibrant huskiness, which is commonly the tone of the most simple and deadly announcement. Johnny is whipped. Without replying, the victor moved off on the route to the front door of the hotel. The cowboy was formulating new and unspellable blasphemies. The Easterner was startled to find that they were out in a wind that seemed to come directly from the shadowed Arctic flows. He heard again the wail of the snow as it was flung to its grave in the south. He knew now that all this time the cold had been sinking into him deeper and deeper, and he wondered that he had not perished. He felt indifferent to the condition of the vanquished man. "'Johnny, can you walk?' asked Scully. "'Did I hurt... hurt him any?' asked the son. "'Can you walk, boy? Can you walk?' Johnny's voice was suddenly strong. There was a robust impatience in it. "'I ask you whether I hurt him any.' "'Yes, yes, Johnny,' answered the cowboy consolingly. "'He's hurt a good deal.' They raised him from the ground, and as soon as he was on his feet he went tottering off, rebuffing all attempts at assistance. When the party rounded the corner they were fairly blinded by the pelting of the snow. It burned their faces like fire. The cowboy carried Johnny through the drift to the door. As they entered, some cards again rose from the floor and beat against the wall. The Easterner rushed to the stove, he was so profoundly chilled that he almost dared to embrace the glowing iron. The Swede was not in the room. Johnny sank into a chair and, folding his arms on his knees, buried his face in them. Scully, warming one foot and then the other at a rim of the stove, muttered to himself with Celtic mournfulness. 
The cowboy had removed his fur cap, and with a dazed and rueful air he was running one hand through his tousled locks. From overhead they could hear the creaking of boards as the Swede tramped here and there in his room. The sad quiet was broken by the sudden flinging open of a door that led towards the kitchen. It was instantly followed by an inrush of women. They precipitated themselves upon Johnny amid a chorus of lamentation. Before they carried their prey off to the kitchen, there to be bathed and harangued with that mixture of sympathy and abuse which is a feat of their sex, the mother straightened herself and fixed old Scully with an eye of stern reproach. "'Shame be on you, Patrick Scully,' she cried. "'Your own son, too. Shame be upon you.' "'There now. Be quiet now,' said the old man weakly. "'Shame be upon you, Patrick Scully.' The girls, rallying to this slogan, sniffed disdainfully in the direction of those trembling accomplices, the cowboy and the Easterner. Presently they bore Johnny away and left the three men to dismal reflection. 7. "'I'd like to fight this here Dutchman myself,' said the cowboy, breaking a long silence. Scully wagged his head sadly. "'No, that wouldn't do. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be right.' "'Well, why wouldn't it?' argued the cowboy. I don't see no harm in it. No, answered Scully with mournful heroism. It wouldn't be right. It was Johnny's fight. And now we mustn't whip the man just because he whipped Johnny. Yes, that's true enough, said the cowboy. But he better not get fresh with me because I couldn't stand no more of it. You'll not say a word to him, commanded Scully. And even then they heard the tread of the Swede on the stairs. His entrance was made theatric. He swept the door back with a bang and swaggered to the middle of the room. No one looked at him. Well, he cried insolently at Scully. I suppose you'll tell me now how much I owe you. The old man remained stolid. You don't owe me nothing. Huh? said the Swede. Huh? Don't owe him nothing. The cowboy addressed the Swede. Stranger, I don't see how you come to be so gay around here. Old Scully was instantly alert. Stop! he shouted, holding his hand forth, fingers upward. Bill, you shut up! The cowboy spat carelessly into the sawdust box. I didn't say a word, did I? he asked. Mr. Scully, called the Swede, how much do I owe you? It was seen that he was attired for departure and that he had his valise in his hand. You don't owe me nothing, repeated Scully in his same imperturbable way. Huh? said the Swede. I guess you're right. I guess if it was any way at all, you'd owe me something. That's what I guess. He turned to the cowboy. Kill him, kill him, kill him, he mimicked and then guffawed victoriously. Kill him. He was convulsed with ironical humor. But he might have been jeering the dead. The three men were immovable and silent, staring with glassy eyes at the stove. The Swede opened the door and passed into the storm, giving one derisive glance backward at the still group. As soon as the door was closed, Scully and the cowboy leaped to their feet and began to curse. They tramped to and fro, waving their arms and smashing into the air with their fists. "'Oh, but that was a hard minute,' wailed Scully. "'That was a hard minute. Him there leering and scoffing. One bag in his nose was worth forty dollars to me at that minute. How did you stand it, Bill?' "'How did I stand it?' cried the cowboy in a quivering voice. "'How did I stand it? Ugh!' The old man burst into sudden brogue. "'I'd like to take that swade,' he wailed, "'and hold him down on stone floor "'and bait him to a jelly with a stick.' The cowboy groaned in sympathy. "'I'd like to get him by the neck and hammer him.' He brought his hand down on a chair with a noise like a pistol shot. "'Hammer that there Dutchman "'until he couldn't tell himself from a dead coyote. "'I'd bait him until he... "'I'd show him some things.' and then together they raised a yearning, fanatical cry. Oh, if only we could... Yes, yes, and the night... Oh! Eight. The Swede, tightly gripping his valise, tacked across the face of the storm as if he carried sails. He was following a line of little naked, gasping trees, which he knew must mark the way of the road. His face, fresh from the pounding of Johnny's fists, felt more pleasure than pain in the wind and the driving snow. A number of square shapes loomed upon him finally, and he knew them as the houses of the main body of the town. He found a street and made travel along it, leaning heavily upon the wind whenever, at a corner, a terrible blast caught him. He might have been in a deserted village, 
We picture the world as thick with conquering and elate humanity. But here, with the bugles of the tempest pealing, it was hard to imagine a peopled earth. One viewed the existence of man then as a marvel, and conceded a glamour of wonder to these lice, which were caused to cling to a whirling, fire-smote, ice-locked, diseased, stricken, space-lost bulb. The conceit of man was explained by this storm to be the very engine of life. One was a coxcomb not to die in it. However, the Swede found a saloon. In front of it, an indomitable red light was burning, and the snowflakes were made blood color as they flew through the circumscribed territory of the lamps shining. The Swede pushed open the door of the saloon and entered. A sanded expanse was before him, and at the end of it four men sat about a table drinking. Down one side of the room extended a radiant bar, and its guardian was leaning upon his elbows listening to the talk of the men at the table. The Swede dropped his valise upon the floor and, smiling fraternally upon the barkeeper, said, "'Give me some whiskey, will you?' The man placed a bottle, a whiskey glass, and a glass of ice-thick water upon the bar. The Swede poured himself an abnormal portion of whiskey and drank it in three gulps. "'Pretty bad night,' remarked the bartender indifferently. He was making the pretension of blindness, which is usually a distinction of his class, but it could have been seen that he was furtively studying the half-erased bloodstains on the face of the Swede. "'Bad night,' he said again. "'Oh, it's good enough for me,' replied the Swede heartily as he poured himself some more whiskey. The barkeeper took his coin and maneuvered it through its reception by the highly nickeled cash machine. A bell rang. A card labeled 20 cents had appeared. "'No,' continued the Swede. "'This isn't too bad weather. It's good enough for me.' "'So,' murmured the barkeeper languidly. The copious drams made the Swede's eyes swim, and he breathed a trifle heavier. "'Yes, I like this weather. I like it. It suits me.' It was apparently his design to impart a deep significance to these words. "'So,' murmured the bartender again. He turned to gaze dreamily at the scroll-like birds and bird-like scrolls which had been drawn with soap upon the mirrors back of the bar. "'Well, I guess I'll take another drink,' said the Swede presently. "'Have something?' "'No, thanks. No, I'm not drinking,' answered the bartender. Afterwards, he asked, "'How did you hurt your face?' The Swede immediately began to boast loudly. "'Why, in a fight, I thumped the soul out of a man down here at Scully's Hotel.' The interest of the four men at the table was at last aroused. "'Who was it?' said one. "'Johnny Scully,' blustered the Swede. "'Son of the man what runs it. He will be pretty near dead for some weeks, I can tell you. I made a nice thing of him, I did. He couldn't get up. They carried him in the house. Have a drink?' Instantly, the men in some subtle way encased themselves in reserve. "'No, thanks,' said one. The group was of curious formation. Two were prominent local businessmen. One was the district attorney, and one was a professional gambler of the kind known as Square. But a scrutiny of the group would not have enabled an observer to pick the gambler from the men of more reputable pursuits. He was, in fact, a man so delicate in manner when among people of fair class and so judicious in his choice of victims that in the strictly masculine part of the town's life he had come to be explicitly trusted and admired. People called him a thoroughbred. The fear and contempt with which his craft was regarded was undoubtedly the reason that his quiet dignity shone conspicuous above the quiet dignity of men who might be merely hatters, billiard markers, or grocery clerks. Beyond an occasional unwary traveler who came by rail, this gambler was supposed to prey solely upon reckless and senile farmers who, when flush with good crops, drove into town in all the pride and confidence of an absolutely invulnerable stupidity. Hearing at times in circuitous fashion of the despoilment of such a farmer, the important men of Romper invariably laughed in contempt of the victim. And if they thought of the wolf at all, it was with a kind of pride at the knowledge that he would never dare think of attacking their wisdom and courage. Besides, it was popular that this gambler had a real wife and two children in a neat cottage in a suburb where he led an exemplary home life. And when anyone even suggested a discrepancy in his character, the crowd immediately vociferated descriptions of this virtuous family circle. Then men who led exemplary home lives and men who did not lead exemplary home lives all subsided in a bunch, remarking that there was nothing more to be said. However, when a restriction was placed upon him, as, for instance, when a strong clique of members of the new Pollywog Club refused to permit him, even as a spectator, to appear in the rooms of the organization. 
The candor and gentleness with which he accepted the judgment disarmed many of his foes, and made his friends more desperately partisan. He invariably distinguished between himself and a respectable romper man so quickly and frankly that his manner actually appeared to be a continual broadcast compliment. And one must not forget to declare the fundamental fact of his entire position in romper. It is irrefutable that in all affairs outside of his business, in all manners that occur eternally and commonly between man and man, this thieving card player was so generous, so just, so moral, that in a contest he could have put to flight the consciences of nine-tenths of the citizens of Romper. And so it happened that he was seated in this saloon with the two prominent local merchants and the district attorney. The Swede continued to drink raw whiskey, meanwhile babbling at the barkeeper and trying to induce him to indulge in potations. "'Come on, have a drink, come on. What? No? We'll have a little one, then. By God, I've whipped a man tonight, and I want to celebrate. I whipped him good. Gentlemen?' The Swede cried to the men at the table. "'Have a drink?' "'Shh!' said the barkeeper. The group at the table, although furtively attentive, had been pretending to be deep in talk. But now a man lifted his eyes toward the Swede and said shortly, "'Thanks. We don't want any more.' At this reply, the Swede ruffled out his chest like a rooster. "'Well,' he exploded, "'it seems I can't get anybody to drink with me in this town. Seems so, don't it? Well?' "'Shh!' said the bartender. "'Say,' snarled the Swede, "'don't you try to shut me up. I won't have it. I'm a gentleman, and I want people to drink with me. And I want em to drink with me now. Now, do you understand?' He rapped the bar with his knuckles. Years of experience had calloused the bartender. He merely grew sulky. "'I hear you,' he answered. "'Well,' cried the Swede, "'listen hard, then. See those men over there? Well, they're going to drink with me. And don't you forget it. Now you watch.' "'Ha!' yelled the barkeeper. "'This won't do.' "'Why won't it?' demanded the Swede. He stalked over to the table and by chance laid his hand upon the shoulder of the gambler. "'How about this?' he asked wrathfully. I asked you to drink with me. The gambler simply twisted his head and spoke over his shoulder. My friend, I don't know you. Oh, hell, answered the Swede. Come and have a drink. Now, my boy, advised the gambler kindly, take your hand off my shoulder and go away and mind your own business. He was a little slim man, and it seemed strange to hear him use this tone of heroic patronage to the burly Swede. The other men at the table said nothing. "'What? You won't drink with me, you little dude? I'll make you, then. I'll make you.' The Swede had grasped the gambler frenziedly at the throat and was dragging him from his chair. The other men sprang up. The barkeeper dashed around the corner of his bar. There was a great tumult, and then was seen a long blade in the hand of the gambler. It shot forward, and a human body, the citadel of virtue, wisdom, power, was pierced as easily as if it had been a melon. The Swede fell with a cry of supreme astonishment. The prominent merchants and the district attorney must have at once tumbled out of the place backward. The bartender found himself hanging limply to the arm of a chair and gazing into the eyes of a murderer. "'Henry,' said the latter as he wiped his knife on one of the towels that hung beneath the bar rail, "'you tell him where to find me. I'll be home waiting for him.' Then he vanished. A moment afterwards the barkeeper was in the street denning through the storm for help, and moreover, companionship. The corpse of the Swede alone in the saloon, had its eyes fixed upon a dreadful legend that dwelt atop of the cash machine. This registers the amount of your purchase. 9. Months later, the cowboy was frying pork over the stove of a little ranch near the Dakota line, when there was a quick thud of hoofs outside, and presently the Easterner entered with the letters and the papers. Well, said the Easterner at once, the chap that killed the Swede has got three years. Wasn't much, was it? He has. Three years? The cowboy poised his pan of pork while he ruminated upon the news. Three years? That ain't much. No, it was a light sentence, replied the Easterner as he unbuckled his spurs. Seems there was a good deal of sympathy for him in Romper. If the bartender had been any good, observed the cowboy thoughtfully, he would have gone in and cracked that there Dutchman on the head with a bottle in the beginning of it and stopped all this here murdering. "'Yes, a thousand things might have happened,' said the Easterner tartly. The cowboy returned his pan of pork to the fire, but his philosophy continued. "'It's funny, ain't it? If he hadn't said Johnny was cheating, he'd be alive this minute. He was an awful fool. 
game played for fun, too, not for money. I believe he was crazy. I feel sorry for that gambler, said the Easterner. Oh, so do I, said the cowboy. He don't deserve none of it for killing who he did. Swede might not have been killed if everything had been square. Might not have been killed, exclaimed the cowboy. Everything's square. Why, when he said that Johnny was cheating and acted like such a jackass? And then in the saloon when he fairly walked up to get hurt? With these arguments, the cowboy browbeat the Easterner and reduced him to a rage. You're a fool, cried the Easterner viciously. You're a bigger jackass than the Swede by a million majority. Now let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you something. Listen, Johnny was cheating. Johnny, said the cowboy blankly. There was a minute of silence, and then he said robustly, Why, no, the game was only for fun. Fun or not, said the Easterner. Johnny was cheating. I saw him. I know it. I saw him, and I refused to stand up and be a man. I let the Swede fight it out alone. And you, you were simply puffing around the place and wanting to fight. And then old Scully himself. We are all in it. This poor gambler isn't even noun. He is kind of an adverb. Every sin is the result of a collaboration. We, five of us, have collaborated in the murder of this Swede. Usually there are from a dozen to forty women really involved in every murder, but in this case it seems to be only five men. You, I, Johnny, Old Scully, and that fool of an unfortunate gambler came merely as a culmination, the apex of a human movement, and gets all the punishment. The cowboy, injured and rebellious, cried out blindly into this fog of mysterious theory. Well, I didn't do anything, did I? End of Section 3, The Blue Hotel Section 4 of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker His New Mittens 1. Little Horace was walking home from school brilliantly decorated by a pair of new red mittens. A number of boys were snowballing gleefully in a field. They hailed him. Come on, Horace, we're having a battle. Horace was sad. No, he said. I can't. I've got to go home. At noon, his mother had admonished him. Now, Horace, you come straight home as soon as school is out, do you hear? And don't you get them nice new mittens all wet, either, do you hear? Also, his aunt had said, I declare, Emily, it's a shame the way you allow that child to ruin his things. She had meant mittens. To his mother, Horace had dutifully replied, Yes, am But now he loitered in the vicinity of the group of uproarious boys who were yelling like hawks as the white balls flew. Some of them immediately analyzed this extraordinary hesitancy. Ha! They paused to scoff. Afraid of your new mittens, ain't you? Some smaller boys, who were not yet so wise in discerning motives, applauded this attack with unreasonable vehemence. Afraid of his mittens, afraid of his mittens. They sang these lines to cruel and monotonous music, which is as old, perhaps, as American childhood, and which it is the privilege of the emancipated adult to completely forget. Afraid of his mittens. Horace cast a tortured glance towards his playmates, and then dropped his eyes to the snow at his feet. Presently he turned to the trunk of one of the great maple trees that lined the curb, he made a pretense of closely examining the rough and virile bark. To his mind, this familiar street of Willemville seemed to grow dark in the thick shadow of shame. The trees and the houses were now palled in purple. Afraid of his mittens! The terrible music had in it a meaning from the moonlit war drums of chanting cannibals. At last Horace, with supreme effort, raised his head. "'Tain't them that I care about,' he said gruffly. "'I've got to go home, that's all.' whereupon each boy held his left forefinger as if it were a pencil and began to sharpen it derisively with his right forefinger. They came closer and sang like a trained chorus, Afraid of his mittens. When he raised his voice to deny the charge, it was simply lost in the screams of the mob. He was alone, fronting all the traditions of boyhood held before him by inexorable representatives. To such a low state had he fallen that one lad, a mere baby, outflanked him and then struck him in the cheek with a heavy snowball. The act was acclaimed with loud jeers. Horace turned to dart at his assailant, but there was an immediate demonstration on the other flank, and he found himself obliged to keep his face towards the hilarious crew of tormentors. The baby retreated in safety to the rear of the crowd, where he was received with fulsome compliments upon his daring. 
Horace retreated slowly up the walk. He continually tried to make them heed him, but the only sound was the chant, Afraid of his mittens! In this desperate withdrawal, the beset and haggard boy suffered more than is the common lot of man. Being a boy himself, he did not understand boys at all. He had, of course, the dismal conviction that they were going to dog him to his grave. But near the corner of the field, they suddenly seemed to forget all about it. Indeed, they possessed only the malevolence of so many flitter-headed sparrows. The interest had swung capriciously to some other matter. In a moment, they were off in the field again, carousing amid the snow. Some authoritative boy had probably said, "Ah, oh, come on. As the pursuit ceased, Horace ceased his retreat. He spent some time in what was evidently an attempt to adjust his self-respect, and then began to wander furtively down towards the group. He too had undergone an important change. Perhaps his sharp agony was only as durable as the malevolence of the others. In this boyish life, obedience to some unformulated creed of manners was enforced with capricious but merciless rigor. However, they were, after all, his comrades, his friends. They did not heed his return. They were engaged in an altercation. It had evidently been planned that this battle was between Indians and soldiers. The smaller and weaker boys had been induced to appear as Indians in the initial skirmish, but they were now very sick of it and were reluctantly but steadfastly affirming their desire for a change of caste. The larger boys had all won great distinction, devastating Indians materially, and they wished the war to go on as planned. They explained vociferously that it was proper for the soldiers always to thrash the Indians. The little boys did not pretend to deny the truth of this argument. They confined themselves to the simple statement that, in that case, they wished to be soldiers. Each little boy willingly appealed to the others to remain Indians, but as for himself, he reiterated his desire to enlist as a soldier. The larger boys were in despair over this dearth of enthusiasm in the small Indians. They alternately wheedled and bullied, but they could not persuade the little boys, who were really suffering dreadful humiliation rather than submit to another onslaught of soldiers. They recalled all the baby names that had the power of stinging deep into their pride, but they remained firm. Then a formidable lad, a leader of reputation, one who could whip many boys that wore long trousers, suddenly blew out his cheeks and shouted, Well, all right then. I'll be an Indian myself. Now, the little boys greeted with cheers this addition to their wearied ranks and seemed then content. But matters were not mended in the least, because all of the personal following of the formidable lad, with the addition of every outsider, spontaneously forsook the flag and declared themselves Indians. There were now no soldiers. The Indians had carried everything unanimously. The formidable lad used his influence, but his influence could not shake the loyalty of his friends, who refused to fight under any colors but his colors. Plainly there was nothing for it but to coerce the little ones. The formidable lad again became a soldier and then graciously permitted to join him all the real fighting strength of the crowd, leaving behind a most forlorn band of little Indians. Then the soldiers attacked the Indians, exhorting them to opposition at the same time. The Indians at first adopted a policy of hurried surrender, but this had no success, as none of the surrenders were accepted. They then turned to flee, bawling out protests. The ferocious soldiers pursued them amid shouts. The battle widened, developing all manner of marvelous detail. Horace had turned towards home several times, but, as a matter of fact, the scene held him in a spell. It was fascinating beyond anything which the grown man understands. He had always in the back of his head a sense of guilt, even a sense of impending punishment for disobedience, but they could not weigh with the delirium of this snow battle. 2. One of the raiding soldiers, espying Horace, called out in passing, "'Afraid of his mittens!' Horace flinched at this renewal, and the other lad paused to taunt him again. Horace scooped some snow, molded it into a ball, and flung it at the other. "'Oh!' cried the boy. "'You're an Indian, aren't you? Hey, fellers, here's an Indian that ain't been killed yet!' He and Horace engaged in a duel in which both were in such haste to mold snowballs that they had little time for aiming. Horace once struck his opponent squarely in the chest. "'Hey!' he shouted. "'You're dead. You can't fight any more, Pete. I killed you. You're dead!' The other boy flushed red, but he continued frantically to make ammunition. "'You never touched me!' he retorted, glowering. "'You never touched me! Where now?' he added defiantly. "'Where did you hit me?' "'On the coat, right on your breast. You can't fight any more. You're dead.' "'You never!' "'I did, too. Hey, fellers, ain't he dead? I hit him square.' "'Hey, never!' 
Nobody had seen the affair, but some of the boys took sides in absolute accordance with their friendship for one of the concerned parties. Horace's opponent went about contending, He never touched me! He never came near me! He never came near me! The formidable leader now came forward and accosted Horace. What was you, an Indian? Well then, you're dead, that's all. He hit you. I saw him. Me? shrieked Horace. He never came within a mile of me. At that moment, he heard his name called in a certain familiar tune of two notes, with the last note shrill and prolonged. He looked towards the sidewalk and saw his mother standing there in her widow's weeds with two brown paper parcels under her arm. A silence had fallen upon all the boys. Horace moved slowly towards his mother. She did not seem to note his approach. She was gazing austerely off through the naked branches of the maples where two crimson sunset bars lay on the deep blue sky. At a distance of ten paces... Horace made a desperate venture. Oh, Ma, he whined, can't I stay out for a while? No, she answered solemnly. You must come with me. Horace knew that profile. It was the inexorable profile. But he continued to plead because it was not beyond his mind that a great show of suffering now might diminish his suffering later. He did not dare to look back at his playmates. It was already a public scandal that he could not stay out as late as other boys and he could imagine his standing now that he had been again dragged off by his mother in sight of the whole world. He was a profoundly miserable human being. Aunt Martha opened the door for them. Light streamed about her straight skirt. Oh, she said, so you found him on the road, eh? Well, I declare it was about time. Horace slunk into the kitchen. The stove, straddling out on its four iron legs, was gently humming. Aunt Martha had evidently just lighted the lamp, for she went to it and began to twist the wick experimentally. Now, said the mother, let's see them mittens. Horace's chin sank. The aspiration of the criminal, the passionate desire for an asylum from retribution, from justice, was aflame in his heart. I, I, I don't know where they are, he gasped finally as he passed his hand over his pockets. Horace, intoned his mother, you are telling me a story. Tain't a story. He answered just above his breath. He looked like a sheep stealer. His mother held him by the arm and began to search his pockets. Almost at once she was able to bring forth a pair of very wet mittens. Well, I declare, cried Aunt Martha. The two women went close to the lamp and minutely examined the mittens, turning them over and over. Afterwards, when Horace looked up, his mother's sad-lined homely face was turned towards him. He burst into tears. His mother drew a chair near the stove. Just you sit there now until I tell you to get off. He sidled meekly into the chair. His mother and his aunt went briskly about the business of preparing supper. They did not display a knowledge of his existence. They carried an effect of oblivion so far that they even did not speak to each other. Presently they went into the dining and living room. Horace could hear the dishes rattling. His aunt Martha brought a plate of food, placed it on a chair near him, and went away without a word. Horace instantly decided that he would not touch a morsel of the food. He had often used this ruse in dealing with his mother. He did not know why it brought her to terms, but certainly it sometimes did. The mother looked up when the aunt returned to the other room. "'Is he eating his supper?' she asked. The maiden aunt, fortified in ignorance, gazed with pity and contempt upon this interest. "'Well now, Emily, how do I know?' she queried. "'Was I going to stand over him? Of course, all the worrying you do about that child—' It's a shame the way you're bringing up that child. Well, he ought to eat something. It won't do for him to go without eating, the mother retorted weakly. Aunt Martha, profoundly scorning the policy of concession which these words meant, uttered a long contemptuous sigh. 3. Alone in the kitchen, Horace stared with somber eyes at the plate of food. For a long time he betrayed no sign of yielding. His mood was adamantine. He was resolved not to sell his vengeance for bread, cold ham, and a pickle, and yet it must be known that the sight of them affected him powerfully. The pickle in particular was notable for its seductive charm. He surveyed it darkly. But at last, unable to longer endure his state, his attitude in the presence of the pickle, he put out an inquisitive finger and touched it, and it was cool and green and plump. Then a full conception of the cruel woe of his situation swept upon him suddenly, and his eyes filled with tears, which began to move down his cheeks. He sniffled. His heart was black with hatred. He painted in his mind scenes of deadly retribution. His mother would be taught that he was not one to endure persecution meekly, 
without raising an arm in his defense. And so his dreams were of a slaughter of feelings, and near the end of them his mother was pictured as coming, bowed with pain, to his feet. Weeping, she implored his charity. Would he forgive her? No. His once tender heart had been turned to stone by her injustice. He could not forgive her. She must pay the inexorable penalty. The first item in this horrible plan was the refusal of the food. This, he knew by experience, would work havoc in his mother's heart, and so he grimly waited. But suddenly it occurred to him that the first part of his revenge was in danger of failing. The thought struck him that his mother might not capitulate in the usual way. According to his recollection, the time was more than due when she should come in, worried, sadly affectionate, and ask him if he was ill. It had then been his custom to hint in a resigned voice that he was the victim of secret disease, but that he preferred to suffer in silence and alone. If she was obdurate in her anxiety, he always asked her in a gloomy, low voice to go away and leave him to suffer in silence, and alone in the darkness without food. He had known this maneuvering to result even in pie. But what was the meaning of the long pause and the stillness? Had his old and valued ruse betrayed him? As the truth sank into his mind, he supremely loathed life, the world, his mother. Her heart was beating back the besiegers. He was a defeated child. He wept for a time before deciding upon the final stroke. He would run away. In a remote corner of the world, he would become some sort of bloody-handed person driven to a life of crime by the barbarity of his mother. She should never know his fate. He would torture her for years with doubts and doubts, and drive her implacably to a repentant grave. Nor would his Aunt Martha escape. Some day, a century hence, when his mother was dead, he would write to his Aunt Martha, and point out her part in the blighting of his life. For one blow against him now, he would, in time, deal back a thousand. Aye, ten thousand. He arose and took his coat and cap. As he moved stealthily towards the door, he cast a glance backward at the pickle. He was tempted to take it, but he knew that if he left the plate inviolate, his mother would feel even worse. A blue snow was falling. People bowed forward, were moving briskly along the walks. The electric lamps hummed amid showers of flakes. As Horace emerged from the kitchen, a shrill squall drove the flakes around the corner of the house. He cowered away from it and its violence illumined his mind vaguely in new directions. He deliberated upon a choice of remote corners of the globe. He found that he had no plans which were definite enough in a geographical way, but without much loss of time he decided upon California. He moved briskly as far as his mother's front gate on the road to California. He was off at last. His success was a trifle dreadful. His throat choked. But at the gate he paused. He did not know if his journey to California would be shorter if he went down Niagara Avenue or off through Hogan Street. As the storm was very cold and the point was very important, he decided to withdraw for reflection to the woodshed. He entered the dark shanty and took seat upon the old chopping block upon which he was supposed to perform for a few minutes every afternoon when he returned from school. The wind screamed and shouted at the loose boards and there was a rift of snow on the floor to leeward of a crack. Here the idea of starting for California on such a night departed from his mind leaving him ruminating miserably upon his martyrdom. He saw nothing for it but to sleep all night in the woodshed and start for California in the morning bright and early. Thinking of his bed, he kicked over the floor and found that the innumerable chips were all frozen tightly, bedded in ice. Later he viewed with joy some signs of excitement in the house. The flare of a lamp moved rapidly from window to window. Then the kitchen door slammed loudly and a shawled figure sped towards the gate. At last he was making them feel his power. The shivering child's face was lit with saturnine glee, as in the darkness of the woodshed he gloated over the evidences of consternation in his home. The shawled figure had been his Aunt Martha, dashing with the alarm to the neighbors. The cold of the woodshed was tormenting him. He endured only because of the terror he was causing. But then it occurred to him that, if they instituted a search for him, they would probably examine the woodshed. He knew that it would not be manful to be caught so soon. He was not positive now that he was going to remain away forever, but at any rate he was bound to inflict some more damage before allowing himself to be captured. If he merely succeeded in making his mother angry, she would thrash him on sight. He must prolong the time in order to be safe. If he held out properly, he was sure of a welcome of love, even though he should drip with crimes. Evidently the storm had increased. 
for when he went out, it swung him violently with its rough and merciless strength. Panting, stung, half-blinded with the driving flakes, he was now a waif, exiled, friendless, and poor. With a bursting heart, he thought of his home and his mother. To his forlorn vision, they were as far away as heaven. 4. Horace was undergoing changes of feeling so rapidly that he was merely moved hither and then thither like a kite. He was now aghast at the merciless ferocity of his mother. It was she who had thrust him into this wild storm, and she was perfectly indifferent to his fate. Perfectly indifferent. The forlorn wanderer could no longer weep. The strong sobs caught at his throat, making his breath come in short, quick snuffles. All in him was conquered save the enigmatical, childish ideal of form, manner, the principle still held out, and it was the only thing between him and submission. When he surrendered, he must surrender in a way that deferred to the undefined code. He longed simply to go to the kitchen and stumble in, but his unfathomable sense of fitness forbade him. Presently he found himself at the head of Niagara Avenue, staring through the snow into the blazing windows of Stickney's butcher shop. Stickney was the family butcher, not so much because of a superiority to other Willemville butchers as because he lived next door and had been an intimate friend of the father of Horace. Rows of glowing pigs hung head downward back of the tables, which bore huge pieces of red beef. Clumps of attenuated turkeys were suspended here and there. Stickney, hale and smiling, was bantering with a woman in a cloak, who, with a monster basket on her arm, was dickering for eight cents worth of something. Horace watched them through a crusted pane. When the woman came out and passed him, he went towards the door. He touched the latch with his finger, but withdrew again suddenly to the sidewalk. Inside, Stickney was whistling cheerily and assorting his knives. Finally, Horace went desperately forward, opened the door, and entered the shop. His head hung low. Stickney stopped whistling. "'Hello, young man,' he cried. "'What brings you here?' Horace halted, but said nothing. He swung one foot to and fro over the sawdust floor. Stickney had placed his two fat hands palms downward and wide apart on the table in the attitude of a butcher facing a customer, but now he straightened. Here, he said. What's wrong? What's wrong, kid? Nothing, answered Horace huskily. He labored for a moment with something in his throat and afterwards added, Only I've, I've run away and... Run away, shouted Stickney. Run away from what? Who? From home, answered Horace. I don't like it there any more. Uh, he had arranged an oration to win the sympathy of the butcher. He had prepared a table, setting forth the merits of his case in the most logical fashion. But it was as if the wind had been knocked out of his mind. I've run away. Uh. Stickney reached an enormous hand over the array of beef and firmly grappled the immigrant. Then he swung himself to Horace's side. His face was stretched with laughter, and he playfully shook his prisoner. Come, come, come. What dash of nonsense is this? Run away, eh? Run away? Whereupon the child's long-tried spirit found vent in howls. Come, come, said Stickney busily. Never mind now, never mind. You just come along with me. It'll be all right. I'll fix it. Never you mind. Five minutes later, the butcher, with a great ulster over his apron, was leading the boy homeward. At the very threshold, Horace raised his last flag of pride. No, no, he sobbed. I don't want to. I don't want to go in there. He braced his foot against the step and made a very respectable resistance. Now, Horace, cried the butcher. He thrust open the door with a bang. Hello there. Across the dark kitchen, the door to the living room opened and Aunt Martha appeared. You found him, she screamed. We've come to make a call, roared the butcher. At the entrance to the living room, a silence fell upon them all. Upon a couch, Horace saw his mother lying limp, pale as death, her eyes gleaming with pain. There was an electric pause before she swung a waxen hand towards Horace. "'My child,' she murmured tremulously. Whereupon the sinister person addressed, with a prolonged wail of grief and joy, ran to her with speed. "'Mama! Mama! Oh, Mama!' She was not able to speak in a known tongue as she folded him in her weak arms. Aunt Martha turned defiantly upon the butcher because her face betrayed her. She was crying. She made a gesture half military, half feminine. Won't you have a glass of our root beer, Mr. Stickney? We make it ourselves. End of section four. His new mittens.
Section 5 of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Twelve o'clock. Where were you at twelve o'clock, noon, on the ninth of June, 1875? Question on intelligent cross-examination. One. Excuse me, said Ben Roddle with graphic gestures to a group of citizens in Nantucket's store. Excuse me. When them fellers in leather pants and six-shooters ride in, I go home and set in the cellar. That's what I do. When you see me pirootin' through the streets at the same time and occasion as them punchers, you can put me down for being crazy. Excuse me. Why, Ben, drawled old Nantucket, you ain't never really seen them turn loose. Why, well, I can remember in the old days when... Oh, damn your old days retorted Roddle. Fixing Nantucket with the eye of scorn and contempt, he said, I suppose you'll be saying in a minute that in the old days you used to kill engines, won't you? There was some laughter, and Roddle was left free to expand his ideas on the periodic visits of cowboys to the town. Mason Ricketts, he had ten big pumpkins a sitting in front of his store, and them fellers from the upside-down pea ranch shot him. Shot em all, and Ricketts lying on his belly in the store, calling for him to quit it. And what did they do? Why, well, they laughed at him. Just laughed at him. I don't do a town no good. Now, how would a eastern capitalist... It was the town's humor to be always gassing of phantom investors who were likely to come any moment and pay a thousand prices for everything. How would an eastern capitalist like that? Why, you couldn't see him for the dust on his trail. Then he'd tell all his friends that their town may be all right. But there's... Too much loose-handed shooting for my money. And he'd be right, too. Them rich fellers, they don't make no bad breaks with their money. They watch it all the time because they know blame well there ain't hardly room for their feet for the pikers and tin horns and thimble riggers what are laying for him. I tell you, one puncher racing his cow pony hell-bent for election down Main Street and yelling and shooting and nothing at all done about it would scare away a whole herd of capitalists. And it ain't right. It oughter be stopped. A pessimistic voice asked, How you gonna stop it, Ben? Organize, replied Roddle, pompously. Organize. That's the only way to make these fellers lay down. Ah. From the street sounded a quick scudding of pony hoofs, and a party of cowboys swept past the door. One man, however, was seen to draw rein and dismount. He came clanking into the store. Morning, gentlemen, he said civilly. Morning? They answered in subdued voices. He stepped to the counter and said, Give me a paper of fine cut, please. The group of citizens contemplated him in silence. He certainly did not look threatening. He appeared to be a young man of twenty-five years with a tan from wind and sun with a remarkable clear eye from perhaps a period of enforced temperance, a quiet young man who wanted to buy some tobacco. A six-shooter swung low on his hip, but at the moment it looked more decorative than warlike. It seemed merely a part of his old gala dress, his sombrero with its band of rattlesnake skin, his great flaming neckerchief, his belt of embroidered Mexican leather, his high-heeled boots, his huge spurs. And above all, his hair had been watered and brushed until it lay as close to his head as the fur lays to a wet cat. Paying for his tobacco, he withdrew. Ben Roddle resumed his harangue. Well, there you are. Looks like a calm man now, but... In Less than half an hour, he'll be as drunk as three bucks in a squall, and then... Excuse me. Two. On this day, the men of two outfits had come into town, but Ben Roddle's ominous words were not justified at once. The punchers spent most of the morning in an attack on whiskey, which was too earnest to be noisy. At five minutes of eleven, a tall, lank, brick-colored cowboy strode over to Placer's Hotel. Placer's Hotel was a notable place. It was the best host within two hundred miles. Its office was filled with armchairs and brown papier-mâché receptacles. At one end of the room was a wood counter painted a bright pink, and on this morning a man was behind the counter writing in a ledger. He was the proprietor of the hotel, but his customary humor was so sullen that all strangers immediately wondered why in life he had chosen to play the part of mine host. Near his left hand, double doors opened into the dining room which in warm weather was always kept darkened in order to discourage the flies, which was not compassed at all. Placer, writing in his ledger, did not look up when the tall cowboy entered. "'Morning, mister,' 
said the latter. I've come to see if you can grubstake the whole crowd of us for dinner today. Placer did not then raise his eyes, but with a certain churlishness, as if it annoyed him that his hotel was patronized, he asked, How many? Oh, about thirty, replied the cowboy. And we want the best dinner you can raise and scrape. Everything the best. We don't care what it costs, so long as we get a good square meal. We'll pay a dollar a head. By God, we will. We won't kick on nothing in the bill if you do it up fine. If you ain't got it in the house, rustle the whole town for it. That's our gate. So you just tear loose and we'll... At this moment, the machinery of a cuckoo clock on the wall began to whir. Little doors flew open, and a wooden bird appeared and cried, Cuckoo! And this was repeated until eleven o'clock had been announced, while the cowboy, stupefied, glass-eyed, stood with his red throat gulping. At the end, he wheeled upon Placer and demanded, What in hell is that? Placer revealed by his manner that he had been asked this question too many times. It's a clock, he answered shortly. I know it's a clock, gasped the cowboy, but what kind of clock? A cuckoo clock, can't you see? The cowboy, recovering his self-possession by a violent effort, suddenly went shouting into the street. Boys, say boys, come here a minute. His comrades, comfortably inhabiting a nearby saloon, heard his stentorian calls, but they merely said to one another, What's the matter with Jake? He's off his net again. But Jake burst in upon them with violence. Boys, he yelled, come over to the hotel. They got a clock with a bird inside it. And when it's 11 o'clock or anything like that, the bird comes out and says, toot, 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 toot. That way as many times as whatever time of day it is. It's immense. Come on over. The roars of laughter which greeted his proclamation were of two qualities. Some men laughing because they knew all about cuckoo clocks, and other men laughing because they had concluded that the eccentric Jake had been victimized by some wise child of civilization. Old man Crumford, a venerable ruffian who probably had been born in a corral, was particularly offensive with his loud guffaws of contempt. Better to coming out of a clock and telling you the time. <laughs> he swallowed his whiskey. A bird telling you the time. <laughs> Jake, you been up again some new drink. You've been drinking lonely and got up again some snake medicine liquor. A bird a telling you the time. <laughs> the shrill voice of one of the younger cowboys piped from the background. Brace up, Jake. Don't let him laugh at you. Bring that salt codfish and yarn what can pick out the ace. Oh, he's only kidding us. Don't pay attention to him. He thinks he's smart. A cowboy whose mother had a cuckoo clock in her house in Philadelphia spoke with solemnity. Jake's a liar. There's no such clock in the world. What, a bird inside a clock to tell the time? Change your drink, Jake. Jake was furious, but his fury took a very icy form. He bent a withering glance upon the last speaker. I don't mean a live bird, he said with terrible dignity. It's a wooden bird, and... A wooden bird, shouted old man Crumford. Wooden bird a-telling ye the time. <laughs> but Jake still paid his frigid attention to the Philadelphian. If you're sober enough to walk, it ain't such a blame long ways from here to the hotel, and I'll bet my pile again yours if only you got two bits. I don't want your money, Jake, said the Philadelphian. Somebody's been stringing you, that's all. I wouldn't take your money. He cleverly appeared to pity the other's innocence. You couldn't get my money, cried Jake in sudden hot anger. You couldn't get it. Now since you're so fresh, let's see how much you got. He clattered some large gold pieces noisily upon the bar. The Philadelphian shrugged his shoulders and walked away. Jake was triumphant. Any more bluffers round here? He demanded. Any more? Any more bluffers? Where's all these here hot sports? Let them step up. Here's my money. Come and get it. But they had ended by being afraid. To some of them his tale was absurd, but still one must be circumspect when a man throws forty-five dollars in gold upon the bar and bids the world come and win it. The general feeling was expressed by old man Crumford when, with deference, he asked, Well, this here bird, Jake, what kind of looking bird is it? It's a little brown thing, said Jake briefly. Apparently, he almost disdained to answer. Well, how does it work? asked the old man meekly. Why in blazes don't you go and look at it? yelled Jake. Want me to paint it in aisles for you? Go and look. Three. Placer was writing in his ledger. He heard a great trample of feet and clink of spurs on the porch, and there entered quietly the band of cowboys, some of them swaying a trifle, and these last being the most painfully decorous of all. Jake was in advance. He waved his hand towards the clock. There she is, 
he said laconically. The cowboys drew up and stared. There was some giggling, but a serious voice said half audibly, I don't see no bird. Jake politely addressed the landlord. Mister, I fetch these here friends of mine in here to see your clock. Placer looked up suddenly. Well, they can see it, can't they? He asked in sarcasm. Jake, abashed, retreated to his fellows. There was a period of silence. From time to time, the men shifted their feet. Finally, old man Crumford leaned toward Jake and in a penetrating whisper demanded, Where is the bird? Some frolicsome spirits on the outskirts began to call, Bird! Bird! as men at a political meeting call for a particular speaker. Jake removed his big hat and nervously mopped his brow. The young cowboy with the shrill voice again spoke from the skirts of the crowd. Jake, is there sure enough a bird in that thing? Yes, didn't I tell you once? Then, said the shrill-voiced man in a tone of conviction, it ain't a clock at all, it's a bird cage. I tell you, it's a clock, cried the maddened Jake, but his retort could hardly be heard above the howls of glee and derision, which greeted the words of him of the shrill voice. Old man Crumford was again rampant. Wooden bird telling you the time. <laughs> Amid the confusion, Jake went again to place her. He spoke almost in supplication. Say, mister, what time does this here thing go off again? Placer lifted his head, looked at the clock, and said, Noon. There was a stir next door in Big Watson of the Square X outfit, and at this time very drunk indeed, came shouldering his way through the crowd and cursing everybody. The men gave him much room, for he was notorious as a quarrelsome person when drunk. He paused in front of Jake and spoke as through a wet blanket. What's all this monkeying about? Jake was already wild at being made a butt for everybody, and he did not give backward. None of your damn business, Watson. Ooh, growled Watson with the surprise of a challenged bull. I said, repeated Jake distinctly, it's none of your damn business. Watson whipped his revolver half out of its holster. Well, make it my business then, you... But Jake had backed a step away and was holding his left hand palm outward toward Watson, while in his right he held his six-shooter, its muzzle pointing at the floor. He was shouting in a frenzy, No, don't you try it, Watson. Don't you dare try it, or by God, I'll kill you, sure. Sure. He was aware of a torment of cries about him from fearful men, for men who protested, for men who cried out because they cried out. But he kept his eyes on Watson, and those two glared murder at each other, neither seeming to breathe, fixed like two statues. A loud new voice suddenly rang out. Hold on a minute! All spectators who had not stampeded turned quickly and saw Placer standing behind his bright pink counter, with an aimed revolver in each hand. Cheese it, he said. I won't have no fighting in here. If you want to fight, get out in the street. Big Watson laughed, and speeding up his six-shooter like a flash of blue light, he shot Placer through the throat, shot the man as he stood behind his absurd pink counter with his two aimed revolvers in his incompetent hands. With a yell of rage and despair, Jake smote Watson on the pate with his heavy weapon, and knocked him sprawling and bloody. Somewhere a woman shrieked like windy midnight death. Placer fell behind the counter, and down upon him came his ledger and his inkstand, so that one could not have told blood from ink. The cowboys did not seem to hear, see, nor feel, until they saw numbers of citizens with Winchesters running wildly upon them. Old man Crumford threw high a passionate hand. Don't shoot! We'll not fight you for him! Nevertheless, two or three shots rang, and a cowboy who had been about to gallop off suddenly slumped over on his pony's neck, where he held for a moment like an old sack, and then slid to the ground, while his pony, with flapping rein, fled to the prairie. "'In God's name, don't shoot!' trumpeted old man Crumford. "'We'll not fight you for him!' "'It's murder!' bawled Ben Roddle. In the chaotic street, it seemed for a moment as if everybody would kill everybody. "'Where's the man what done it?' These hot cries seemed to declare a war which would result in an absolute annihilation of one side. But the cowboys were singing out against it. They would fight for nothing, yes. They often fought for nothing. But they would not fight for this dark something. At last, when a flimsy truce had been made between the inflamed men, all parties went to the hotel. Placer, in some dying whim, had made his way out from behind the pink counter, and leaving a horrible trail had traveled to the center of the room, where he had pitched headlong over the body of Big Watson. The men lifted the corpse and laid it at the side. "'Who done it?' asked a white stern man. A cowboy pointed at Big Watson. "'That's him,' he said huskily. There was a curious grim silence, 
and then suddenly, in the death chamber, there sounded the loud whirring of the clock's works. Little doors flew open. A tiny wooden bird appeared and cried, Cuckoo! Twelve times. End of section five. Twelve o'clock. Section six of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Moonlight on the Snow. One. The town of Warpost had an evil name for three hundred miles in every direction. It radiated like the shine from some stupendous light. The citizens of the place had been, for years, grotesquely proud of their fame as a collection of hard-shooting gentlemen, who invariably got the men who came up against them. When a citizen went abroad in the land, he said, I'm from Warpost, and it was as if he had said, I am the devil himself. But ultimately it became known to Warpost that the serene-browed angel of peace was in the vicinity. The angel was full of projects for taking comparatively useless bits of prairie and sawing them up into town lots and making chaste and beautiful maps of his handiwork, which shook the souls of people who had never been in the West. He commonly traveled here and there in a light wagon, from the tailboard of which he made orations, which soared into the Empyrean regions of true hydrogen gas. Towns far and near listened to his voice and followed him singing, until in all that territory you could not throw a stone at a jackrabbit without hitting the site of a projected mammoth hotel. Estimated cost $15,000. The stern and lonely butts were given titles, like grim veterans awarded tawdry patents of nobility. Cedar Mountain, Red Cliffs, Lookout Peak. And from the east came both the sane and the insane with hope, with courage, with hoarded savings, with cold decks, with Bibles, with knives and boots, with humility and fear, with bland impudence. Most came with their own money. Some came with money gained during a moment of inattention on the part of somebody in the East. And high in the air was the serene-browed angel of peace, with his endless gabble and his pretty maps. It was curious to walk out of an evening to the edge of a vast, silent sea of prairie, and to reflect that, the angel had parceled this infinity into building lots. But no change had come to Warpost. Warpost sat with her reputation for bloodshed pressed proudly to her bosom, and saw her mean neighbors leap into being as cities. She saw drunken old reprobates selling acres of red-hot dust and becoming wealthy men of affairs who congratulated themselves on their shrewdness in holding land which before the boom, they would have sold for enough to buy a treat all round in the straight, flush saloon. Only, nobody would have given it. Warpost saw dollars rolling into the coffers of a lot of contemptible men who couldn't shoot straight. She was amazed and indignant. She saw her standard of excellence, her creed, her reason for being great, all tumbling about her ears. And after the preliminary gasps, she sat down to think it out. The first man to voice a conclusion was Bob Heather, the popular barkeeper in Stevenson's Crystal Palace. "'It's us here gunfighter business,' he said, leaning on his bar, and with the gentle, serious eyes of a child, surveying a group of prominent citizens who had come in to drink at the expense of Tom Larpent, a gambler. They solemnly nodded assent. They stood in silence, holding their glasses and thinking. Larpent was chief factor in the life of the town. His gambling house was the biggest institution in Warpost. Moreover, he had been educated somewhere— and his slow speech had a certain mordant quality which was apt to puzzle Warpost, and men heeded him for the reason that they were not always certain as to what he was saying. "'Yes, Bob,' he drawled. "'I think you are right. The value of human life has to be established before they can be theaters, waterworks, streetcars, women, and babies.' The other men were rather aghast at this cryptic speech, but somebody managed to snigger appreciatively and the tension was eased. Smith Hannum, who whirled roulette for Larpent, then gave his opinion. Well, when all this here coin is floating round, it appears to me we ought to get our hooks on some of it. Them little tin horns over at Crowder's Corner are up to their necks in it, and we ain't yet seen a centavo, not a centavetto. That ain't right. It's all well to sit around taking money away from innocent cowpunchers, as long as there's nothing better. 
But when these here speculators come long flashing rolls as big as water buckets, it's up to us to whirl in and get some of it. This became the view of the town, and, since the main stipulation was virtue, Warpost resolved to be virtuous. A great meeting was held at which it was decreed that no man should kill another man, under penalty of being at once hanged by the populace. All the influential citizens were present, and asserted their determination to deal out a swift punishment which would take no note of an acquaintance or friendship with the guilty man. Bob Heather made a loud, long speech, in which he declared that he, for one, would help hang his own brother if his own brother transgressed this law which now, for the good of the community, must be forever held sacred. Everybody was enthusiastic, save a few Mexicans who did not quite understand. But as they were more than likely to be the victims of any affray in which they engaged, their silence was not considered ominous. At half-past ten on the next morning, Larpent shot and killed a man who had accused him of cheating at a game. Larpent had then taken a chair by the window. 2. Larpent grew tired of sitting in the chair by the window. He went to his bedroom, which opened off the gambling hall. On the table was a bottle of rye whiskey, of a brand which he specially and secretly imported from the East. He took a long drink. He changed his coat, after laving his hands and brushing his hair. He sat down to read, his hand falling familiarly upon an old copy of Scott's Fair Maid of Perth. In time he heard the slow trample of many men coming up the stairs. The sound certainly did not indicate haste. In fact, it declared all kinds of hesitation. The crowd poured into the gambling hall. There was low talk, a silence, more low talk. Ultimately, somebody rapped diffidently on the door of the bedroom. "'Come in,' said Larpent. The door swung back and disclosed war post, with a delegation of its best men in the front, and at the rear men who stood on their toes and craned their necks. There was no noise. Larpent looked up casually into the eyes of Bob Heather. "'So you've come up to the scratch, all right, eh, Bobby?' he asked kindly. "'I was wondering if you would weaken on the blood-curdling speech you made yesterday.' Heather first turned deadly pale and then flushed beet red. His six-shooter was in his hand and it appeared for a moment as if his weak fingers would drop it to the floor. "'Oh, never mind,' said Larpent in the same tone of kindly patronage. "'The community must and shall hold this law forever sacred, and your own brother lives in Connecticut, doesn't he?' He laid down his book and arose. He unbuckled his revolver belt and tossed it on the bed. A look of impatience had come suddenly upon his face. "'Well, you don't want me to be a master of ceremonies at my own hanging, do you? Why don't somebody say something or do something? You stand around like a lot of bottles. Where's your tree, for instance? You know there isn't a tree between here and the river. Damn little jackrabbit town hasn't even got a tree for its hanging. Hello, Coates. You live in Crouch's Corner, don't you? Well, you keep out of this thing, then. The corner has had its boom, and this is a speculation in real estate.' which is the business solely of the citizens of Warpost. The behavior of the crowd became extraordinary. Men began to back away. I did not meet I. They were victims of an inexplicable influence. It was as if they had heard sinister laughter from a gloom. "'I know,' said Larpent considerably, "'that this isn't as if you were going to hang a comparative stranger. In a sense, this is an intimate affair. I know full well you could go out and jerk a comparative stranger into kingdom come, and make a sort of festal occasion of it. But when it comes to performing the same office for an old friend, even the ferocious Bobby Heather stands around on one leg like a damned white-livered coward. In short, my milk-fed patriots, you seem fat-headed enough to believe that I am going to hang myself if you wait long enough. But unfortunately, I am going to allow you to conduct your own real estate speculations. It seems to me there should be enough men here who understand the value of corner lots in a safe and godly town, and hence should be anxious to hurry this business. The icy tones had ceased, and the crowd breathed a great sigh as if it had been freed of a physical pain. But still no one seemed to know where to reach for the scruff of this weird situation. Finally, there was some jostling on the outskirts of the crowds, and some men were seen to be pushing old Billy Simpson forward amid some protests. Simpson was on state occasions the voice of the town. Somewhere in his past he had been a Baptist preacher. 
He had fallen far, very far, and the only remnant of his former dignity was a fatal facility of speech when half drunk. Warpost used him on those state occasions when it became bitten with a desire to do the thing up in style. So the citizens pushed the blear-eyed old ruffian forward until he stood hemming and hawing in front of Larpent. It was evident at once that he was brutally sober, and hence wholly unfitted for whatever task had been planned for him. A dozen times he croaked like a frog, meanwhile wiping the back of his hand rapidly across his mouth. At last he managed to stammer, M Mr. Larpent! In some indescribable manner, Larpent made his attitude of respectable attention to be grossly contemptuous and insulting. Yes, Mr. Simpson. Er, now, Mr. Larpent, began the old man hoarsely, we want to know. Then obviously feeling there was a detail which he had forgotten, he turned to the crowd and whispered, Where is it? Many men precipitately cleared themselves out of the way, and down this lane Larpent had an unobstructed view of the body of the man he had slain. Old Simpson again began to croak like a frog. M Mr. Larpent. Yes, Mr. Simpson. Do you... Er, do you admit... Oh, certainly, said the gambler, good-humoredly. There can be no doubt of it, Mr. Simpson, although with your well-known ability to fog things, you may later possibly prove that you did it yourself. I shot him because he was too officious. Not quite enough men are shot on that account, Mr. Simpson. As one fitted by nature to be consummately officious, I hope you will agree with me, Mr. Simpson. Men were plucking old Simpson by the sleeve and giving him directions. One could hear him say, What? Yeah, all right. What? All right. In the end, he turned hurriedly upon Larpent and blurted out, Well, I guess we're going to hang you. Larpent bowed. I had a suspicion that you would, he said in a pleasant voice. There has been an air of determination about the entire proceeding, Mr. Simpson. There was an awkward moment. Well, 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 come ahead. Larpent courteously relieved a general embarrassment. Why, of course, we must be moving. Clergy first, Mr. Simpson. I'll take my old friend Bobby Heather on my right hand, and we'll march soberly to the business, thus lending a certain dignity to this outing of real estate speculators. Tom, quavered Bob Heather, for God's sake, keep your mouth shut. He invokes the deity, remarked Larpent placidly. But no, my last few minutes I am resolved to devote to inquiries as to the welfare of my friends. Now you, for instance, my dear Bobby, present today the lamentable appearance of a rattlesnake that has been four times killed and then left in the sun to rot. It is the effect of friendship upon a highly delicate system. You suffer. It is cruel. Never mind, you will feel better presently. 3. Warpost had always risen superior to her lack of a tree by making use of a fixed wooden crane, which appeared over a second-story window on the front of Pigram's general store. This crane had a long tackle always ready for hoisting merchandise to the store's loft. Larpent, coming in the midst of a slow-moving throng, cocked a bright bird-like eye at this crane. Hmm, yes, he said. Men began to work frantically. They called each to each in voices, strenuous but low. They were in a panic to have this thing finished. Larpent's cold, ironical survey drove them mad, and it entered the minds of some that it would be felicitous to hang him before he could talk more. But he occupied the time in pleasant discourse. I see that uh, Smith Hanham is not here. Perhaps some undue tenderness of sentiment keeps him away. Such feelings are entirely unnecessary. Don't you think so, Bobby? Note the feverish industry with which the renegade parson works at the rope. You will never be hung, Simpson. You will be shot for fooling too near a petticoat, which doesn't belong to you. The same old habit which got you flung out of the church, you red-eyed old satyr. Ah, oh, the cross-trail coach approaches. What a situation. The crowd turned uneasily to follow his glance, and saw truly enough the dusty, rickety old vehicle coming at the gallop of four lean horses. Ike Boston was driving the coach, and far away he had seen and defined the throng in front of Pigram's store, First calling out excited information to his passengers, who were all inside, he began to lash his horses and yell. As a result, he rattled wildly up to the scene, just as they were arranging the rope around Larpent's neck. Whoa! said he to his horses. 
The inhabitants of Warpost peered at the windows of the coach and saw therein six pale, horror-stricken faces. The men at the rope stood hesitating. Larpent smiled blandly. There was a silence. At last a broken voice cried out from the coach. Driver! Driver! What is it? What is it? Ike Boston spat between the wheel horses and mumbled that he supposed anybody could see less than they were blind. The door of the coach opened and out stepped a beautiful young lady. She was followed by two little girls, hand clasped in hand, and a white-haired old gentleman with a venerable and peaceful face. And the rough west stood in naked immorality before the eyes of the gentle east. The leather-faced men of Warpost had never imagined such perfection of feminine charm, such radiance, and as the illumined eyes of the girl wandered doubtfully, fearfully, toward the man with the rope around his neck, a certain majority of practiced ruffians tried to look as if they were having nothing to do with the proceedings. "'Oh,' she said in a low voice, "'what are you going to do?' At first none made reply, but ultimately a hero managed to break the harrowing stillness by stammering out, "'Nothing!' And then as if aghast at his own prominence, he shied behind the shoulders of a big neighbor. "'Oh, I know,' she said, "'but it's wicked. Don't you see how wicked it is?' Papa, do say something to them. The clear, deliberate tones of Tom Larpent suddenly made everyone stiffen. During the early part of the interruption, he had seated himself upon the steps of Pigram's store, in which position he had maintained a slightly bored air. He was now standing with the rope around his neck and bowing. He looked handsome and distinguished and a devil, a devil as cold as moonlight upon the ice. You are quite right, miss. They are going to hang me. "'but I can give you my word that the affair is perfectly regular. "'I killed a man this morning, and you see these people here "'who look like a fine collection of premier scoundrels "'are really engaged in forcing a real estate boom. "'In short, they are speculators, land barons, "'and not the children of infamy, "'which you no doubt took them for at first. "'Oh,' she said and shuddered. "'Her father now spoke haughtily. "'What has this man done?' Why do you hang him without a trial, even if you have fair proofs? The crowd had been afraid to speak to the young lady, but a dozen voices answered her father. Why, he admits it. Didn't you hear? There ain't no doubt about it. No, he says he did. The old man looked at the smiling gambler. Do you admit that you committed murder? Larpent answered slowly. For the first question in a temporary acquaintance, that is a fairly strong beginning. Do you wish me to speak as man to man, or to one who has some kind of official authority to meddle in a thing that is none of his affair? I, um, I, stuttered the other, uh, man to man. Then, said Larpent, I have to inform you that this morning at about ten-thirty, a man was shot and killed in my gambling house. He was engaged in the exciting business of trying to grab some money, out of which he claimed I had swindled him. The details are not interesting. The old gentleman waved his arm in a gesture of terror and despair, and tottered toward the coach. The young lady fainted. The two little girls wailed. Larpent sat on the steps with the rope around his neck. 4. The chief function of Warpost was to prey upon the bands of cowboys who, when they were paid, rode gaily into town to look for sin. To this end there were in Warpost many thugs and thieves. There was treachery and obscenity and merciless greed in every direction, even Mexico was levied upon to furnish a kind of ruffian which appears infrequently in the northern races. Warpost was not good. It was not tender. It was not chivalrous. But, but, there was a quality to the situation in front of Pigram's store which made Warpost wish to stampede. There were the two children, their angelic faces turned toward the sky, weeping in the last anguish of fear. There was the beautiful form of the young lady prostrate in the dust of the road, with her trembling father bending over her. On the steps sat Larpent, waiting, with a derisive smile, while from time to time he turned his head in the rope to make a forked-tongued remark as to the character and bearing of some acquaintance. All the simplicity of a mere lynching was gone from this thing. Through some bewildering inner power of its own, it was carried out of the hands of its inaugurators, and was marching along like a great drama, and they were only spectators. To them, it was ungovernable. They could do no more than stand on one foot and wonder. Some were heartily ill of everything and wished to run away. Some were so interested in the new aspect that they had forgotten why they had originally come to the front of Pigram's store. 
These were the poets. A large practical class wished to establish at once the identity of the newcomers. Who were they? Where did they come from? Where were they going to? It was truthfully argued that they were the parson for the new church at Crowger's Corner, with his family. And a fourth class, a dark-browed, muttering class, wished to go at once to the root of all disturbance by killing Ike Boston for trundling up in his old omnibus, and dumping out upon their ordinary lynching party such a load of tears and inexperience and sentimental argument. In low tones they addressed vitriolic reproaches. "'But how'd I know?' he protested almost with tears. "'How'd I know they'd be all this here kick-up?' But Larpent suddenly created a great stir. He stood up and his face was inspired with new strong resolution. "'Look here, boys,' he said decisively. "'You hang me tomorrow. "'Or, anyhow, later on today. "'We can't keep frightening the young lady "'and these two poor babies out of their wits. "'Ease off the rope, Simpson, you blackguard. "'Frightening women and children is your game, "'but I'm not going to stand it. "'Ike Boston, take your passengers on to Crowder's Corner "'and tell the young lady that, "'owing to her influence, "'the boy changed their minds about making me swing.' Somebody lift the rope where it's caught under my ear, will you? Boys, when you want me, you'll find me in the Crystal Palace. His tone was so authoritative that some obeyed him at once involuntarily, but as a matter of fact, his plan met with general approval. Warpost heaved a great sigh of relief. Why had nobody thought earlier of so easy a way out of all these here tears? 5. Larpent went to the Crystal Palace, where he took his comfort like a gentleman, conversing with his friends and drinking. At nightfall, two men rode into town, flung their bridles over a convenient post, and clanked into the Crystal Palace. Warpost knew them in a glance. Talk ceased, and there was a watchful squaring aback. The foremost was Jack Potter, a now famous town marshal of Yellow Sky, but now the sheriff of the county. The other was Scratchy Wilson, once a no less famous desperado. They were both two-handed men of terrific prowess and courage, but Warpost could hardly believe her eyes at view of this daring invasion. It was unprecedented. Potter went straight to the bar, behind which frowned Bobby Heather. "'You know a man by the name of Larpent?' "'Supposing I do,' said Bobby sourly. "'Well, I want him. Is he in the saloon?' "'Maybe he is and maybe he isn't,' said Bobby. Potter went back among the glinting eyes of the citizens. "'Gentlemen, I want a man named Larpent. Is he here?' Warpost was sullen, but Larpent answered lazily for himself. "'Why, you must mean me.' My name is Larpent. What do you want? I've got a warrant for your arrest. There was a movement all over the room as if a puff of wind had come. The swing of a hand would have brought on a murderous melee, but after an instant the rigidity was broken by Larpent's laughter. Why, you're sold, Sheriff, he cried. I've got a previous engagement. The boys are going to hang me tonight. If Potter was surprised, he betrayed nothing. The boys won't hang you tonight, Larpent, he said calmly because I'm going to take you into Yellow Sky. Larpent was looking at the warrant. Only grand larceny, he observed, but still, you know, I've promised these people to appear at their performance. You're going in with me, said the impassive sheriff. You bet he is, sheriff, cried an enthusiastic voice, and it belonged to Bobby Heather. The barkeeper moved down inside his rail, and, inspired like a prophet, he began a harangue to the citizens of Warpost. Now, look here, boys, that's just what we want, ain't it? Here we were going to hang Tom Larpent, just for the reputation of the town, like long come Sheriff Potter, the regularly constituted officer of the law, and he says, no, the man's mine. Now we want to make the reputation of the town as a law-abiding place, so what do we say to Sheriff Potter? We says, all right, Sheriff, you're regular. We ain't. He's your man. But supposing we go to fighting over it, then what becomes of the reputation of the town which we was going to swing Tom Larpent for? The immediate opposition to these views came from a source which a stranger might have difficulty in imagining. Men's foreheads grew thick with lines of obstinacy and disapproval. They were perfectly willing to hang Larpent yesterday, today, or tomorrow, as a detail in a set of circumstances at Warpost, but when some outsiders from the alien town of Yellow Sky came into the sacred precincts of Warpost and proclaimed their intention of extracting a citizen for cause, any citizen for any cause, the stomach of Warpost was fed with a clan's blood and her children, gathered under one invisible banner, prepared to fight as few people in few ages were enabled to fight for their points of view. There was a guttural murmuring. "'No, hold on!' screamed Bobby, flinging up his hands. "'He'll come clear, all right!' 
Tom, he appeared wildly to Larpin, you never committed no low-down grand larceny. No, said Larpin coldly. But how was it? Can't you tell us how it was? Larpin answered with plain reluctance. He waved his hand to indicate that it was all of little consequence. Well, he was a tenderfoot, and he played poker with me, and he couldn't play quite good enough. But he thought he could. He could play extremely well, he thought, so he lost his money. I thought he'd squeal. Boys, begged Bobby, let the sheriff take him. Some answered at once, yes. Others continued to mutter. The sheriff had held his hand because, like all quiet and honest men, he did not wish to perturb any progress toward a peaceful solution. But now he decided to take the scene by the nose and make it obey him. Gentlemen, he said formally, this man is coming with me. Larpent, get up and come along. This might have been the beginning, but it was practically the end. The two opinions in the minds of Warpost fought in the air and, like a snow squall, discouraged all action. Amid general confusion, Jack Potter and Scratchy Wilson moved to the door with their prisoner. The last thing seen by the men in the Crystal Palace was the bronze countenance of Jack Potter as he backed from the place. A man, filled with belated thought, suddenly cried out. Well, they'll hang him for this here shooting game anyhow. Bobby Heather looked disdain upon the speaker. Will they? And where will they get their witnesses? From here, do you think? No, not a single one. All he's up against is a case of grand larceny, and even supposing he'd done it, what in hell does grand larceny amount to? End of Section 6 Moonlight on the Snow Section 6 of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane The LibriVox Recordings in the Public Domain Read by Ben Tucker Manacled in the first act, there had been a farm scene, wherein real horses had drunk real water out of real buckets, afterwards dragging a real wagon off stage L. The audience was consumed with admiration of this play, and the great Theatre Nouveau rang to its roof with the crowd's plaudits. The second act was now well advanced. The hero, cruelly victimized by his enemies, stood in prison garb, panting with rage while two brutal warders fastened real handcuffs on his wrists and real anklets on his ankles and the hovering villain sneered. "'Tis well, Aubrey Pettingill," said the prisoner. "'You have so far succeeded, but mark you, there will come a time,' the villain retorted with a cutting allusion to the young lady whom the hero loved. "'Curse you!' cried the hero, and he made as if to spring upon this demon. But as the pitying audience saw, he could only take steps four inches long. Drowning the mocking laughter of the villain came cries from both the audience and the people back of the wings. Fire! 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 Throughout the great house resounded the roaring crashes of a throng of human beings moving in terror, and even above this noise could be heard the screams of women more shrill than whistles. The building hummed and shook. It was like a glade which holds some bellowing cataract of the mountains. Most of the people who were killed on the stairs still clutched their playbills in their hands as if they had resolved to save them at all costs. The Theatre Nouveau fronted upon a street which was not of the first importance, especially at night, when it only aroused when the people came to the theatre and aroused again when they came out to go home. On the night of the fire, at the time of the scene between the enchained hero and his tormentor, the thoroughfare echoed with only the scraping shovels of some street cleaners who were loading carts with blackened snow and mud. The gleam of lights made the shadowed pavement deeply blue, save where lay some yellow plum-like reflection. Suddenly a policeman came running frantically along the street. He charged upon the firebox on a corner. Its red light touched with flame each of his brass buttons and the municipal shield. He pressed a lever. He had been standing in the entrance of the theater, chatting to the lonely man in the box office. To send an alarm was a matter of seconds. Out of the theater poured the first hundreds of fortunate ones, and some were not altogether fortunate. Women, their bonnets flying, cried out tender names. Men, white as death, scratched and bleeding, looked wildly from face to face. There were displays of horrible blind brutality by the strong. Weaker men clutched and clawed like cats. From the theater itself came the howl of a gale. The policeman's fingers had flashed into instant life and action, the most perfect counterattack to the fire. He listened for some seconds, and presently he heard the thunder of a charging engine. She swept around a corner, her three shining enthrilled horses leaping. Her consort, the horse cart, roared behind her. 
There were the loud clicks of the steel-shod hoofs, hoarse shouts, men running, the flash of lights, while the crevice-like streets resounded with the charges of other engines. At the first cry of fire, the two brutal warders had dropped the arms of the hero and run off the stage with the villain. The hero cried after them angrily, "'Where are you going? Here, Pete! Tom! You've left me chained up, damn you!' The body of the theater now resembled a mad surf amid rocks, but the hero did not look at it. He was filled with fury at the stupidity of the two brutal warders in forgetting that they were leaving him manacled. Calling loudly, he hobbled off stage L, taking steps four inches long. Behind the scenes, he heard the hum of flames. Smoke, filled with sparks sweeping on spiral courses, rolled thickly upon him. Suddenly, his face turned chalk color beneath his skin of manly bronze for the stage. His voice shrieked, Pete! Tom! Damn you! Come back! You've left me chained up! He had played in this theater for seven years, and could find his way without light through the intricate passages which mazed out behind the stage. He knew that it was a long way to the street door. The heat was intense. From time to time, masses of flaming wood sung down from above him. He began to jump. Each jump advanced him about three feet, but the effort soon became heartbreaking. Once he fell, and it took time to get up on his feet again. There were stairs to descend. From the top of this flight, he tried to fall feet first. He precipitated himself in a way that would have broken his hip under common conditions, but every step seemed covered with glue, and on almost every one he stuck for a moment. He could not even succeed in falling downstairs. Ultimately, he reached the bottom, windless from the struggle. There were stairs to climb. At the foot of the flight, he lay for an instant with his mouth closed to the floor, trying to breathe. Then he tried to scale this frightful precipice up the face of which many an actress had gone at a canter. Each succeeding step arose eight inches from its fellow. The hero dropped to a seat on the third step, and pulled his feet to the second step. From this position he lifted himself to a seat on the fourth step. He had not gone far in this manner before his frenzy caused him to lose his balance, and he rolled to the foot of the flight. After all, he could fall downstairs. He lay there whispering, They all got out but I, all but I. Beautiful flames flashed above him. Some were crimson, some were orange and here and there were tongues of purple, blue, green. A curiously calm thought came into his head. What a fool I was not to foresee this. I shall have Rogers furnish manacles of papier-mâché tomorrow. The thunder of the fire lions made the theater have a palsy. Suddenly, the hero beat his handcuffs against the wall, cursing them in a loud wail. Blood started from under his fingernails. Soon he began to bite the hot steel, and blood fell from his blistered mouth. He raved like a wolf. Peace came to him again. There were charming effects amid the flames. He felt very cool, delightfully cool. They've left me chained up. End of section 7. Manacled. Section 8. Of the Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. An Illusion in Red and White Nights on the Cuban blockade were long, at times exciting, often dull. The men on the small leaping despatch boats became as intimate as if they had all been buried in the same coffin. Correspondents, who in New York had passed as fairly good fellows, sometimes turned out to be perfect rogues of vanity and selfishness, but still more often the conceited chumps of Park Row became the kindly and thoughtful men of the Cuban blockade. Also, each correspondent told all he knew, and sometimes more. For this gentle tale, I am indebted to one of the brightening stars of New York journalism. Now, this is how I imagine it happened. I don't say it happened this way, but this is how I imagine it happened. And it always struck me as being a very interesting story. I hadn't been on the paper very long, but just about long enough to get a good show, when the city editor suddenly gave me this sparkling murder assignment. It seems that up in one of the back counties of New York State, a farmer had taken a dislike to his wife, and so he went into the kitchen with an axe, and in the presence of their four little children, he just casually wrapped his wife on the nape of the neck with the head of this axe. It was early in the morning, but he told the children they had better go to bed. Then he took his wife's body out in the woods and buried it. This farmer's name was Jones. The widower's eldest child was named Freddie. A week after the murder, one of the long-distance neighbors was rattling past the house in his buckboard when he saw Freddy playing in the road. He pulled up and asked the boy about the welfare of the Jones family. 
Oh, we're all right, said Freddy. Only, Ma, she ain't. She's dead. Why, when did she die? cried the startled farmer. What did she die of? Oh, answered Freddy. Last week a man with red hair and big white teeth and real white hands came into the kitchen and killed Ma with an axe. The farmer was indignant with the boy for telling him this strange childish nonsense and drove off much disgruntled. But he recited the incident at a tavern that evening, and when people began to miss the familiar figure of Mrs. Jones at the Methodist church on Sunday mornings, they ended by having an investigation. The calm Jones was arrested for murder, and his wife's body was lifted from its grave in the woods and buried by her own family. The chief interest now centered upon the children. All four declared that they were in the kitchen at the time of the crime, and that the murderer had red hair. The hair of the virtuous Jones was gray. They said that the murderer's teeth were large and white. Jones only had about eight teeth, and these were small and brown. They said the murderer's hands were white. Jones' hands were the color of black walnuts. They lifted their dazed, innocent faces and crying simply because the mysterious excitement in their new quarters frightened them. They repeated their heroic legend without important deviation, and without the parity sameness which would excite suspicion. Women came to the jail and wept over them, and made little frocks for the girls and little breeches for the boys, and idiotic detectives questioned them at length. Always they upheld the theory of the murderer with red hair, big white teeth, and white hands. Jones sat in his cell, his chin sullenly on his first vest button. He knew nothing about any murder, he said. He thought his wife had gone on a visit to some relatives. He had had a quarrel with her, and she had said that she was going to leave him for a time so that he might have proper opportunities for cooling down. Had he seen the blood on the floor? Yes, he had seen the blood on the floor. But he had been cleaning and skinning a rabbit at that spot on the day of his wife's disappearance. He had thought nothing of it. What had his children said when he returned from the fields? They had told him that their mother had been killed by an axe in the hands of a man with red hair, big white teeth, and white hands. To questions as to why he had not informed the police of the county, he answered that he had not thought it a matter of sufficient importance. He had cordially hated his wife anyhow, and he was glad to be rid of her. He had decided afterward that she had run off, and he had never credited the fantastic tale of the children. Of course, there was very little doubt in the minds of the majority that Jones was guilty, but there was a fairly strong following who insisted that Jones was a coarse and brutal man, and perhaps weak in his head, yes, but not a murderer. They pointed to the children and declared that children could never lie, and these kids, when asked, said that the murder had been committed by a man with red hair, large white teeth, and white hands. I myself had a number of interviews with the children, and I was amazed at the convincing power of their little story. Shining in the depths of limpid, upturned eyes, one could fairly see tiny mirrored images of men with red hair, big white teeth, and white hands. Now, I'll tell you how it happened, how I imagine it was done. Sometime after burying his wife in the woods, Jones strolled back into the house. Seeing nobody, he called out in the familiar fashion, Mother! Then the kids came out whimpering. Where is your mother? said Jones. The children looked at him blankly. Why, Pa, said Freddy, you came in here and hit Ma with the axe, and then you sent us to bed. Me? cried Jones. I haven't been near the house since breakfast time. The children did not know how to reply. Their meager little sense informed them that their father had been the man with the axe, but he denied it and to their minds everything was a mere great puzzle with no meaning whatever, save that it was mysteriously sad and made them cry. "'What kind of a looking man was it?' said Jones. Freddy hesitated. "'Now, he looked a good deal like you, Pa.' "'Like me?' said Jones. "'Why, I thought you said he had red hair.' "'No, I didn't,' replied Freddy. "'I thought he had gray hair like yours.' "'Well,' said Jones. I saw a man with kind of red hair going along the road up yonder, and I thought maybe that might have been him. Little Lucy, the second child here, piped up with intense conviction. His hair was a little teeny bit red. I saw it. No, said Jones. The man I saw had very red hair. And what did his teeth look like? Were they big and white? Yes, answered Lucy. They were. Even Freddy seemed too inclined to think it. His teeth may have been big and white. Jones said little more at that time. Later he intimated to the children that their mother had gone off on a visit, and although they were full of wonder, and sometimes wept because of the oppression of an incomprehensible feeling in the air, they said nothing. Jones did his chores. Everything was smooth. 
The morning after the day of the murder, Jones and his children had a breakfast of hominy and milk. "'Well, this man with red hair and big white teeth, Lucy,' said Jones, "'did you notice anything else about him?' Lucy straightened in her chair and showed the childish desire to come out with brilliant information which would gain her father's approval. "'He had white hands. Hands all white.' "'How about you, Freddy?' "'I didn't look at them much, but I think they were white,' answered the boy. "'And what did little Martha notice?' cried the tender parent. "'Did she see the big bad man?' Martha, age four, replied solemnly, "'His hair was all yet, and his hand was white, all white.' "'That's the man I saw up the road,' said Jones to Freddy. "'Yes, sir, it seems like it must have been him,' said the boy, his brain now completely muddled. Again Jones allowed the subject of his wife's murder to lapse. The children did not know that it was a murder, of course. Adults were always performing in a way to make children's heads swim— for instance, what could be more incomprehensible than that a man with two horses, dragging a queer thing, should walk all day, making the grass turn down and the earth turn up? And why did they cut the long grass and put it in a barn? And what was a cow for? Did the water in the well like to be there? All these actions and things were grand, because they were associated with a high estate of grown-up people. But they were deeply mysterious. If then a man with red hair, big white teeth, and white hands should hit their mother on the nape of the neck with an axe, it was merely a phenomenon of grown-up life. Little Henry, the baby, when he had a want, howled and pounded the table with his spoon. That was all of life to him. He was not concerned with the fact that his mother had been murdered. One day, Jones said to his children suddenly, Look here, I wonder if you could have made a mistake. Are you absolutely sure that the man you saw had red hair, big white teeth, and white hands? The children were indignant with their father. Why, of course, Pa, we ain't made no mistake. We saw him as plain as day. Later, young Freddy's mind began to work like ketchup. His nights were haunted with terrible memories of the man with the red hair, big white teeth, and white hands, and the prolonged absence of his mother made him wonder and wonder. Presently, he gratuitously developed the theory that his mother was dead. He knew about death. He had once seen a dead dog, also dead chickens, rabbits, and mice. Once he asked his father, Pa, is Ma ever coming back? Joan said, Well, no, I don't think she is. This answer confirmed the boy in his theory. He knew that dead people did not come back. The attitude of Jones towards this descriptive legend of the man with the axe was very peculiar. He came to be in opposition to it. He protested against the convictions of the children, but he could not move them. It was the one thing in their lives of which they were stonily and absolutely positive. Now that really ends the story, but I will continue for your amusement. The jury hung Jones as high as they could, and they were quite right, because Jones confessed before he died. Freddy is now a highly respected driver of a grocery wagon in Ogdensburg. When I was up there a good many years afterwards, people told me that whenever he spoke of the tragedy at all, he was certain to denounce the alleged confession as a lie. He considered his father a victim to the stupidity of juries, and some day he hopes to meet the man with the red hair, big white teeth, and white hands, whose image still remains so distinct in his memory that he could pick him out in a crowd of 10,000. End of Section 8 An Illusion in Red and White End of The Monster and Other Stories by Stephen Crane